true enough, but we're lying little sluts, Sayer. You'd better take us to a fest hall and bathe us yourself, just to be sure. Mert leered. Very well, if I must, and I'll take you to some good gown shops up Castle Wardway and pay for suitably pretty rags right now. He was astonished to be answered by sudden clenched fist squeals of delight. A moment later, Rava was standing up on the worn leather of the booth benches so he could clearly see what she was revealing as she pulled up her torn and stained breeches to bear a stretch of thigh that was high up indeed, and a wicked little dagger and a stabbing needle beside it, sheathed there ready for use. I'll need a gown that covers these, but is slit so high so I can get at them, she ordered briskly. Mert grinned. But of course. Now let's get started with full and hearty meals for you all. I could sure use one. Old man, are you sure your meals don't all come out of tankards and flagons? Mert's response was a rude gesture that made all three alley girls shake their heads. You are old, Waratra informed him. No one does that one anymore. Now we do this. She licked one finger crooked it upward in a hook and pulled sharply up and back toward her mouth. I see, Mert said dryly. Oh, she purred. You will when we've time, old wolf. You will. There's an art to being, a uh, covert, lads, Elminster informed them. And it's not sneaking about, peering over thy shoulders every third step and sneaking. It's striding or strolling as if ye'd every right to be wherever ye are and are a mite weary and bored as ye go about normal business. Jallister and Dunblade started eating fast, and the Sage of Shadowdale started to grin. There was nothing wrong with their wits, either of them. They'd figured out in an instant that he wanted them to get headed somewhere right now. So, Jallister said, swallowing a too large mouthful and wincing, where are we headed? Covertly, of course. With me, both of ye, Elminster replied, to Castle Waterdeep. Dunblade, mouth full, could only look astonished, but Jallister spoke for both of them. The castle? Isn't that the main jail? Tis, El agreed calmly, but this is no trick to get ye into cells. We'll just be visiting for a few breaths, just long enough to get down to the tunnels that connect to the palace and use them, so as to be in position as a strike force if trouble erupts at the Lord's meeting tonight. And when we come up to the castle gates, they'll just let us stroll in? Jallister asked skeptically. Elminster made a show of ducking his head and looking furtively all about before he leaned forward and whispered, don't tell anyone, but I'm a wizard. We know magic. Dunblade rolled his eyes and stood up to brush away crumbs off the front of his leather jacket. Let's get going. I confess I was surprised when your name was brought in to me. Alangrin Ornbrand, guildmaster of the most diligent league of sailmakers and cordwainers, admitted, leaning back in his chair and steepling his fingers beneath a concerned frown. Forgive me, Lord Hustim, but I had not heard that you harbored any great love for any guild of this city. Lord Ornbrand, his guest replied with a smile, I have lived my entire life in this fair city, and so have seen a distressingly high number of Water Davian summers. His pause for breath was short indeed, but Ornbrand ceased it smoothly and politely. Forgive my interruption, Lord, but I am no Lord, merely a guildmaster. Ah, indeed. That's why I've come, as it happens. Lord Erland Hustine tendered an affable smile and added, But to continue... In that not inconsiderable span of years, I have come to learn that a noble who seems too friendly with guildmasters finds himself scorned by his fellows and hampered by tradesmen of every guild, out of their deepening suspicion that he's up to something that can bode no good for the honest workers of Waterdeep, and that every guildmaster who seems too friendly with any noble finds himself under attack from his or her own guild 
and belittled in their estimation as having accepted bribes or becoming a lickspittle to blandishments. So I make it my policy to remain aloof, publicly rude even, for the good of both sides. However, that prudence must be set aside when the fate of the city we both love stands imperiled. It does. My lord, I count you among the shrewdest of our current guildmasters. You know your profession, you know your clients, you know Waterdeep, and you are no fool. All of which means it cannot have escaped your notice that certain lords of Waterdeep have abruptly departed the ranks of the living during these last few days. Ornbrand nodded a trifle warily. What you may not know, Lord Hesteem swept on, is that the lords who've so sadly perished are being purged because their greed and lack of honesty led them to, uh, double-cross ruthless criminal elements with whom they had been covertly dealing. You may have noticed that these fallen lords were in the main very wealthy, self-made, successful citizens who aspired to nobility. Now, you know how they were able to become so rich and so successful in such a short time, whereas so many highborn of Waterdeep skimp and scrape for coin. Honesty brings lesser rewards than corruption. Yet from time to time, Ornbrand said dryly, corruption hands out a rather final reward. Indeed, and in this case creates a sudden shortage of masked lords in our city, a shortage that certain so far surviving corrupt lords are even now rushing to try to fill with their cronies, more corrupt and ruthless criminals to vote on our laws and guide all of our futures and restrict our freedoms, a prospect that makes me shudder. Ah, Hornbrand nodded. And so? And so, being the sort of noble that thinks it is wrong and repeating the errors of past centuries to put more nobles, whose personal probity may or may not pass temple muster, and whose worldly wisdom may be feeble indeed, but whose breeding at least guarantees revulsion at casual corruption, into the masks of the hidden lords of our city. I have been talking with other nobles who are of like mind, and we have hit upon a plan. A plan that involves guildmasters we see as capable, honest, and good leaders for Waterdeep ahead. Guildmasters like you, Lord Halangrim Ornbrand, if I may be so bold as to call you Lord before you've agreed to take the mantle and before the sitting lords have voted you to join their number, which of course they may not, particularly if the corrupt ones have their way, Yet I think most of Waterdeep would prefer the hidden lords of the city to represent the full, rich array of our citizenry, not a small clique who welcomes in only their cronies. And what if the, uh, corrupt lords resort to violence? The Watch are even now assembling armed guards for every lord. Once in place, these ever-present hounds are going to make it more than a trifle difficult for the bent incumbent lords even to contact their unsavory alley knives. Nor shall any credible candidate for lordship be without their own bodyguards, thanks to my resources. I've no desire whatsoever to send the best guildmasters of the city to any untimely doom. I want you hale and hearty and leading our city by enjoying long and successful careers of outvoting the crooked lords. Will I have to give up being guildmaster? Gods, no. The lords have no rule requiring it, and any guild member with an ounce of sense will see the advantages of having the head of their guild voting on city laws and regulations. And you're the third guildmaster I've visited this morning who's reacted favorably to my suggestion. So if you say yes, you'll not be standing alone under any suspicion or ridicule. The third... Lord Hustim's smile was warm and friendly. You'll appreciate that it would be less than polite of me to share names just now, but I doubt a lord of this city who votes with pure intentions and untainted judgment will scorn any of you. So now, Guildmaster Halangrim Ornbrand, are you with me? 
the head of the most diligent league of sailmakers and cord wainers looked as eager and excited as a small boy trembling on the verge of being handed a splendid toy that might yet be snatched away from him. W why, yes, he managed to blurt out. I believe I am. Good, Lord Hustine purred. Not that he doubted for a moment that a man as greedy and grasping as this one would decline a hidden lord's mask if offered one. Now, to extricate himself gracefully and head for the next quarry, or target, or whatever the best term might be. Dolt. Dolt would do fine. I, uh, what happens now? Ornbrand almost squeaked. Lord Erland Husty managed not to roll his eyes. It wasn't hard at all. He had been noble all his life and well-schooled. Not a subtlety of expression nor hint of tonal inflection betrayed anything he didn't want it to. T'was the breeding that did it. The reek of the sewers was particularly aromatic tonight. Something highly spiced on serving platters in the blue jack above was hurrying patrons' bowels with more than the usual enthusiasm. Tasheen leaned close to the grating, straining to hear Antler's slow, deep, quietly voiced words over the gurgling flow of filth. Not for the first time she thought about how swiftly and easily a needle blade could take her life, sliding through the grating into her ear and on and in. She fought down a shudder before she lost too many more of the words meant for that ear. If she did the wrong thing... Tonight's meeting of the lords will provide ideal opportunities for eliminating lords either as they approach the palace or when they depart, Antler was observing calmly. You may remove these three lords in any manner and order that will prevent your being seen or otherwise traced by the watch or any hired bodyguards. Irmira Stravandar, Kalira Arhand, and Sarathlu Surendragon, all females, so even the most dunderheaded spy should be able to spot them, and Surendragon a half-elf to boot. Tashin wanted to ask if avoiding being traced trumped making sure the deaths occurred as soon as possible, or the other way around, but she was too wise to ask in the moment of silence following Antler's words. A moment later, he spoke again in tones that hinted he was wearing the same wry smile that set her lips to curving. Not being identified or successfully followed takes precedence over successful elimination. If any or all of those three are too well guarded to take down, their daughters, the Larla Stravander, Ildath Stravander, Nelvala Arhand, and Laelra Serendragon are to be kidnapped instead. Once you take them, change the plant hanging in your window— and I shall know and contact you again. Antler did not have to say the words to make it clear the daughters would be used to lure the target lords to meetings where they would be slain. A moment later, however, he added casually, Their entire families will be gone by month end. And into the silence that followed, he said, Now go and do your best. I hear and obey, Tashin murmured, drawing back from the grating as swiftly as she could. She made her way up through the cellars with worry riding her mind. Zarela was still recovering at the temple and wasn't to be trusted anyway. That murderous look in her eyes when Drake had brought her back so charred held a clear meaning that even a simpleton could have read very clearly. She blamed Tashin for her burnt agonies, and wanted to get even, somehow and some when. So for tonight, it was just her and Drake. She had to go talk to Drake. Should you be telling me this? That earned him a disgusted look on a face that hadn't been lovely to begin with, but one didn't last long as a thug in the darker corners of Waterdeep without being cautious, and he was used to disgusted looks. 
usually from Doxies, not a fellow employee of the Lord of the Sewers, but... This far down from the Xanathar, Tholik, what matters is doing things right, not what someone may overhear of our jabber. I don't pick these places for their lovely views now, do I? You do not, Tholik confirmed, leaning in closer so Lunder's next words could be growled in an even quieter whisper. Right, Lunder said. Latest orders are that the Eye Lord wants us to covertly aid and abet a Gentrum assassination attempt that'll happen tonight as the masked bloody lords of Waterdeep all converge on the palace for a meeting. Phew, Tholik observed. The lords are really catching it these last few days, hey? The gents, Lunder continued, growling out his words more deeply in heavy reproof, are trying to kill particular lords, the ones who are their fiercest foes. And the word coming up from the Eye Lord is we're to help them take those particular lords down by firing crossbows from afar at their bodyguards and at the watchguards and watchful order mages who will be adorning the rooftops of the palace and sundry nearby buildings. And? And the usual. If we get caught, we're on our own and may even get silenced by other hands of the Xanathar. Of course, Follick said laconically. Always the way. I'll go get extra crossbows out, Lunder added, and lurched away. Tholig watched him go, shook his head, and muttered to the slimy stone wall right beside him, And no matter what lords are behind the masks, we get the dirty jobs and nothing ever changes. The night slug that had been flowing unhurriedly down the wall stopped for a moment, as if considering Tholig's opinion, but resumed its journey without offering a comment. Even slugs knew what was safest in the darker corners of Waterdeep. Lord Hustim... Laryl greeted the nobleman. Such an unexpected pleasure. Your candor, Lady Silverhand, is exceeded only by your beauty, was the dry reply. The twinkle in his eye grew as Laryl gave him a real grin. Pray enlighten me as to your hunger to taste both, she replied, waving him to a chair. He bowed his head and smiled by way of thanks, but remained standing. We are both pressed for time, as it happens, and as yours involves the business of the city, I want to do nothing at all to keep you from being rested and in as contented a frame of mind as possible, so I'll be brief. He plucked a scroll from a belt tube and unfurled it. If you would be so good, he said gently, I would like you to nominate this list of five willing guildmasters to be lords. At last... Laryl lifted an eyebrow. These five would seem to have an unusual champion. The guilds are already represented among the lords. Guild members, yes, but masters. Twice only, I believe, and in days gone by. I believe it's high time for change, balance, fairness. And what is behind this most noble desire for change, my lord? Laryl asked dryly. Care to be candid? Lord Hustim was openly wearing a ring that bore a mind stone, and he lifted that hand now to draw her attention to it as he smiled and said, Loyalty to Waterdeep, and a hope that its open lord is wise and worldly and fair enough to embrace change as I do for a brighter and stronger future for our city of splendors. You, my lord, Laryl told him, should write speeches. And she held out her hand to take his list. The scroll was placed in her grasp as reverently as any faithful of Mr. had ever treated a shining chosen, and to it Lord Hustim added the sudden brilliance of a wide smile that had every seeming of being genuine. You have my promise that your suggested nominees shall be put before the assembled lords, Laryl assured the tall noble. Of their decisions to come, I can, of course, not even guess, let alone make any promises at all. Lady, Lord Hustine told her, bowing and reaching to kiss her hand, we all do what we can.
In mortal life, that must be enough. Tashin looked down from the window that commanded the best view of the lamplit gates. Ah, there was Drake now. He would report on Zarela's condition, and then they could plan tonight's... Uh-oh. Trouble. She whirled away from the window, sprinting fast. Hold! Drake had slipped into the grounds of Mel Shimber House so often that there was no longer the slightest trace of furtiveness about his movements, avoiding the pool of lamplight in favor of the nearer of the two flanking and unlit side archways, he strolled in with an air of casual unconcern. Until two hard-faced bodyguards stepped out of the night shadows of the neatly clipped trees and shrubs to block his way, one had a loaded crossbow trained on him. This is a private residence, the other added sternly. Hold, man, and state your name and business. Drake sighed, shook his head, and kept on walking toward them as his fingers surreptitiously slid the catch on his up-the-wrist sheath to let its dagger drop into his hand. He gripped the weapon, drawing that hand in enough to conceal the blade gleaming up his arm. If he headed that way, the one fool would end up blocking the aim of his fellow's crossbow. It would be a wild and risky few moments, but he could take them both down. Leaving would be far more prudent, considering that he had to return here repeatedly in the future, but Drake didn't trust the truculent face of the guard with the crossbow. Likely as not, that one would let fly at his back if he tried to leave, and he was too far inside the gates now for cover. Man, you heard me. Stop where you are. That's an order. Stop, the crossbowman added in a phlegmy snarl, or I'll drop you. Neglecting to reply, Drake sidestepped smoothly that way, blade out now, and... Drop it! That sharply shouted command came from behind the two guards. Drake found himself staring at a line of six. No, eight. More were stepping into view, and all of them menaced him with crossbows. There was no way he could prevail against so many. The line was long enough that even if he was able to swing the one guard back and forth fast enough so they turned the man into a pincushion, bolts would be hissing past right into, yes, Drake. I have business with the Lady Mel Shimber, business of her instigation, mind you, but if you prefer I return at another time, he announced calmly, I'll depart, and turned to go. Halt right where you are, the burly guard who'd last shouted a command at him now ordered sharply, or we'll down you where you stand. Drake obeyed. As they hastened to surround him in a ring of aimed and ready crossbows, he announced flatly, I speak truth. The burly guard jerked his head in a silent command at one of his fellows, who carefully set down his crossbow and hastened off gone to bring back the Lady Mel Shimber, of course. And almost undoubtedly to return with the wrong one, Lady Andreathra Mel Shimber, Tashin's mother. Drake silently recalled the most colorful curses he knew in slow and exacting order. And stayed very still. Chapter 14 a night's worth of troubles. I do hope you weren't hoping for a good long dream voyage, lady, for some nights oblige with peaceful oblivion, and others seem alive with mischief and affray. This one already, I deem, shows itself one of the latter. Lady, more than a night's worth of troubles assails us. Fairnsar, the Fair Knight, in Act Two, Scene One of the play Storm-Tossed Seafarings, by Jostrin Zavalander, playwright of Marsember, first performed in the Year of the Scroll. Sure enough, the woman who arrived at the Mel Shimber gates from the deepening night shadows within, accompanied by a lantern bearer and three encloaked ladies in waiting had hair that was streaked with gray and white. Her eyes were bright and alert, 
and as she surveyed Darleth Drake standing alone in a ring of her bowmen, something that might have been amusement played about her face. Lady, the burly guard asked, his barking voice gentler and more respectful now, do you know this man? The Lady Andreathra Melshimber looked Drake up and down unhurriedly, gave him a pleasant smile, and informed the guard, No, I'm afraid I don't, Malrin. Yet I do like the look of him. I, a new voice cut in firmly from behind the lantern-bearer, do know him. This man is my employee. The ladies-in-waiting silently parted with the speed and grace that was almost magical and as Tasheen, the younger Lady Melshimber, stepped out into the light and met her mother's amused gaze, she felt the need to add, He's my trade agent and messenger here in the city. Lady Andreathra's eyebrow arched more than a little mockingly, but she said serenely to the bodyguards and servants, You may all return to your posts. We are, it seems, as safe as ever here in Melshimber House and favoring her daughter's newly revealed employee with a rather sardonic nod, she turned away. Guards melted away silently, and the time it took Drake to slowly let out a tensely gathered breath, he found himself alone with Tasheen, who turned without a word and strode deeper into the night-shrouded grounds of her family seat, a little wave of her hand bidding him follow. He obeyed, not missing tiny sounds in the darkness on either side that told him some of the guards were keeping pace with them. Tashin must have heard the noises too, but chose to ignore them. Once they were in her rooms, the door firmly closed, Tashin kept her bedside lamp hooded and turned to address him in soft murmurs. Drake bent close to her lips. They both knew that servants would be standing in the passage outside the door, straining to overhear. Tashin conveyed their orders for the evening ahead, not bothering with the fiction that she was selecting the lords to be killed. Drake let his misgivings show in his face. Forgive my boldness, he muttered, but whoever is giving you orders is risking you more and more each foray with increasingly bold and dangerous arrangements. This could very well mean both our deaths before sunrise. Tashin stared at him. It could always have done from the first. Yet I agree, this hazards us more than before. She stared into his eyes. And so? And so, Lady Tashin, he said quietly, their gazes locked. I want to become more than an employee. I want to become your partner. The ghost of a smile quirked her lips for the briefest of instants. In all senses of the word? Of course. I've wanted to sleep with you since our road together began. The young noblewoman's eyes were cool as she stared at him, and then, without the slightest change in her expression, she started unbuttoning what she wore. Of course, I thought you'd never ask. Drake gaped at her, then cast a swift glance back over his shoulder at the door. Now? Why not? We may both be dead by tonight, and what better way to make the servants think you're just my play toy, and therefore can be gossiped about and otherwise ignored. Feel free to ravish me as noisily as you want to. Tashin winked. I might even enjoy it. Jalister felt Dunblade stiffen beside him and knew very well why. He was struggling to rein in his own rising irritation. He kept silent with an effort, knowing his best deadpan expression had slipped more or less for good several moots ago. Even armed with Elminster's wryly eloquent tongue, they were encountering difficulty after difficulty in getting past the far too numerous guard posts. Every few steps through the tunnels leading into the palace, tunnels that so far, as he could tell, only came from places garrisoned by the watch. The trio found their way onward, barred by another armored cluster of vigilant, wary, and dedicated watch guards reinforced by watchful order mages. This latest group of sentinels seemed particularly obstinate. Jalister glowered at them, and they glowered back. I know the previous guard post let you pass, 
the burly orser in gleaming oiled blue plate armor told Elminster gruffly, his arms folded across his chest and his thick and even more heavily oiled mustache hanging over his lip like a stout old shield. I have eyes, man, yet their decision is in no wise my decision. I say again, you cannot pass. And I, Elminster informed him pleasantly, say again that ye have no authority to stop me. If ye persist in this defiance, then I deem ye all traitors, so consider thyselves all of ye dismissed from the city service. Now stand aside before I become less civil. The orser snorted, and there was a barely suppressed chuckle from the line of armored guards behind him as they stirred and laid hands to sword hilts and sidestepped to give the mage a gap to hurl magic through. I tremble, the orser sneered. Less civil, old man? Are my ears going to be smitten by the oaths my grand dam favored then? He cast a disparaging glance over Jallister and Dunblade. Or are you going to shake your fists and prance as these two striplings of yours menace us with their sold swords, hmm? Elminster smiled, leaned forward conspiratorially, raised his hand, and said behind the back of it, Or, sir, before thy wayward tongue gets ye in more trouble, I must ask, are ye certain? The orser stepped back a pace and half drew his sword meaningfully. Certain of what? Elminster's smile widened. That I'm not the lord of Waterdeep? Several of the guards laughed, and the watchful order mage sighed and said, Oh, come now, dotard. Just how gullible do you think us? Elminster waved a hand behind his back, making Dunblade stiffen still more as a wash of weave power made his skin crawl and tingle. Jallister felt it too, and turned his head to look across Dunblade's back in time to see a few phantom ghosts of sparks fade around the old wizard's fingertips, which were suddenly cradling not mere empty air, but the gleaming and gilded helm of a masked lord the upswept collar soaring into two latticework seeing screens surmounted by a golden crown around the pointed spire of the helm. In short, the distinctive mask of a masked lord. Unhurriedly, Elminster raised it, put it on, and asked, Now are ye still so certain? The guardians exchanged brief and troubled glances of disbelief and dawning doubt as that dry old voice from within the helm murmured something they couldn't catch that made the mage's eyes narrow in suspicion. There was a brief but spirited flickering of light in the dim tunnel behind the old man in the helm, and out of it stepped a lord of Waterdeep in full and splendid purple robes and black leather gauntlets wearing an identical mask helm. This new arrival strode past Elminster, Dunblade, and Jallister, and curtly ordered the guardians in the firm and deep voice of a man of some years, Stand aside! They gave way uncertainly, and the anonymous lord walked into their midst and then turned and asked Elminster, Well, are you coming or staying to talk to these adventurers all day? They're with me, the old wizard replied. Lady Silverhand wants to talk to them. Well, she hates to be kept waiting even more than I do, the Lord said. Jerking his head in a come-on gesture, he marched on into the palace. Elminster walked confidently after him, and Jallister and Dunblade fell in behind. But the guards walked alongside and laid hands on the two adventurers' swords and sword arms. You'll have to leave those with us, the Orser said firmly. Those, Jallister asked. Your weapons, all of them. Oh, I don't think so, Jallister began, but caught sight of Elminster looking back over his shoulder and shaking his head, so the scion of the Silver Manes reluctantly, as he walked, drew his sword, and then his dagger, and then its better-hidden mate, offering each in succession to the Orser, who triumphantly took weapon after weapon and passed them to his fellow guardians. Jallister and Dunblade reached the ends of their visible arsenals just before the masked lord striding along ahead of Elminster attained the next guard post. 
where two mages stood guard, accompanied by only three watchguards in full armor, and this time, as Jallister and Dunblade held up empty sheaths and scabbards, and Elminster said firmly, These two are with us, and attend by request of Open Lord Laryl. There was no move to stop them. So on they went, through another archway and a mood of passages where Elminster cleared his throat to attract the attention of the Lord ahead of him before he turned into one. The Lord turned in mid-stride to join El, who had stopped beside a door, where he doffed his mask helm, the better to turn and favor the wearer of the other impassive mask helm with a grin. As he murmured, Thanks, Morden Canaan. The magnificent purple robes, crowned mask helm and armored collar, gauntlets and all, promptly melted away like smoke to reveal a burly, trim-bearded man in plain, rather worn robes smiling back at him. That, Morden Canaan chuckled, was fun. Now, can I get back to my chowder before it burns? It's at the crucial stirring in of the last spice. Worry not, there'll be plenty left when you get back tonight. But of course, El grinned, and there was suddenly empty air where Morden Canaan had been standing. El turned to Jallister and Dunblade. Ye didn't hear any of that, of course, he advised them dryly, as he produced a skeleton key from under his robes and unlocked the door. Or see this. An existing enchantment made the ceiling of the room beyond the door glow faintly as the door was swung wide, and they saw it was a small armory, crammed with beautiful and expensive weapons of the finest make. Select whatever ye want, Elminster told them, that ye can carry without staggering and clanging, mind. Eagerly and wonderingly, the adventurers from Shadowdale did so. Lords are beginning to arrive, a passing servant murmured at the doorway, not waiting for an answer. Laryl looked up with a smile and a nod, but only for a moment. Her desk was still heaped with reports, reports, and more reports. Fresh writings, all of them penned within the past ten day. Updates of leaking pumps and sewers of how far behind city workers had fallen on the street repair program after Neverember diverted so many of them and funds to work on repairing and widening the coastal road linking Waterdeep to Neverwinter, and several personal petitions that might be better termed outright offers of bribes to her as open lord from wealthy Waterdavian private citizens who wanted to join the nobility listing the reasons why their new blood would improve the ranks of the decadent old bloods, and demanding to know why the previous open lord had reversed the practice of allowing nobles to sell their titles, which had worked so well and served our fair city so handsomely. Laryl made a face at that one. Well, yes, when it came right down to it, everything was for sale. But surely society worked when there were some certainties, some ironclad traditions. Now the trick was just which elements would be those sacrosanct pillars. Deeper thinking for another day. Beneath the petitions were pleas for compensation for houses lost in the field ward and cavern homes lost in downshadow. Then three letters demanding to know what the palace was going to do to protect the city if the dragon raids came again, two of them with suspiciously similar wording. Beneath that, complaints of the prices of specific foods rising for a ten-day for no good reason, and suspicions that certain merchants and costers were colluding to fix these prices so highly. And complaints of bad smells from the sewers, and of noise at night in the streets, and... Waterdeep had so many problems that seemed small, but made more difference in the daily lives of its citizens than the fate of the lords or even who or what, aside from an out-and-out -out tyrant, was sitting in the palace. And a lesser, more craven lord might have taken refuge in Castle Waterdeep or the caverns inside Mount Waterdeep or some private fortified mansion in Seaward, but, immobile and enticing target or not, she was staying right here. For one thing, how would she get any work done in a timely manner? All of these reports, decisions to be made, things to be ordered, so much paper to get lost or deliberately altered or mislaid trundling across the city. Moreover, 
as fire and bloodshed seemed to erupt anywhere in the city where someone wanted a lord dead, it would seem a great kindness to honest Water Davian citizens if there were in truth any of those if she kept such unpleasantness out of harm's reach of them. So here she would stay, prudence be damned. As the vultures came to her, Laryl sat back and stretched, letting her weary thoughts wander. So, would these lordlings give her rain enough to tackle them all, or stand in her way, or try to oust her as they'd ousted Daggled Neverember? Did they just want a biddable figurehead? And were any of those six pushiest lords using the murders, or were they even behind the killings in some way, to install their friends or individuals they could compel among the lords. It certainly seemed that way. Laryl gave the ceiling a wry smile. The evening ahead was going to be interesting, to say the least. On warm and pleasant summer nights, the plaza outside what Water Davians still insisted on calling Pier Girin's palace was usually crowded with people walking and talking, seeing and being seen, laughing together and sharing jests and boasts and suggestions to do business on the morrow. It was a crossroads and a place to gather that afforded a magnificent view of Augaren's dark and frowning needle of a tower facing the rising opulence of the palace, with the huge sheltering bulk of Mount Waterdeep rising at its back. It wasn't the best view in the city, but the vista out over the harbor inevitably came with a reek that was muted or missing here. So this was a favorite place for water Davians with noses that still worked to congregate. They were here in plentiful throngs right now. Mert lurched among them, trying to keep his three lasses in view. Not an easy task, even if he'd wanted to bend and crane and peer as obviously as a mother seeking strayed children, for the trio were spread out across the open space. Well, except for Waratra, who was a few paces up the rising flank of the castle spur of Mount Waterdeep, so that slight height would let her look out over the milling throng. It would not be long now. There was a sharp tension in the air, the scent of blood to come. Mert knew that smell of old and growled to himself, nostrils flaring. Twasn't the fighting or even the damned panting running he minded so much. Twas the infernal waiting, spew it all. And then, so suddenly that it was shocking, despite his anticipating it, it was happening. A man whisked a small, swept-back crossbow out from under his night cloak, not six paces away, already cocked. He slapped a bolt into place, aimed, and, with Mert still three lumbering strides away, fired. Mert's foremost well-worn boot hadn't hit the ground yet before there were two sharp cracks of crossbows firing not far behind him. A moment later another rang out, from far off to his right. And then it seemed as if the plaza was alive with screaming, running frantic people and men and women coolly downing identical small swept-back crossbows to the cobbles to plant their feet in the stirrups and draw them ready again. Mert wasted no time in gawking, but ended his hastening charge by crashing hard into the bowman he was heading for, ramming head and shoulder deep into meaty gut as the man instinctively swept the bow aside out of harm's way. As he bore the wildly kicking man over backward, Mert punched the bowman's throat thrice, hard, bouncing the man's head off the unyielding cobbles. The head had a face he knew, a gentarum agent. Blood spurted, the gent convulsed under Mert, and went limp even before the wheezing old lord of Waterdeep, for he was still that eye, whether these younglings prancing about the deep these days respected that or not, rolled off him and unsteadily back to his feet to run on. Now Mert did look around, for there was much to see. Here and there about the plaza, as he stared in this direction and that, crossbow bolts were shimmering as they hung in midair, inching very slowly toward lords of Waterdeep who were being hustled toward the palace by hard-faced and anxious bodyguards. As he gazed, bolt after bolt came to a hovering halt. Shielding spells cast by watchful order mages had to be. 
Mert looked to the closest corner rooftops. That's where the mages and city guard posted themselves day and night hereabouts back in his day, in time to see a young mage take a speeding bolt in the throat that snatched him off his feet, lifeblood fountaining while he was still arched over backward in midair. Before he fell back out of sight, Mert was already feigning his own collapse to the cobbles where more than a few bodies now lay sprawled because that twist and fall let him peer back where the mage's death had come from. A familiar bowman, somehow. No livery nor armor, just nondescript homespun. But it was someone Mert had seen in Dockward these past few days. Someone the lasses had told him worked for... the Xanathar. So now, gent agents trying for the lords, men of the Xanathar working with them? or just wanting as many lords dead as possible, or taking out watchful order mages who were handy targets right now. Mert huddled low on the cobbles as he spun around in all directions trying to see his hired lasses. Across the plaza, a watchguard slumped to dangle over the edge of a roof, a bolt protruding from the front of his open-faced helm. A second toppled from another rooftop, a bolt through his neck. People were running again, shrieking and pelting through the plaza out of street mouths, fleeing from the wrath of watchguards now boiling out of buildings everywhere to seek bowmen. And a roar arose as adventurers burst forth from inns and taverns and pelted down streets, weapons drawn as they shouted. All of them, watchguards and ruffians alike, converging on the palace. Someone's been hiring, Mert growled, lurching to his feet and running to the nearest of his girls. It was Rava, looking as if she was enjoying herself immensely. She pointed as he ran up, and when Mert looked where, he discovered she was pointing to her fellow hirelings. Get down, Mert roared, grabbing for Rava's arm. Stay low and get to cover. Rava grinned unconcernedly at him as she eluded his hand but fell in beside him as he ran on toward Drella. Fat man, you're the best cover around here. Mert was too wheezingly breathless to answer, and was still fighting for breath when their headlong sprint brought them to two watchguards who loomed up in front of them with the stern, Hold hard there! Stop and answer to the watch! Without an instant's hesitation, Rava flung herself at their ankles, rolled hard under them, and toppled them both sprawling even before Mert had to break stride. Then she was up, as supple as a harbor eel and running on, You're crazed, you know that, Mert grunted at her sidelong. Rava gave him a wide and merry grin. If you say so, you're paying. When Drake handed her the helm of the third watchguard he'd had to kill so they could stay on this rooftop, Tashin pulled it on as fast as she could, thanking him with a wordless nod, which he might not have even seen, for he was already busily stripping a limp watchguard body of its armor which was a very good idea, considering how slarning many crossbow bolts had come humming past their ears in the brief and rather breathless time they'd been up here. Six freshly slain watchguards lay underfoot, but from this vantage point, Augeron's tower was directly ahead and the palace rose spired and magnificent against the looming mountainside to their right. She noticed Drake reach up and rub at his neck just behind his ear. For the second time, she realized, perhaps the third since watch guards had stopped dying all around them. Tashin peered. It was some sort of mark, a brand. And it was new, still red and inflamed. Drake seemed to feel her scrutiny. He turned, snake-swift, caught her looking at him, and rewarded her with a frown. She looked away, saying nothing. We all have our secrets, and hers had brought them here where they were so, so likely to die. She ducked her head. This helm didn't even have a front to it, and occasional crossbow bolts were still snarling out of the night like angry wasps. Then something moved in the air before her. Something in the vista beyond the edge of the roof, something that should not be moving. It was a rippling in the air as if the empty night above the plaza was disturbed harbor water. It could only be, Tashin frowned, the normally invisible magic fields surrounding the slim stone pinnacle of a Garen's tower stirring. 
Drake was watching the ripples too, so this wasn't just some trick or affliction of Tasheen's own eyes. Like all water Davians, she knew the dark and slender tower in front of the palace as something unchangeable, a landmark that was just always there, silent, shut up, deserted, and never visibly changed by the passing years. No one had been able to enter it since Augarin's death. The ripples suddenly blossomed into swirls of roiling and vivid blue, silver, and gray, and a short, dusky woman appeared atop them, standing in midair as if the fields were solid ground under her boots. It was Vajra Safar, the Blackstaff, holding what was left of the fabled Blackstaff itself above her head. Her eyes flashing, the small and slender woman cried out words of magic that struck Tashin's ears like thunderclaps, then rolled across the sky like thunder. The fragment of staff in her hands flared into blue-white, restlessly crawling serpents of magic writhing and nodding and becoming many streaking bolts that spat forth to speed down from the staff, turning and darting in accordance with Vajra's will. Bursting where they hit, flaring around targets who flung up their arms in agony and fell, every one of them the bowmen and sword swingers who did not wear watchguard uniforms and weren't bodyguards to any hurrying lord of Waterdeep. The onrushing adventurers faltered before those bright missiles, but the watchguards did not, racing to ring the lords and help bustle them into the palace. Tashin and Drake watched the black staff and the ripple she had caused wink out of existence together, leaving the night air empty once more. They had crossbows of their own ready and loaded with poisoned bolts, but in tavern tales long shot by those who don't practice their archery daily may find improbable marks. In night dark on this rooftop, the two of them would just have to wait until lords got much closer. After all... They were after specific lords, and in those helms no lord was an easy target for a distant bowman. They would have to loose at joints and hands, and hope Timora smiled on their aimings. Hold this on, Drake ordered, handing Tashin a blood-stained watch breastplate. While I buckle you up, stay low. She crawled over unpleasantly bloody watch guards to get to where he could do that and settled the unlovely piece of armor where it should go. Any sign of the lords we're after yet? No, Drake replied. And I? Whatever else he was going to say was lost in the sudden whang of a crossbow bolt glancing off Tashin's breastplate like the full-weight roundhouse blow of a strong warrior's fist and leaping on into the night. Down, Drake snarled, shoving her. Another bolt promptly skidded across the armor of two dead watch guards with an unpleasant hiss and followed the first quarrel into oblivion beyond the roof edge. Drake shoved at a body to thrust it up enough to form a shield of sorts as he wormed around on his belly, hastily donning his own borrowed watch armor. Bolts rang off dead arms and shoulder plates with force enough that Tashin, wincing as she watched and tried to burrow in among the bodies to get even lower, knew would have left behind bad bruises if she'd been inside those plates. Who, by all the watching gods? she demanded angrily of the night sky above her. Xanathar men, by where those are coming from, Drake replied calmly. Grab our poisoned bolts, mind you don't set the bows off plucking them out. And let's get gone from here. Leave the bows, we're done here. But, but nothing. This armor will turn aside glancing strikes, but if a few of those catch us squarely, we'll be as dead as these watchlouts. Come. He was crawling for the hatch they'd come up onto the roof through as a fresh rain of bolts rang off the armor of the dead all around them. So it'll be the snatching, Tashin panted, as she crawled up over a burly corpse and slid face first down to the rooftop beyond it, poisoned bolts clutched in her hand. She had gloves waiting under this breastplate, but the time to try to retrieve them wasn't yet. I thought it would be. Drake replied calmly as he lifted the hatch and held it up so it could serve as a shield for her climb down into the attic below. A trio of bolts came out of the night and thudded into it as one, slamming it down again. Drake patiently tugged it open again with one hand and rolled Tashin into the opening with the other. 
She fell headfirst toward the unseen floor below and twisted desperately in midair, landing hard on her shoulder with enough force to drive all her wind out of her. Bouncing on her back amid the dust of seeming centuries, Tasheen gasped out a curse that made Drake grin. She saw that in the fleeting glimpse of his face she got through the hatch before he flung himself down to join her. Tasheen rolled, a maneuver both loud and painful in the unaccustomed armor, and almost got clear in time. Almost. This audiobook has been broken into multiple parts to make the download faster. You have reached the end of a part, but not the end of the complete audiobook, so please check your library for the next part of this audiobook. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. This is Audible. And now, part two of Death Masks, written by Ed Greenwood and performed by John Pruden. Chapter 15 a memorable feast. And if we are now come at last to the inevitable, to the meal that shall end in bitter confrontation, where hard words shall be loudly spoken, and sharp swords sing and shed much blood, to leave lives splattered across the floor, the succulents of the dishes swift forgotten, well then, before all the violence begins, let it at least be deemed a memorable feast. Joscor the Fool, in Act Two, Scene Four of the play, Mere Undefended, by Marendra Halagost, playwright of Mintar, first performed in the Year of the Turret. This evening feast had lacked the usual glass forest of busily circulating decanters, but all of the rich broths the meats had been drenched in gave off heady whiffs of wine. However, what actually addled the senses, Laryl had been assured, had been boiled off in the kitchens. Which wasn't to say certain senses in this room might not be addled already without any recourse to drink. So now the dishes were being cleared away, and the open lord of Waterdeep was facing the surviving lords of the city, all thirteen of them, not counting the absent Mert, of course, across the table. Their helms had been doffed after they'd entered the room, so the servers had been the usual small handful of senior palace servants. Sipping a glass of broth, Laryl gave no outward sign that Dove and Silene were invisible whisperers busily filling her ears. The one called Cassander stopped on his way in several times, Silene warned to slip coins to various courtiers and servants. Would you like the roster? Later, dear, Laryl thought back. Later. He's up to something, Dove muttered darkly. They all are, dear, Silene put in. They all are. Laryl sent them a mental grin. Watch and listen to all of this, please, sisters. I can't look into every face and overhear each murmured aside. Of course. Silene murmured. It will be our pleasure, Dove added. Laryl felt them drift away, swallowing the last of the broth and handing it to the attentive servant who'd just set three tall glasses of water in front of her. Laryl rose and gave that maid a smile of thanks and nod of dismissal. At the back of the hall, the servants by the doors saw that nod and smoothly withdrew, firmly closing the doors behind them with enough noise to reassure those in the room that they had been closed. Laryl watched to see which masked lords looked around to check that the servants had all departed. Cassander, of course, and Hirler Post, and Bosker. The latter two making a show of it, to show that they were carrying out an assigned duty and were attentive to it. Laryl put away her wry smile before it could reach her lips. Their duty done, they nodded to Cassander, who pointedly turned his attention to Laryl, which in turn seemed to be the signal for attentive silence to fall. Laryl smiled into it. There were Cassander's six on her left, the gently smiling Cassander himself, 
than the carefully expressionless Lady Merimther, Saturnine Harimral, Hail Hand the Red-Faced Mountain, Healer Post frowning and restless as if straining at a leash to bound forward and savage the open lord, and next to him the lean and tall Vosker. They were separated from the three independent and spirited female lords, Stravander, Arhand, and closest to Leryl's right hand, the half-elf Serathlu Serendragon, by Omen Dran and the three neutral lords who said little. It would have been a wiser strategy for Cassander to have scattered his fellow conspirators around the table, if, that is, he or they sought subtlety. Yet they were probably long past such fripperies of the weak and prudent. The lords were all watching her now. I should like to begin, she said pleasantly, by offering you all protective escorts if you want them, in addition to any private bodyguards you may have, of course. Details drawn from among the watch and the watchful order who can surround your homes or wherever else you may visit to watch for and defend you against intruders, arsonists, folk with crossbows and the like. The lords regarded her in wary silence. If you are interested, Laryl added, please see Warden Draith after we're done here in the Dundolphin room or apply for your own audience with him with the gate guards at Castle Waterdeep on the morrow or henceforth. These are extraordinary times. She surveyed their wary, waiting faces. Which is, of course, why we're gathered here tonight. The loss of seven lords in such a short time compels us to elect new lords to our ranks for the good and for the very stability of the city. Silence. They waited attentively. Six lords from among you, Laryl went on, have put forward six candidates. Lord Hirlerpost, will you oblige us by naming them? Lamek Hirlerpost rose, visibly swelling in size, preened for a moment, and then said, Fellow lords, we believe these citizens are worthy to wear the mask. Deresk Quarith, whose business activities make him well known among investors of our city. Zuzina Kelder, who owns many shops in every ward of the deep and so understands the needs of our shopkeepers. Halark Tarncrown, who enjoys much success as a merchant and as an investor. The widow Kadraith Hollenauer, who since her husband's death has founded her own new business which flourishes. The decidedly wealthy Zareth Kelterand, whose business connections strengthen our trading ties in Kalamshan and Parengal Yaskalant, a shipping fleet owner whose diplomatic skills are well known. He fell silent then, as if expecting applause. What he got instead was Kalira Arhand stirring in her seat to incline her head to one side in thought and ask, Have any of these candidates been asked if they're interested, and have any of them expressed interest in a lordship in the past? No. Post told her rather stiffly. I have not spoken to any of them, as tradition dictates. Nor have I, Vosker put in, a response that was swiftly echoed by the rest of the six. It was her rimworld who added, We all know prospective lords aren't queried beforehand, so what moved you to ask this? My own need to vote, Arhand replied firmly informed by knowing if any of these have eagerly sought the mask, perhaps for their own gain. Healer Post shrugged. Then be assured they have not. He smiled around the table, drew a deep breath in and out, and then said briskly, Well then, let us vote on— Not so swiftly, my lord, Laryl interrupted smoothly. We are all equals here— so it follows that these six candidates are equal to any other candidates put forward by other lords. She looked around the table. Does anyone wish to provide any other names of citizens they deem worthy of wearing the mask? She looked at Kazander. He was glaring coldly around at one face and then another, as if by silent menace he could cow any lord into silence who would otherwise have made a suggestion. Yet as time passed, almost inevitably, a lord spoke up, 
Sarathlu Surendragon clasped her hands before her and announced, I think Daranthra Zathnu of Trades Ward, the oxen tender who styles herself Lady of the Hoof, would make a good lord and give us eyes into our environs. Too often we hear from the lower Deserin only when there is trouble. Omendran nodded, and as if Serendragon's suggestion had opened a sluice gate, there came a sudden flood of suggestions from the neutral lords. The dressmaker Vailra Kahlo of Northward, Belmark Chelver of Castleward, who kept a hiring registry of caravan outriders and guards for costers using the city. Emera Flanthin of Southward of Flanthin's Fastwares, who raced fresh fruits and vegetables and small necessities to shops all over the city. And Ildunstran Worth of Dockward, who dealt in fish meal and night soil and fertilizers, and in conveying bulk root vegetables from Secumber and the Deserin to market stalls in the deep. Successful business owners all, vigorous personalities. Laryl quelled a shrug. Well, t'was inevitable that electors of that mold would seek similar candidates. Perhaps only a tyrant could end up with a voting lord who was a beggar, and another who was a youth living by wits on the streets, and still another who was an impoverished widow trying to stretch her coins into an increasingly feeble and unpleasant future. Silence fell. Hearler Post broke it by rounding on Laryl to ask coldly, and do you, Lady Silverhand, albeit very recently arrived in our fair city, have anyone to nominate? Laryl was genuinely surprised. Me? No. However, a noble lord of this city came to me today to present me with a list that he and several other lords, who have affixed their names to the list, made of five guildmasters of this city they believe should be lords at this table. She took the single sheet of parchment from the array of writings in front of her and held it up. What? Guildmasters? Interestingly, it was Vosker who was most volubly aghast. Surely that's a conflict of interest, Hearler Post snapped. So is being noble, Laryl pointed out, or wealthy through investment or shipping or trade, and being at this table and in a position to make and alter laws that affect those investments or matters of shipping and trade. However, I promised the noble lord merely that I would place the list before you, not champion it. Consider it a roster of suggested candidates from several citizens, no more. I can't believe what I'm hearing, Gruthgar Hrimrel burst out. Nobles having the naked gall to tell us who to vote for? Whatever next? He glared at Laryl. And you didn't throw him out of the palace? I didn't have to, Laryl said calmly. He left of his own accord after speaking his piece. And I happen to believe, my lords, that it is the right of every citizen to be heard. All right, we've heard him, Vosker snarled. And now we're going to go right ahead and do what we were going to do anyway. Vote in, lords, said Irmira Stravander in her distinctive low, smoky voice. Yet let us at least see the names. Hearler Post promptly leaned forward, planting a fist on the table so he could reach out imperiously for the list. But Laryl turned smoothly as if not seeing him and handed it not to him nor to Cassander closest on her left, but to the female lord seated at hand to her right, Serathlu Surendragon, who read the parchment, grimaced, and passed it to Arand next to her. She in turn perused it and passed it on. As it made its way around the table, Surendragon's reaction proved typical. Pigs, one lord said. Grasping gluttons, muttered another. What was Lord Hustim thinking? snapped a third. Garalan's a dolt, but Hustim has a brain. He's making mock of us, said another. He's manipulating us by getting us angry, Halehand grunted, tapping the table for emphasis. So fall for it not. There's nothing to say we have to even vote on these names. Let this list be burned. No, Laryl said firmly. Disregard it by all means, but there may come a time years hence when memories of this have dimmed, 
when some of you may want to remember that all of these names were once connected. Cassander's eyes narrowed, and then slowly he nodded. Wise counsel, he said in his deep and plodding voice. Wise counsel. Let the list be ignored, but retained by the open lord in the palace records. We need a vote on that, yes? Herlopost asked eagerly, but Laryl smiled. Not if I agree to do so, but vote by all means if you'd prefer to do so. Eh? The loud importer frowned in puzzlement and looked to Cassander, who shook his head, leaving Heerler Post to sit down again, flushing red with displeasure. Out of the corner of her eye, Laryl saw Serendragon hide a smile. Pretending to see none of the reactions around the table, she said smoothly, So we have seven empty seats to fill by voting here and now, and eleven candidates. Let us proceed by show of hands. Quareth for the mask? If Cassander's camp voted as a block, they only needed one of the other seven to vote with them to carry any choice. In roster matters, the open lord shouldn't vote except to break ties, which would be highly unlikely with an uneven number of voting lords at the table. Laryl had little doubt that the six candidates Cassander wanted as lords were all under his thumb so electing just one of those six would deliver the Council of Lords into his hands henceforth, which made the recent deaths handy indeed for him. Yet what had he awakened? Who else might think that murder was a satisfyingly definite way of winning power over the deep? If I was Brathen Cassander, I'd raise my wards and watch my back, not spend any time gloating. Cassander did have the grace and self-control to keep from openly gloating, but all six of his slate, Quareth, Kelder, Tarn Crown, Halhenar, Kelterond, and Yuskalant were voted in, leaving the five candidates from the floor to be voted on for the one remaining position. Laryl was utterly unsurprised when she called the first of those names Vail Rakalo, to see Cassander's five sycophants all look to Cassander to see if his hand went up. It did, so all of theirs shot up too, and being as Kalo had been proposed by a neutral lord who also voted for her, that was enough to give her a mask. Laryl suspected that Cassander judged the dressmaker the easiest dominated of the five proposed lords still in play. Well, he had his victory now and to spare, which meant that some of the five voting with him were now expendable if they crossed him in any way. Laryl wondered if any of them had realized that. Well, that's all settled, Vosker said with a loud sigh of satisfaction, getting to his feet. So I'm for home, he shot a glare Laryl's way, where I have wine. Of course you may leave, my lord, Laryl said quickly, and I'll end this meeting now if it's the general desire of all that our night's business is done. However, I must point out that what we voted on just now is not settled. What? Lords glared at her from all around the table. Are you trying to turn tyrant on us, Lady Silverhand? Perimral asked icily. Laryl shook her head. I'm merely reminding you all that, if we can believe the lords who attested as much here tonight, none of these candidates knows they were being put forward, let alone have been voted to a lordship. They can all say no, lords, every one of them. Are you suggesting we should vote in a second slate of seven? No, Laryl replied, just pointing out that we may have to assemble again if, say, more than half of the seven successful candidates refuse. Heerler Post gaped at her. No one ever refuses a lordship. Not so, lord. Many have. I was one of them once. Well, no one has refused a lordship in this century, Lady Silverhand, Vosker said sharply. True, Laryl replied but then no one in this century has been offered a lordship a bare handful of days after no less than seven lords of this city were murdered. Silence fell. As I said, 
she added quietly. Our work on this particular matter may not be done. More to the point, nor may the murderers, Surendragon muttered. Another silence fell, and then ended abruptly in a general rush to rise and get gone. Home, every one of them, as they said loudly, hastening. Not a lord staying in the palace overnight, or for that matter tarrying to confer with Laryl or each other. They all wanted to be home. With, as the doors closed behind all but one masked again lord, one exception. Braithen Kazander, of course. A word in private, Lady Silverhand. I'll be brief. By all means, Lord Kazander, I am most interested in what you have to say. Kazander looked slightly taken aback at that, but after a frowning moment put a smile on his face and asked, So, lady, tell me, in your view, what are the foremost duties of the open lord of Waterdeep? Lero didn't need any time to think about her answer. Give the citizens hope and reassure them that their city is being ruled diligently, the water flowing clean, the sewers working, the streets policed, and shortages and overcharging prevented. And after that? Don't make needless enemies and don't start foolish wars. Cassandra's eyebrows rose. Very civic-minded of you. Nothing self-serving has left your lips yet. Laryl gave him a wintry smile. The open lord has no need to be self-serving, she said softly, when the hidden lords of the city do such a good job of that. Cassandra regarded her in calm silence for a long time before he said gently, I believe you just made a needless enemy, Laryl Silverhand. Oh no, Laryl told him, her voice even softer and gentler than his. I just told one of my enemies that I know he is my foe, and has been since I arrived in the deep. He was hoping for a willing dupe or a dunderhead, and instead got me. Such an inconvenience. I've made you so much extra work, haven't I? And I fully intend to go on doing so, Braithen Cassander. That attitude makes you, I'm afraid. Business to be disposed of to me. Laryl smiled. Thank you. I've been business to be disposed of often enough down the centuries to get good at being so. Shall we dance, my lord? Cassander smiled again and raised his hands so she could see the rings on them, trying to impress her with his magical arsenal, no doubt. I look forward to it, he replied caught up his mask, and went out, leaving Laryl alone at last. She surveyed the room out of long habit, seeking not-so-accidentally-left-behind baubles that might bear an enchantment or poison. Seeing none, she retreated from the table, the spurned list of guildmasters in hand, and let out a long and weary sigh. The older you got the more tiring fencing verbally with serpents got to be. Well, sisters, she asked the empty air. Dove didn't bother to whisper. I think you're going to have to do what you said you wouldn't do, turn tyrant. That's not a term I'd choose to use, Laryl admonished her. So, pray elucidate. You, Dove replied promptly, were going to be like Storm refereeing Harper disputes. You were going to keep all of the deep's squabbling nobles and guilds and aspiring to nobility wealthy personages and masked lords talking to each other, no matter how messy and clumsy the results, because that's governance without tyranny, which is what you're striving for. However, however, Silune took over smoothly, not bothering to whisper either, you can't afford to cleave to that road any longer. This Cassandra is trying to forge a tyranny, and it seems he somehow knows he needn't fear your art. You can either depart the deep and leave them all to it, or you'll have to do whatever's necessary to stop Cassandra or prevent the civil war that'll erupt in this city when he shoves too hard and others push back, and he deals with them violently. 
and being as none of us can spell blast the likes of Cassander into dust anymore, not without weakening the weave too much to avoid ruining Waterdeep and enraging Mistra besides, you're going to have to play Cassander's game. Which of his games? Laryl asked quietly. You're going to have to become the strong woman in this palace, too mighty to ignore or thrust aside which means you'll need to forge an alliance to be your strength and your shield, and do it without owing too much to anyone, and without alienating everyone. Just most of them, Dove joked, and you've made a good start at that with the dolts and poltroons among the current lords. So, Lair, Siluna asked sharply, do you agree? Laryl smiled. You've put into words what I'd already decided I'd have to do. Now I just have to decide how best to go about it. Talk to Mert to find out what not to do, and to L to learn the underhandedly sly but preferable way, Dub said. I heard that, said a familiar voice from under the great table. Laryl stepped back to where she could see under it. Not that the draped tablecloths let her see anything at all. I should have known... A moment later, her sigh of amused exasperation became a frown, as two unfamiliar young men whose garb and bristling weaponry proclaimed them adventurers emerged from under the table draperies to smile and nod nervously at her, followed by Elminster. I thought these lords of the deep would never be done trying to belittle ye, Lair, he said, clambering to his feet. Yet it seems we weren't needed to prevent actual bloodshed after all. Praise Mistra for small mercies, Laryl replied. And who are your two friends? Open Lord Laryl Silverhand of Waterdeep, El said solemnly. I present to ye Jalister Silvermane and Feral Dunblade, both formerly of Shadowdale but now agone adventuring. They've fetched up here in the City of Splendor seeking their fortunes, as so many bright young jacks and lasses do. Laryl smiled. Well met, gentle sayers. And what, having heard them now wielding their power, do you think of the great lords of Waterdeep? They certainly break wind a lot, Jalister told her. Whatever did you feed them? Hold in the name of the watch. Mert swallowed a sigh and reached an arm around Rava to clamp down on Drella's nearest shoulder just in time. She'd have probably made it, fleeing from the watch even here in Castle Ward, but that would have meant long hours in custody for the rest of them, giving answers that wouldn't have been believed to questions he'd rather not listen to in the first place. The nearest of this full-strength and alert-looking watch patrol looked to be veterans, and as they came forward, spreading out and keeping hands on hilts, they wore the confident half-smiles of men and women who'd seen it all and trusted that they could deal, rather wearily, with just about anything, bolstered by the aid of their duty mage. Holding, Mert replied pleasantly. And how goes the patrol this fair night? Passable citizen so far, came the reply. So now, three young ladies and one man of formidable build hastening from a direction in which there's been recent trouble in the direction of Dock Ward. One might even say, Sayer, that you were hurrying these ladies along. The lantern was being brought up, soon to be unhooded full in Mert's face, and he could feel Drella trembling under his fingertips. Rava was already playing to her strength by reaching for the lacings of what she was wearing, and if he knew Waratra as well as he thought he did, she'd be very stealthily getting something sharp and pointed to where she could throw it. He'd managed to collect his three lasses and get well clear of the milling melee in the plaza, after anyone who looked like a lord had made it inside more or less unscathed, but now it seemed he was going to be encumbered for most of the rest of the night, unless... Lords of Waterdeep, he replied grandly, often find it necessary to hurry other citizens along, even watch guards, sword captain... The watch guards froze just for a moment, but then the sword captain asked Mert in tones heavy with disbelief, Do they now, Sayer? Do they now? 
I certainly do, Mert replied, lifting his chin and sounding as confident as he knew how. And? Then it was his turn to stiffen. Where? He barked sharply and pointed. The sword captain sneered. It was, after all, a ploy old enough to have achieved lichdom centuries before either he or Mert were born. But some of the watch guards looked up at where Mert was pointing and exclaimed aloud, perhaps because they thought it was a tired ploy too and were genuinely astonished. Two men, well, man-shaped figures, though both were lithe and graceful, and the more he watched, the more womanly one of them seemed, had just leaped from one nearby tall house roof to another, the better to loop a drop line around its handy chimney so they could drop down over the edge of the roof, as they were busily doing right now, to reach an upper window. The watch guards started to move, heading for that house in a rush, all except the mage, who followed more cautiously, a watchwoman who'd obviously been detailed to stay with the watchful order wizard, a young and obviously uncertain novice watch guard who was more untidy-haired boy than man, and the sword captain the novice had just as obviously been ordered to stay with. The sword captain, who'd glanced back to see what was going on, but returned his stern attention to Mert as swiftly as any lightning bolt ever stabbed anywhere. Citizen, that watch officer snapped at Mert, stay here, he pointed down at the cobbles. Right here, these cobbles. He gave each of the three girls a glare and added a frown for Rava in response to her impishly smiling display of her uppermost charms and added curtly, You too, all of you. Then the sword captain spun around and ordered the novice, You stay here with them. Blow your horn if there's any trouble. And then he turned on his heel and was gone, pounding down the street to join his fellows, who'd rushed the house with the thieves on the roof and were now pounding on the front door and bellowing that they were the watch. Aww, Rava called mockingly after the man. Oo wouldn't want to miss out on the fun of banging and shouting now, would oo? A moment later, they were startled by an unexpected sound. The novice watch guard was helplessly sniggering. Chapter 16 Death Lists Grow So Swiftly Dated What's that, Lord? A list? Those to be eliminated? Unwise it is to write down so clearly what is so damning evidence against us. And besides... I recall a besetting flaw. Death lists grow so swiftly dated. Ulgund the Slayer in Act One, Scene One of the play A Dozen Daggers for the Duke by Selvar Brolrath, playwright of Memnon, first performed in the Year of the Prince. From the start, Tashin had harbored a bad feeling about this, make that a worse-than-usual bad feeling. Of all the masked lords, Kalira Arhand lived closest to the palace, so they'd have to manage this quickly to get it done at all, and her husband was more than likely home. Tashin wasn't clear on where they'd take Kalira's daughter Nelvala right after they snatched her. The Deep wasn't a city whose streets were unpatrolled at night or deserted. They would be seen, and quite likely stopped, even if they didn't see a watch patrol and the gods would have to line up to do battle for them for no watch patrol to happen by. Increasingly, she was certain Antler wanted her killed or caught. But why? How did that help his cause? He'd never sounded like someone who hated her. Oh, well, enough dark speculation. She was a little too busy right now trying to get herself killed. Stringing lines from the chimneys of an adjacent house, she and Drake had leaped to the roof of the Arhand Tall House, but the thuds of their boots grounding on its shakes had been heard in the house below. Couldn't be helped, so speed would have to carry the day. Before the watch had shouted and come running to pound on the doors of the house down below trying to rouse the household, Drake had gone over the roof edge on his line to drop down beside an upper window and gain a way in only to find himself peering at an angry man, Kalira's husband Joran, for all the coins in Waterdeep, standing in the room inside, glaring out into the night with fists clenched, rather than a frightened daughter. 
So Drake had come right back up the line and told Tashin curtly that they were getting out of here, and swung his line around the Arand chimney so he could use it to return to the roof they'd come here from. Not that the watch guards below were obligingly blind or deaf, so they were now pounding on the doors of that tall house, too. Drake peered down, then looked back at her and snapped, This way. Tashin obeyed without the slightest irritation at being ordered about. She knew she shouldn't, but she trusted this man, and his neck was under the same sword just now. In the end, they had to leap five rooftops in succession to get themselves low enough to risk dropping to the ground, via the roof of a delivery wagon, parked for the night hard by the wall of their current perch. It was spongy rotten in places, and when they slammed down onto it, their boots tore through. Yet the cross trusses were sturdy enough that it groaned rather than collapsing under them, and as the fastest watch guards raced around the corner to intercept them, Drake was able to time his leap and pounce on the first, battering the man to the ground and probably breaking his neck in doing so. Tashin was still plunging to the cobbles as her partner bounded to his feet and daggered the second and third watch guards, leap and slash, leap and slash, small cuts across noses and cheeks, but the men reeled and started to stagger. Sometimes poison seemed a godsend. Gasping for breath, Drake looked at her, she nodded a panting acknowledgement, and they ran. Mert peered into the night gloom, hearing the watch guards thunder off in pursuit of the thieves better than he could see them. Five, no six, houses distant now and getting farther fast. With a helpless sigh, he turned to give the novice watch guard a look, to see if he could get away from the young man somehow, only to gape. The young watch guard was down on the cobbles, squirming and silenced, his uniform tunic half over his head and being tied there, his breeches down to his ankles and strapped there with his own belt. The swarming, grinning trio of lasses had already relieved him of truncheon, short sword, dagger, horn, and, Warat was snatching it triumphantly, badge. Trophy time, Rava chuckled, reaching for the man's clout but at that moment a stain erupted across it, and she snatched her hand away in disgust. Drella and Waratra were already looking up at Mert. Come on, they hissed at him between giggles, then rose with the lithe swiftness that was gone for his old knees forever, grabbed his hand, and towed him off down the street. Jalister blinked again at the open lord of Waterdeep. This close up, she evoked awe. The Lady Laryl's hair really was as silver as brightly polished coins, and as alive as a forest of snakes, and when you looked into her eyes, she was beautiful. So this was what it felt like to feel dazed. He and Dunblade had talked with her, and she'd been kind and motherly yet as brisk as Shadowdale's militia commander, and she'd employed them on the spot. She'd opened a panel in the polished wooden wall behind her that he'd never have thought would open to tease open some bags on shelves within and scoop out and hand them both advance pay in gold coins yet and the same enchanted little metal badge that all watch guards wore. Hold this, Laryl had commanded, and stand still as I draw blood. And out of the moving forest of her hair had come a tiny sharp dagger wielded by her tresses to prick their fingers. Touch the badge with your blood, Laryl had told them, and he and Dunblade had done so, staring down at it. A cast metal shield bearing the arms of Waterdeep that was of one piece with a sword and truncheon crossed behind the shield and projecting at angles out from around its edges. Laryl had touched the badges, too, with a sort of baton, and that contact had brought a weird, thrilling tingling that washed down Jalister's arm and through him, making the back of his throat tickle. She'd murmured something under her breath that sounded like flowing liquid, almost elvish, then ordered quietly, State your full names aloud and solemnly. After they'd done so, she'd withdrawn the baton and taken the tingling with it, then stepped back and said, Jalister? Touch Dunblade's badge. 
When he'd cautiously done that, the badge had imparted a weaker tingling shock to his finger as it had announced Farrell's name in a thinner echo of Dunblade's own voice. His badge did the same when Laryl waved at Dunblade to touch it. Welcome to the watch, gentle sayers, Laryl had told them then, and to your first mission, which I very much hope won't also be your last. Velvet-tongued diplomacy, to be sure, Lair, an amused Elminster had said, but the open lord had given him a look and replied sharply, They deserve honesty, L. She'd already told the two former Steel Shadows that their task was to help uncover who was murdering lords of Waterdeep, and if those killers were working for someone, who? I'll be there to help ye when I can, Elminster offered, but I must warn ye that such times may not amount to much. He broke off abruptly to roar in quite different tones. It was the voice of Morden Canaan babbling nonsense at the top of his lungs. In full spate, El reeled, grimaced at them, was gone, leaving behind only empty air. Archmages lead interesting lives, as you can see. Laryl told her two newest watchguards as she turned back to her papers on the great table, plucked forth two identical sheets, and proffered them. Jallister found himself looking at a handwritten list of names, in two groups, thirteen, then a space, and below that, seven more. The current lords and the new ones, he guessed aloud. Lady Silverhand nodded. The seven new ones haven't yet even been informed of their elevation, Officially, at least. By tradition, I'm supposed to send a guard from the watch with an envoy to them and invite them to the palace. They can refuse their lordship, so no one is told the reason for the invitation until they're within these walls, though very few water Davians are dullards. So their targets only to someone who was at the meeting at which they were voted in, Jallister interrupted. Jallister interpreted. The open lord nodded. The Elder Thirteen stand in most risk. Thirteen, Jallister echoed, letting his dismay show. How can two of us cover thirteen, even if we want to split up, which I certainly don't? Laryl nodded again. I don't want that either. Going alone when you can have a trusted armed companion to watch your back is seldom a wise or sane tactic. So, Dunblade asked. Moving as one, we must watch over thirteen. Laryl smiled sadly. Do nothing for a night or two, and I'll not be surprised if that thirteen has been pruned down somewhat. Someone certainly seems in a great hurry. It was the custom of many hidden lords of Waterdeep to keep a mask helm concealed at their homes and use another that was stored in the palace when meeting there so they need not walk the streets in regalia that told every eye that here walked a lord of the city. Tonight, neither Lord Brathen Cassander nor Belganter Halehand, as they strode homewards north up the street of silks, looked like anything more than citizens. Very wealthy citizens, that is, who could afford sizable bodyguards and saw the need for such. Cassander's face wore its usual slight smile, and his thoughts were his own, but if the truth were to be told, he was very much looking forward to his own chair by the fire in his favorite room behind his own black and gleaming front door, which greeted all water deep on West Front Sea Watch Street, seven doors down from Diamond Street in Seaward. A mansion he intended to keep even after he was installed at the palace, or would it be best to always have a dupe on the open lord's throne and rule from behind it? He'd always thought so, but... Cassander! It was Halehand flanking him as they strolled up the street, each surrounded by his own ring of gleaming armored bodyguards. After that hail, the metalmonger lord veered Cassander's way, which brought the two lines of bodyguards together. They'd already been warily eyeing each other, and now Cassander's men reached for weapons and drew together to block Halehand's advance. Give way, he ordered quietly, and let Sir Halehand reach me. They parted as smoothly as his strict training had made him expect they would, and in a trice he and the red-faced mountain of a man were face to face. Yes, Belganter, 
he said affably, despite the worried frown he could see on Halehan's face. Noticed you chatting with some of the palace servants, the former swordsmith rumbled, and hoped I'd have a chance to talk to you on our way home. I'm beginning to have my suspicions about these killings. Oh, what sort of suspicions? Well, er, uh, look here, Brayton. Halinghorse and Tolver were your creditors, and Gwalt and Melanker your chief rivals in the local trade in chains and wire. You haven't hired anyone to settle scores, have you? Because I'd hate to think... Cassander clasped the metalmonger lord's hand and shook it heartily, keeping firm hold as the ring he'd just turned on his finger and unhooded jabbed Hale Hand deeply with its poisoned fang, not that anyone could see it through their joined hands. I hate it when you think too, Belganter, he murmured, still shaking hands with enthusiasm. It makes for such unpleasant complications, truly it does, and... Belganter Halehand acquired a look of staring disbelief, stumbled, stiffened, and then pitched forward onto his face on the cobbles. He was a mountain of a man, and went down with a crash that seemed to shake the street. Oh, dear, Cassander exclaimed in loud distress, his deep voice booming. Call the watch! Heart stop! I just knew his heart would give out one of these days! Such a big man carrying so much weight around. Call the watch! His bodyguards took up that cry, and some of Halehand's men caught sight of a distant patrol and started running toward it. Cassander's own men pulled him away from the body and ringed their employer with drawn swords, facing out in all directions as if expecting the streets of silks to erupt in menacing assailants. As Braith and Cassander shook his head and said sadly, such a loss. He was a good man. Pity Waterdeep doesn't hold more like him. Truly a pity. Just how, Tasheen wasted breath she really couldn't spare to ask aloud, are we going to shake these watch guards? Drake made no reply. He just kept running, and she put her head down and devoted herself to sprinting after him. Watch horns were blowing behind them, and watch guards were still shouting and pelting down street after alley no matter how many times Drake changed direction. He did that again right now, ducking through a door so abruptly that Tasheen almost missed seeing which one, in this dark alley of open doors with the hubbub of drinkers chattering and laughing and singing spilling out of each one. After him she went, past a snatch of hearthlight and swinging lamps and loud merriment, and down a lightless narrow wooden stair with a rough tree trunk for a railing, into unlit depths where Tasheen fetched up against Drake's braced arm so suddenly she had all the wind driven out of her, and reeled, feeling sick and weak. Steady, Drake murmured, taking her by the shoulders. Just refrain from falling down the shaft and come this way. He dragged her in the dark as she struggled to breathe and bumped her bodily down three worn stone steps into damper, more aromatic stone surroundings. They were in a cellar somewhere, and Drake planted her against a rough wall with one hand while he felt for something with the other. Tasheen slid down that wall despite his firm hand, but before she could sit on her haunches, he plucked her upright again and whirled her around and through whatever door he'd opened— onto a stone ramp sloping downwards in pitch darkness. His hands went around her waist now, slowing her stumbles as he guided her down the ramp. She panted and gasped and threw her head back against his shoulder to gulp in more air, trying to get her breath back to normal. By the time she managed it, they were on a level floor again. Smooth stone she could feel rather than see— and Drake had slipped one arm around her waist to keep her in one place while he fumbled with another door. It sounded like an old wooden one this time, with the peg on a chain dropped through a hasp to keep it shut. He swung her right against him to get her through it. The way was very narrow, and Tasheen took the opportunity to whisper in his ear, Where are you taking us? Down shadow, he said tersely and then his hands tightened on her like iron as she flinched and tried to draw back. As he'd obviously known she would, even though she hadn't much hope of finding the way back up to the street, 
even if she'd wanted to fall into the angry arms of the watch. Darleth, she protested, her whisper going fierce. The plague is overblown, he said firmly. Our visit will be brief, just long enough for us to reach a safe way back up, I know. Tashin sighed. I'm in your hands. He chuckled and kissed her ear. I know. Tashin tried to slap him, but he moved, and it turned into more of a punch. None of that, he warned. Makes too much noise. Slow now. Let your eyes adjust. He took her hand as if they were children exploring a darkened house and led her cautiously forward. Down yet another ramp into cool stone surroundings, Tashin slowly realized she could just see. Down shadow. Drake confirmed, putting his lips right to her ear to breathe that word. Stone rooms ahead, one giving into another through high archways. She could see that much, because some of the ceilings were glowing very dimly. There was no sign of any of the glowing globes down shadow was supposed to be lit by, but perhaps they'd been taken away for use in the city above. The ceiling glows looked like failing enchantments to her, Drake was stalking, moving as stealthily as if they were invading a house he knew people were awake in. Something moved ahead, swift, furtive, down low by the floor. A rat. The loudest thing Tashin could hear was her own breathing. Drake was being very quiet. Something moved close to her on the wall. It was... A spider larger than one of her hands, mottled gray-white with long brown legs, stalking down the wall like a hunter, stopping to rear up with two questing legs as if they were eye stalks or could smell. Tashin drew back from it warily. She'd heard tales of leaping arachnids that could spit poison, not just bite. But after a moment, the spider continued down the wall, heading away from her. They moved on as quietly as any thief out to steal. Drake reached an archway on their left, peered into the room beyond, and then entered it, towing Tashin gently with him. Something moved boldly across the floor of a distant room three archways away. Something snake-like and long. Very long. Rats scampered past, hastily taking themselves elsewhere. That distant room the snake had passed through was far more brightly lit than where they were, and by that radiance Tashin could look this way and that around them. There were ceiling collapses in several rooms, and lots of dust and cobwebs. Aside from the scuttling spiders, rats, and that snake, Down Shadow seemed deserted. Drake stopped, looking this way and that through rows of successive archways. Tashin took advantage of his halt to lean close and mutter in his ear, Do you know where you're going? He put a finger to her lips, answered her with a nod, then moved cautiously through one of the archways, turning sharply to the right and walking along a wall of the dark and empty room they'd just entered. At the end of it was an archway giving into a larger and well-lit room. Drake made for it moving more confidently now but still soundlessly. Through the archway, and Drake made a sharp turn to the left this time to pass along the near wall of the room they'd just entered, heading for yet another archway. The far side of the room they were in was pierced by a row of doors that looked like the front of Water Davian row houses crowded together along a southward street. A spider the size of a noble matron's lapdog scuttled across their path, just the other side of the archway they were heading for. Drake watched it expressionlessly, then took two swift steps to the arch, ducked low, Tashin almost fell, he towed her so quickly, and peered warily through it. He seemed reassured by what he saw, or didn't see, and strode almost casually into what had once been a very grand room. Cream-colored panels and moldings adorned the walls, and chandeliers hung at intervals down the long, high-vaulted ceiling for all the world as if this was a seaward noble's mansion. The room was perhaps three times as long as it was wide, and had tall, grand archways at either end flanked by slender stone pillars. Drake turned right this time and quickened his pace as if briskly traversing a safe but empty street of water deep in a hurry to be elsewhere. 
There were narrow arches ahead, in the side walls of this room just before its end wall and that grand pillar-guarded archway. He was still perhaps a dozen strides shy of that grand arch when a spherical thing as large as a small cottage came drifting through it, a sphere with a huge central eye that was hung about by a small forest of eye stalks. Tasheen froze. She'd seen beholders before, in books and the small stuffed one Lord Tather Maslin had hanging in the domed ceiling of his entry hall, and this was a beholder of gigantic size, drifting silently and menacingly toward them. Drake's hand tightened around hers, and it was trembling. He was just as fearful as she was. And then she felt him relax a little. The beholder was dead. And not only dead, it was wired and stitched together out of rotten scraps of what looked like several beholders of slightly different sizes and hues, scraps that drooped lifelessly rather than being animated in undeath. Look, Morden Canaan, yonder one of the Xanathar's warnings, came a voice Tasheen had heard before, through one of those narrow side archways. It was the wizard Elminster. Something of a trophy, ye might say. A moment later, a mighty spell of roiling purple-white smoke roared out of that side arch, enveloping and rending the grotesque dead beholder construct. Chitin plates flew, eye stalks convulsed and fell into tumbling segments, and a darkened husk spun away, trailing smoke. Through that side archway came striding a burly, hollow-eyed man with very bright staring eyes and a dark beard. The wizard Elminster walked at his side. Ah, said Morden Canaan, wisps of smoke from his hurled spell still curling from his fingertips. That feels better, much better. Now, is there anything else around here I can blast? Tasheen fainted. Somehow I knew we'd end up back here, Mert growled as they reached a particularly aromatic stretch of Wharf Street. The girls grinned at him as they headed for their chosen haunt the smiling succubus fest hall, not exactly the pride of Wharf Street, but one of its most popular destinations. Mert tramped after them, old sea boots flopping, only to be dragged aside from its front door when he was in the very shadow of the signboard. What, by Alamea's beguiling touch, not the front door, Waratra hissed. That's for full-purse idiots from the upper wards, this way. There was a niche in the front wall where a downspout descended, and the girls squeezed past that discolored pitch-sealed cylinder of fitted tiles to push on a dark and moldy section of wall behind it. That gave way to reveal an opening just wide enough for someone of Mert's girth to squeeze through. He made that scraping journey and found himself in darkness, with Drella firmly steering him against a wall so Rava could get the door closed behind him. Stand still, Waratra ordered, until you can see. Less falling downstairs that way. Uh, that would be good, Mert agreed gravely. And keep quiet. You hear the best stuff when no one knows you're there. As if that had been a cue, a door grated open, not far away, but no one came through it. The girls froze into statues, so Mert did his best to muffle his breathing by sipping air and letting it out again in polite little amounts as he listened. After what seemed like an eternity, there came a hoarse whisper. Well? Nothing. There's no one. Good. Then hurry. Old Vasty wanted this done quick and quiet, not have his wine brought to his gate in the bright morning light. I have to lug this stiff all the way to the bottom? All the way. This has to look good. We can't just toss him. Things fall down, you know. And make enough noise to deafen the gods, dolt. Dock ward fest halls have house guards and spies, you know. Oh, gods. You didn't know? You idiot. Now get it done, and don't let his boot heels bump on the steps all the way down. All right, all right. Though I don't know why you couldn't just have bashed his brains in down in the cellar and saved me all... Because Lord High and Mighty Darius Quareth wouldn't agree to go down to the cellar with us, that's why. Said he'd heard that one before. 
Said he wasn't born bloody yesterday like you were. Now shut your jaws and get him down there. It's not you as is going to be smearing his brains all over the steps and the railings now, is it? You've got the easy job. A bumping and dragging sound arose, and Mert promptly felt a small but firm hand take hold of his wrist and tug insistently. Cautiously, he took a step in the indicated direction. Drella, he thought it was Drella, kept on towing, and he went with her, and all too soon struck his arm on an unseen door frame, swallowed a curse, and three steps farther heard a floorboard creak under him. He was in a room now, not the stairwell, and Rava was murmuring, Door closed again. We're clear. No other way out of here, Waratra decided, her voice a mere soft ghost of a whisper. We'll just have to wait till they're done. Who are they? Mert dared to ask as quietly as he could. He felt Drella's shrug. It seemed she was pressed up against him. Amateurs, talking free like that where anyone could hear. I need you three to follow them, Mert whispered. And arrange for a little accident or three? Rava's mutter sounded gleeful. No, follow them, mark their faces and how many they are, find out where they live, and don't let them see you. Oh, we're spies good and proper now. A moment later, a door opened noisily in the darkness, and something hard and heavy, the largest sort of docker's crate bar by the heavy clatter it made, was tossed to the floor right beside them. I'll get it later, a man whispered hoarsely. See that you do. A man who dies falling downstairs doesn't have time to hit himself over the head with an iron bar, open a handy door, and throw it into the room behind that door. While he's tumbling past, getting his brains all over everything, mind, even watch dolts will find that suspicious. The door closed again. You know what's going on, old man. Waratra's whisper was quieter than ever, and it was not a question. I think I might, Mert whispered back. Old Vasti is Lord Felherand Ilvaster, lives in North War... Ilvaster Gates, Rava hissed. Fronts on Nindabar Street, but its walls are bounded on the north by Suldown Street, on the south by Nesgaller's Ride, and on the east by Serdun Street. Er, uh, I, Mert blurted out, a little taken aback. Have to know where places are if you want to get back home from them without the watch collaring you, Drella explained with a sigh, as if exasperated at having to make explanations to a simpleton. They're Ilvast stars hired adventurers. Someone else whispered, and they'll be headed to Talver's tipples for his cask, only all-night wine shop in South Ward. It was a low, confident woman's voice. West Front Buckle Street, Rava supplied automatically. Who are you? Waratra snarled into the darkness. I'm sometimes called Laryl, and sometimes called worse. Chapter 17 Little Secrets Kept Too much forbearing mercy is a failing in kings, and so is too long a count of little secrets kept. Durvreth the Doomed in Chapter 7 of the Sorrowful Saga of the Doomed King by Amara Imdeth of Memnon, published in the Year of the Turret. Footsore and Weary Dunblade answered him. And you? Jalister yawned. I never thought I'd hold the gnawing uncertainty of being an unemployed adventurer superior to anything. But it beats the mind-rotting boredom of walking this city for hours and hours and more slarning hours, it doth. Better that than the utterly farooking brain death of standing guard in one cold, wet, or sun-baked spot for even longer, Dunblade pointed out. Give me danger any day. That, Jalister replied, sitting down on the sagging bed and dragging off one boot with a groan, is a preference I'm afraid our new employer will oblige us in, all too often. Hearken to the bold adventurer, Dunblade teased. Jalister searched for a dirty word to reply with, then gave up. Too tired, he muttered, flexing his toes. Gods, but this city is big. 
Not the bit of it we can afford, Dunblade replied, tossing his own boots to the far side of their rented room. It was big enough to hold a stool, a bed, a chamber pot under the bed, and a built-in closet that took up the entire back wall, because there wasn't room for a wardrobe. A window above the bed head was matched by a dented and rust-splotched metal plate mirror on the facing wall, and the rat-gnawed door sported three cloak hooks on its inside surface. At least the door had a lock and a bolt that were sturdy, that worked, and that were both in use now to shut the wider world out. Or rather, that part of the wider world that intended to get at them through their door. There was also a little spy hole in the door covered with a swiveling metal plate on their side which they'd firmly closed. We're pampered travelers, remember, Jallister reminded him mockingly. Their room was one floor beneath the attics of the pampered traveler inn, which meant their window commanded a view of the busy moot of the Street of Bells and Seldith Street, and intersection it seemed all of Castle were delighted in traversing day and night with the utmost of noise. The inn stood on the northeast corner, leaning slightly into the intersection, and Dunblade had already observed that given a few more years of neglect, it would likely slide gracefully southwestward to fill the entire open space where the streets met in a welter of rotten timbers, disintegrating roof tiles, and the desiccated remains of long-forgotten renters. Service on the upper two floors of the traveler was, to put it succinctly, non-existent. Not that the two newest watchguards of Waterdeep had managed a chance to request any yet. They were, as Dunblade had honestly reported, foot-sore and weary after downing a good hearty meal and some czar some doors down from the inn, a repast that had capped a night of trudging around the city checking where every last lord on their list lived. A night that had been largely spent submitting to the suspicious questioning of watch patrol after watch patrol as to their identities, their mission, and the sanity of an open lord of the city sending watch guards out into the streets with lists. Surely that was a task for the useless likes of courtiers. Perhaps so, but even in a small a place as Shadowdale, Younglings soon learned the pitfalls of engaging full tilt in politics and mastered the wordless shrug. The watch of Waterdeep, they were pleased to learn, had added a firmer dismissal. One merely said, Orders, in a heavy voice with an unshed sign of resignation, and left it at that. So, Dunblade said with a yawn as he flung garment after garment at the wall beside the mirror, settling deeper onto the bed with each removal. Which lord do we check on first, and when? Jallister freed his other foot, flexed it with a wince, and let it join its fellow propped halfway up the nearest wall. Farrell, we don't even know the routines of any of them yet. If they have routines, Dunblade pointed out, high and mighty wealthy folks can do as they please, revels and meetings and going on hunts and flying falcons and all of that. Most of them probably don't have jobs that mean stand behind this counter or anvil from dawn to dusk. Jallister sighed. Right, and we're supposed to be doing this with Elminster, who has to know them better than we do, but the gods alone know where he's gotten to. Well, easy now. Lady Laryl did say we could do nothing for a night or two. While lord after lord gets assassinated, I don't think that's quite what she meant, but... And at that moment, they were both startled into frantic grabs for their belt knives as their closet slid open in well-oiled soundlessness, and Elminster strode out of it. Ah, he greeted them. There ye are. Good, good. I trust you're rested and ready for a night of daring do. Jallister gaped at him. What? Gods, no! He indicated his feet halfway up the wall and informed their unexpected visitor. My feet are killing me. Dunblade frowned. How'd you know where to find us? Wizard, Elminster explained merrily. And reach us, Jallister asked pointedly, waving at the open closet. Ye think ye were given this room by accident? Jallister sighed. No, of course we weren't. I should have known. Does it have spy holes, too? 
Elminster shrugged. Probably. It is in Waterdeep. And what, Dunblade asked, is daring do? It sounds naughty. It usually is, Elminster assured him with a grin. Well now, as I can see, ye younglings are weak reeds and not the enduring grim iron lads of my generation. I'll just have to go it alone tonight. Mind ye don't rut all night. I expect ye ready for battle by high sun tomorrow. Rut all night, Jallister repeated indignantly. Old man, not only is there all too little of the night left, what do you take me for? "'Tis not what I take ye for,' El replied. "'Tis what he takes ye for.' He jerked his thumb in the direction of Dunblade, backed into the closet, and slid the door shut. "'I'm not—' Dunblade started to protest, but found himself lacking a wizard to deliver his words to. He looked at Jallister, traded grins, and then rolled off the bed, fetched the stool to beside the bed— and sat on it where he could easily reach to rub Jallister's aching feet. Jallister groaned, but those bleats of pain soon became sighs of pleasure as he relaxed. Thank you, he muttered. Gods, I have feet again. And about that time he became aware that Dunblade was giving him a rather impish smile. Well, how about it? Jallister looked at his friend. How about what? Rutting. Doesn't have to be all night, mind you. Jallister's hurled boots caught Dunblade square in the face, first one and then the other. He fell over backward off the stool, laughing. So the heavy crossbow bolt that thrummed through the open window then and buried itself in the wall with a thud that rocked the room missed him entirely. Tashin became aware that she was lying on her back on cold, damp stone, somewhere that smelled like it was underground, staring up at a stone ceiling that glowed very faintly, the same pearly gray light as the city harbor shrouded in dawn mists. Someone was standing near, Darleth Drake. She caught the gleam of moving steel and turned her head quickly. The room was small. He was standing guard over her weapons drawn, all of his attention on the lone door. She hadn't thought she'd made a sound, but he turned his head sharply, met her gaze, and hastened close to bend down and whisper, Make no noise. We can't stay here. All sorts of armed bully blades and out-and-out -out monsters are creeping about. Where's here? she whispered back. We're still in down shadow. What about the plague? she hissed. The plague of monsters is our pressing peril, he muttered. Can you stand? Of course I can't. You fainted. You don't faint. So of course blew away on the harbor winds, he whispered tersely. We may have to fight and run and fight some more. So be very sure you're ready to move. Darleth, she murmured. Thank you. She reached up a hand, drew him down, and kissed him. He pulled away after a moment and said, Later. What? Save skin now, enjoy skin later, he explained, his attention again bent on what was outside the door. A moment later he suddenly yanked the door open, drove his sword into something beyond it, and then set his teeth and hauled on his blade using it like a handle. That something, slender, jet-black skinned, and with a head of long white hair hanging limply over the blade it was impaled on, and Darleth poisoned his blades, sagged into the room with them, where it promptly crashed onto its face on the floor, dead. Damned drow, he muttered, pushing the door most of the way closed. They get in everywhere, every chapbook's full of them, and scimitars, and their spider queen. Certainly seems so. Tashin agreed, rolling cautiously to a sitting position and then standing. The room didn't sway in the slightest. Darleth watched her check that her weapons were all where they should be, then tugged his sword out of the corpse and wiped it on drow hair. Heard anything about noble houses consorting with drow, or is it all Asmodeus, Asmodeus, and supreme Asmodeus? Just the Lord of Sin, Tashin snapped back at him, nettled. 
When would he start appreciating that nobles weren't all alike? She didn't think commoners were all the same. No drow. Well then, they're either bold enough to be in league with some fine upstanding citizen of Waterdeep who lived down here, Dartleth said grimly, or something is going on in the Underdark to have them venture all the way up here. There's just the one of them, Tasheen objected. Didn't drow traders used to visit Skullport? Used to, Darleth replied, and there's not. Like sudden lightning, he ducked down and lunged through the doorway, very low and hard around to the right, beyond the doorframe, stabbing upward. This time, when he grunted and backed into the room using his sword as a handle again, the drow he was dragging was eye-socket impaled on his blade. Just one of them. Tashin gave him a teasing smile. So where's that safe way back up you promised me? I thought you'd never ask, Darleth grinned. Let's go. And he ducked out of the door, keeping low. He didn't return, so Tashin went after him and found herself in a long, smooth-walled stone passage lined with doors, stretching to unseen dark destinations in both directions. There were dead bodies, some drow, some human, most of them looking rather old and decayed and rat-gnawed, strewn here and there down the hallway, and Drake was beckoning her from a little way down it to her left. She ran to him, and as she reached him, he started running too. Don't get separated from me, whatever happens, he warned. Don't get killed, whatever happens, she replied. You're my way out, remember? The passage gave into a room through a tall archway, and it had many archways and many chambers opening off it, some of them with the same faint glows on their ceilings that the room Drake had taken her hat, and others dark. Water was drip, drip, dripping somewhere, and she could hear a sound she could only describe as a scuttling from the farthest arch yonder. Drake went nowhere near it, instead taking a small doorway-sized arch into another room where there was what looked like a dried-up fountain and an evil smell of decay. It was coming from bodies on the other side of the fountain, but Drake hurried through the room without giving them a glance, his sword and dagger still out. Up ahead, he murmured, we'll have to be very quiet or... He never had a chance to say more, for the next archway took them into a long, odd-angled room lined with doors that had seven or eight drows stalking warily down it. At the sight of Drake, they hissed and ran forward, and Drake ducked away and snarled at Tasheen, Run! So they ran, pelting through a succession of well-lit rooms, the drow coming after them in a dark and graceful flood. Drake looked back from time to time, never slowing to do so, and three rooms later Tasheen couldn't resist looking back too. There were six drow trying to run them down now, slender, curved swords flashing in their hands. Drake calmly said a soft curse, and at the next archway they burst through he turned abruptly to the right. Tasheen nearly overshot the narrow side arch he plunged through. Along a pitch-dark, narrow passage, and then out and on— her strength and wind starting to leave her, legs getting heavier, but they were out into larger, brighter rooms that took a lot of time to cross, and when she looked back now, there were only five drow. Fewer, she panted three rooms later, and Drake nodded and shot a look back and said with some satisfaction, Only three. Three? What was making them vanish? One by one, taken down from behind? Just what was lurking here in down shadow? But they were in a passage now that ended ahead at a closed stone door, and Drake was slowing so as not to crash into it. The door had four large holes in it, arranged in a square, and as they pounded up to it, four long, one-piece metal spears thrust out through those holes and jabbed at them, turning to track them as if the unseen wielders could see them. The drow were closing fast and wearing cruel and confident smiles. All hail the Xanathar, Drake said quickly, and the spears were pulled back and the door swung open. It folded back into a cavity in the wall, concealing whoever had been behind it and their spears. All that Tashin saw as she glanced back when it slammed heavily and metal dagger latches rang down into sockets 
was two of those strange all-metal spears shoving it closed, their wicked points thrust into socket blocks affixed to the inside of the door to do so. As they ran on, Tashin gave Darleth Drake a wary look and silently mouthed the name Xanathar. His only reply was a wide and cheesy grin. Dallister's heart was pounding. He and Dunblade were both on the floor in the corner beside the window, staring from time to time at the crossbow bolt. It was a heavy war quarrel, too big for a handbow to loose, big enough to punch through a man and leave him torn almost in half in the wall. Yet time stretched and stretched, and no more bolts came. Nor anything else, and their tense waiting inevitably relaxed. After a while... Dunblade tossed Jallister his boots and the stockings worn under them. Jallister tugged them on. More time passed, but nothing more happened. Eventually, Jallister crawled around the bed to the closet, slid its door open, crawled inside, and by feel examined it very thoroughly for secret doors or panels, trying to find whatever way Elminster had used to arrive through it so they could use that same way out but he could find nothing. Ceiling, floor, and side, and back walls sounded solid, and nothing seemed to shift. He could find no catches, nothing that had any give to it at all. And, of course, the empty closet, for the two of them didn't own enough to hang or heap much of anything in it, was also devoid of the slightest trace of Elminster. Farooking wizards, he muttered, crawling out and around the bed again, so, Dunblade murmured in his ear, do we go peek out the window and perhaps swallow a bolt or two, or go to the door and chance collecting a pair in the chest? Jallister sighed. Why don't you try searching the closet? Somehow I don't think he used magic to whisk himself here and gone again. There must be a way in and out that I missed. You don't think he used magic? Infamous ancient wizard, bedmate and chosen of the goddess of magic, and you don't think he used magic? I... there was no tingling. There, he'd said it. There was no backing away now. What? Farrell Dunblade raised himself on one elbow so their faces were almost touching and tendered a fierce glare. Explain. Jallister swallowed, sighed, and said... When magic is used close to me, I can feel it. An itch or a tingle, or even a feeling like I'm being burned, that is. Both before Elminster opened the closet and stepped out, and after he went back in and closed the door again, nothing. Dunblade's glare sharpened. Are there any other little secrets you've been keeping from me? No, Jallister replied, but he knew how hot his face felt. He must be blushing as red as a banner. Dunblade gave him a look of withering contempt, rolled away, and started to get up. The crossbow bolt that howled into the room just then laid open his back with a vicious zip and plucked him along on its headlong rush to bury itself in the far wall. He roared in startled pain and fell, his yell joined by Jallister's shout. And then, through the shattered window, there came a larger roar and a burst of light, followed by the unpleasant pattering of many not-so-small wet fragments landing everywhere near. The heat and smoke of the explosion followed, though Jallister barely noticed them in his leap across the room to the groaning, writhing Dunblade. There was a deep furrow across feral shoulder blades, a gash that bled wetness like an awning in a cloudburst and he was beating on the floor with his fists in pain, drumming. Jallister tried to pull the bleeding edges together with his hands, but it was like trying to make the halves of a sliced melon knit together and be whole again. So much blood. So much blood. The closet door banged open again, and suddenly the reek of the explosion was chokingly strong. Or, no, that sharp burnt smell was coming from Elminster. From his spread hands, that wisps of glowing blue smoke were curling rather lazily up from. Sorry, lad, he said gravely. I got them. Feed him this. L reached into the breast of his robes, drew out something, and handed it to Jallister. 
It was a glass vial encased in an ornate frame that he might have appreciated the beauty of at another time. Right now, though, he tore its stopper off, then shoved his beloved over on his back, and when Dunblade bellowed in pain, pounced on his chest like a panther and forced the vial into his open mouth and held it there, clinging on grimly as Farrell blindly tried to tear Jalister off and then cloud him flying, enduring the pummeling of hard fists until their owner suddenly sagged, sighed, and went limp. D -d -d dunblade Jalister shrieked. But his friend was breathing, eyes half-closed and rolling, and... Elminster's weathered old hand descended to engulf Jalister's, the long fingers warm and strong. Easy, lad, he but sleeps for a moment as the healing takes hold. It affects some that way. His eyes will snap open in a moment, and... They did right then, Dunblade staring up at them both, bright-eyed and alert. Gods, that's better, he exclaimed. That pain, all gone. Good, Elminster said heartily. Then so am I. He patted Jalister's shoulder and murmured in his ear, Mind ye kiss him better now. He's healed and at the very surging height of his energy. What? he asked. What are you? Oh. Before he could make a face at the old wizard, the closet doors closed again, leaving Jalister and Dunblade alone together. Jalister looked at his friend and then set about kissing him better. It took all of the keys Tasheen rarely used and the last of her energy, but by using the overgrown old side gate into the Melshimber house grounds, the wine cellar tunnel, and two unlit and disused flights of back stairs, she and Drake made it back to her bedchamber unseen by the staff. Something caught the faint light as she unhooded her bedside glowstone, something on her bed that shouldn't have been there. Tasheen took up the stone and held it close, like a lamp. And then froze at what she saw, Darleth Drake at her shoulder. It was a note, obviously left for her to find. I still await daughters. She and Drake stared at each other, and then with one accord turned and headed back out the door. Elminster looked into the third likely chamber, found it empty, and stepped back into the little back passage with an exasperated sigh. Where are ye, Lair? Well, now I know why you've been so successful with the ladies down the centuries, Laryl replied tartly, leaning out through an apparently solid section of wall that was obviously an illusion to give him a kiss on the cheek. It's that charming, come-hither, winning bedside manner of yours. I am a charmer, he replied in the same mocking vein. Seriously, why the hide-and-seek? I believe in making my would-be slayers work for their blood, she said lightly. You saw my official bedchamber. Dummy in the bed and spelled gossamer threads all over the place like a spider web, hoping to trace anyone who disturbs them. Must drive the maids wolf-howling mad, trying to clean. They're forbidden to enter the room to try. I never use it. Your timing is as impeccable as ever, El. I was just about to lock myself into my reverie room for the night. And which particular broom closet are ye gracing with your behind when ye commune with the weave, hmm? This hidden one here. Laryl drew him in through the illusion into a lightless alcove apparently devoid of doors. Yet when she pushed here and just there with her hands, one entire wall pivoted at its center to allow someone to edge past. She did that, told him, Give me a moment, and disappeared. El nodded calmly to the blank closed wall where she'd gone, and devoted himself to trying to figure out just which rooms of the palace were above and below this little hiding place. One just never knew what it would come in most useful to know. If he'd cared to pry, he would have heard Laryl whispering to her invisible stray sisters to leave her alone with Elminster, a request that made both Dub and Silen a chortle and say, Ho, ho, ho! Laryl tendered a withering sigh and snapped, 
dirty-minded trolls. Ooh, such compliments, Lady Silverhand. Laryl rolled her eyes and pushed open the door to beckon Elminster inside. The moment the door had closed behind him, El asked, So where were ye? Doing a little investigating of my own, she replied. In Dock Ward, El sighed. I'm supposed to either leer now or remind ye of the prudence an open lord should be governed by, but... But indeed, why don't you tell me your news instead? Some adventurers hired by Lord Cassander just tried to kill the two ye hired to watch over the masked lords. Three quite different adventuring bands in the city have been hired over the last two days by a man I strongly suspect is really a magically disguised illithid. Laryl had shown no surprise at El's first sentence, but the second one made her arch one shapely eyebrow. Hired on behalf of different masters, he went on. I know not who yet, but the hints I've managed to glean suggest three different employers— none of whom is Kazander, and all of whom want one murder accomplished. Thine. The open lord gave him a wry smile. If you're trying to frighten me into prudence, El, it's not working. I'm not trying to do anything beyond warn ye that at least three attempts may be made, so if one is defeated, ye shouldn't relax and think the peril past. Expect others. Laryl sighed. Thanks to serving Mistra for centuries, I always do. Elminster nodded. Permit me a boldness? Laryl's smile was unguarded this time. Of course, from you I've come to expect them, too. Compliments, compliments, lass. You'll turn my head, El replied fondly, and reached out to touch the top of her head with the middle finger of his right hand. Closing his eyes in concentration, he slowly drew that fingertip down across her forehead and the length of her nose, then across her lips, down her chin and throat, and on, straight down the center of her body. Laryl rolled her eyes, but brought up her hands and parted her breasts so his fingertip could glide between them. On down it went, so she pulled aside her robe. At her navel... He stopped, put his forefinger beside the middle finger, placed the forefinger of his other hand on the other side of that middle finger, then lifted the middle finger and brought the two forefingers firmly together. After a moment, he drew them apart again, each moving out to her hip bone. From there, he traced down the outsides of her legs, fingertips moving in careful unison, down to her ankle bones and from there around her instep to the insides of her feet, then down her feet to the tips of her big toes. Then he took away his fingers and straightened up with a grunt and a nod. Done. Good, she replied dryly. Done what? Accomplishing this, he said, and Laryl found herself looking at herself, an exact duplicate of herself. In case I must pretend to be ye, he explained, his voice sliding with every word toward the timber and pitch of hers until they seemed to match, so ye can be in two places at once, or I can stand in a spell fray where ye might fall. Laryl gave him a flat, expressionless look. And you don't think I'm capable of fighting my own battles? Far from that, Lair. Far from it. Mistra told me this little dodge might be needful, so I'm preparing for it. She may not be the Mistra who birthed ye seven, but there are still echoes of the old Mistra in the weave, and they send her visions even as she sends visions to us. Mistra has always shown you more than she has us, Laryl said softly. I wonder why. I'm already roughened and ruined. Ye are her daughters. I must be the warrior, the shield, who will do any craven thing needful, so at least one of ye will always survive. Survive to do what? Succeed her, of course. 
Chapter 18 A Luxury Not Worth the Price Even the most absolute and hedonistic of rulers eventually discover, and all too often the hard way, that indulging their every whim, lashing out with neither hesitation nor thought, to say nothing of prudence, is a luxury not worth the price. A Nasker Vornerheld, writing in Chapter 3 of his book, No Truce with Tyrants, Observances of a Master Merchant, published in the Year of the Prince. For more than a century, the northwestern corner of the untidy dock ward moot of Snail Street, Shrimp Alley, and Presper Street had been occupied by an even untidier tavern known as the Bloody Fist. The name referred to the knuckles of the most habitual brawlers among the wagoneers and carters who'd parked their conveyances and camped overnight to drink around night fires on this spot before someone had thought to turn three rotting past further travel wagons into the first version of the tavern. Over those long years the fist had grown, and so had the mold that now furred the walls, ceilings, and all too much of the floors of its damp and darkness-drenched cellars. As was all too common in the less respectable parts of Waterdeep, Cellars of older structures had a tendency to sprawl and intersect with cellars belonging to other buildings, forming ill-lit labyrinths harboring too many secrets for them to be anything close to safe to explore. And even in Dock Ward, home of the law-breaking and imprudent, men wished to keep their heads. Wherefore, when a dark-cloaked figure slipped from room to back room of the fist and then down a certain narrow stair, no one followed her nor did anyone bother a rebel mask and shrouded man bundled up in a horse blanket who shuffled down another stair in another establishment. Both stairs descended into the same cellar room along opposite walls. The female came to a stop when she saw the masked personage arriving and waited. She was rewarded with a nod of greeting and the removal of the mask and blanket. They revealed to her someone she was coming to know well. One Sathul, a thoroughly villainous trader who also happened to be an illithid from the Underdark. His trade was in drugs, ointments, poisons, and their antidotes, and potent mushroom liquors such as Rethret and Glarjewel that had recently become the rage among Waterdeep's nobility and aspiring to nobility. Such was his publicly known employment, at least. Sothul beheld the one human in the world he'd become fond of and had come to trust as far as he trusted anyone, which wasn't much. A dark-haired, dark-eyed, dark-skinned woman who delighted in being mysterious. A masked, purringly sardonic agent of Asmodeus, who called herself Belvara. The surname Bomantle was an obvious fiction, but for all he knew, so was her first name. They had come here to meet with a third conspirator. Their only contact with him would be by means of a small window-like opening in the end wall of their cellar. I'm here, that man said now, the distinctive deep plotting gate voice coming from somewhere in the unlit darkness on the other side of the cellar wall. May we meet in peace, the mind flayer offered through the speaking stone he wore mounted at his throat like a gorget. Peace prevail between us, the agent of Asmodeus added, approaching the little window. I desire neither conflict nor enmity among us, said the unseen, deep-voiced man. Such strife would profit none of us. Indeed, Sathul agreed. So, are we met because you desire fresh assurances? or have matters altered enough that we need to debate some fresh scheme of yours? I need your guidance as to whether or not I should give in to an increasing temptation. Ah, said the Illithid, you are wise to seek it and so keep our alliance strong. I am of like mind, Belvara put in, then turned directly to Sathul. Please do not think this rude or an attempt to discount your abilities or counsel, but I must confess that I have from the first been curious as to your willingness to make common cause with 
two water Davy in humans, when your usual ways are more secretive, making business contacts at advantageous terms to yourself rather than making allies. That is the usual way of my kind, yes, the mind flayer confirmed, and my own preference. Things are becoming too perilous down below, so I decided to experiment with making stronger and better contacts here. He turned to the window. I would hear more of this temptation. It would seem easier to achieve political mastery of the city, the deep voice came out of the darkness, with our current open lord gone from the scene, and the chosen and harpers and sycophants of Mistra she can call on with her. No doubt, Sathul responded, the voice generated by his enchanted stone sounding dry indeed. Yet she does not seem to me to be in any hurry to renounce the title and duties she has so recently taken up and conveniently remove herself from the palace, or, for that matter, the city. I don't see her doing that, no. I was thinking more of her sudden, unforeseen death. Ah, so the temptation you've mentioned is that of assassinating her. Yes. She's a chosen of Mistra, the agent of Asmodeus pointed out. Killing her will bring down the fury of the goddess of magic on us, and that will mean harpers running around slaying as well as spying, and other chosen hurling spells right and left, and we'll likely all be too dead to profit from our alliance all too soon. Perhaps so, if we were meeting here a century ago, came the deep voice from beyond the wall, speaking more swiftly now as if these words had been decided upon before. But I've had more than a few casual conversations with upper priests of many faiths, and not a few powerful mages too this last decade. They are all of the opinion that not only is the returned Mistra far weaker than she was before the spell plague, and less interested in meddling with mortals, but her chosen are but shells and echoes of their former selves, too. They are fallible aging mortals with fewer spells, less resolve, and much less divine support. In short, old dogs who bark and bluff because their bites are far less dangerous than before. The Harpers are their usual meddling selves, yes, but Mistra and her shining minions are now more a temple fiction than truth. I have been paying palace staff and courtiers well to keep me informed of all they see of the new open lord, and she seems a normal woman, and often a weary one at that to all of them. Not a demigod or even any sort of an archwizard, mighty or otherwise. I believe Laryl Silverhand stands alone. And if your belief is wrong, we shall all pay with our lives, Sathul murmured thoughtfully. I am aware of that, the deep voice said dryly. Wherefore my request for your counsel? Then hear mine, Belvara put in firmly. I believe it would be a mistake to assassinate Lady Silverhand at this time. Let us assume your guess, and admit it, it's no more than that, is correct. Laryl Silverhand is a mortal wizard essentially alone in the palace. So you cut her down, your own involvement unseen, and then? It is my belief her slaying would create unhelpful turmoil, precipitate a power struggle that would blunt our attempts to craft a council of masked lords in which we control a comfortable majority of the votes and even give the likes of the Shentarum and Neverember opportunities for power they may not be able to resist attempting to seize. If they do so in haste, not wanting to miss the chance, their efforts are likely to be both clumsy and violent. And clumsy violence leaves lingering effects that could well taint the prize we're all interested in. 
What price a restive feuding water deep? More restive and feuding than now, you mean, Sathul murmured swiftly. Indeed, the agent of Asmodeus agreed. Far better to succeed more slowly behind Silverhand's back and under cover of her respectability, while she still has some, and the cynical citizenry haven't yet settled into the habit of blaming her for everything. Patience can be both a very useful armor and a weapon. I concur, the Illithid agreed. Killings not only engender fear, they remind everyone that a swift murder can be a handy solution. And when there is death after death, increasing boldness follows among those who would otherwise seethe and dare not. For they begin to think, my slaying will be seen as one more among the rest, and can be blamed on those who ended those other lives. And behold, we have our swift string of killings. You disapprove? The deep voice from beyond the wall asked flatly. The illithid shrugged, tentacles starting to curl and lash like the tails of irritated cats. My approval or disapproval would be as inappropriate as it is immaterial. The climate I was describing now exists, and the emboldening is even now taking place. It may yet erupt into nobles taking up old feuds with nobles, guilds skirmishing with guilds or warring internally and other greater unrest. Lady Silverhand's death is unnecessary for us and may usher in strife that harms this city as a trading center for decades, perhaps diminishes it forever. Not all conflagration should be touched off just because the fuel is piled high and waiting, unless we are young and irresponsible vandals. I am a traitor. Irresponsibility is a needless cost I can very rarely afford. Is it not also so for both of you? Yes, Belvara purred. Even in the spreading of sin, irresponsibility is a luxury not worth the price. Yes, the deep voice spoke even more slowly than usual and held clear reluctance. You have convinced me. Laryl lives. The agent of Asmodeus shrugged. Unless any of the half-dozen cabals in this city who want her dead succeed, some of them will likely try to empty the open lord's throne soon. You know this or merely anticipate? The deep voice was sharp. My spies are better than yours, came the calm reply. I have followed their preparations with interest. Two are ready. Three others... She turned and gave Sathul a steady look. Have recently engaged adventurers to try to bring about Silverhand's demise using the same hiring contact. Business, the murmur from the illithid speaking stone was almost whimsical. Merely business. The deep voice from beyond the wall ignored that comment. Ready, yes, and arming up but likely to succeed? Belvera shrugged again. Life is fleeting and fragile, which is why we all gathered here so loaded down with protective magic that their warring powers are making me itch. You can feel magic? I did not know that. The deep voice sounded thoughtful. Almost as well as I can feel and enjoy pain, she purred, which is why Sathul here once had me flogged, yet lives. Nor did I know that. It was the Illithid's turn to shrug. Business, citizens of Waterdeep, merely business. And a miscalculation. It was meant as brief torture to terrify and elicit information. It was some time before I discerned that what I'd learned was false. I did not know until now that I'd failed to instill fear 
or that you'd enjoyed the experience. The agent of Asmodeus smiled. I reveal what I desire to and no more. As you say, it was business. Merely business. As he lurched down a street bright with the early rays of the morning sun, the actor's mask he'd put on started to slip and chafe the bridge of his nose. Mert checked that the iron guard ring was still on his finger one last time and thought back to the last he'd seen of Laryl late the night before. She was changing. Waterdeep was sharpening her, as it did so many. Hone or break, hone or break. It seemed Chosen of Mistra were very much like other mortals after all. Laryl had left them to their investigations, requesting, nay, ordering that Mert handle Ilvastar and find out what he could. Then she departed as quietly as she'd come. What's a lady open lord of Waterdeep doing in the succubus? Drella had asked, amazed. Festal, Waratra had replied brightly, and the three girls had then shared the dirtiest chuckle Mert had ever heard. Later, the three lasses had reported back that the murderous adventurers had gone to Ilvastar Gates and not emerged. They were evidently living there. Wherefore this masked social call that now took him up the front steps of Lord Ilvastar's aging and tall-pillared mansion where he doffed his mask and announced himself as Lord Mert of Waterdeep? Sleepy servants took that name to Lord Ilvastar who was lingering over the last of a decidedly enjoyable morning feast in his many-windowed morning room. The title so intrigued Lord Ilvastar, whose grandfather had made a lot of coin by investing in various schemes run by the infamous Mert, the moneylender, that he abandoned the last scraps of boar fry, got up, and went to see who had the effrontery to call himself after such a colorful water davian of the past. When the seneschal grandly announced, Lord Felheron Dilvestar, the nobleman who swept into his own lofty white-marbled and liveried servant-thronged entry hall ringed by his private bodyguard, the same adventurers who'd been so murderously active in Dock Ward the night before, stood tall and haughty, his person shimmering with the variety of ostentatious protections against hostile magic. Lord Mert of Waterdeep, the seneschal announced to his master, managing to sound both dignified and dubious. Really, Lord Ilvastar sneered. Well met, young Vasty, Mert made jovial reply, causing servants to stiffen all over the room and at least one hastily repressed snigger to erupt. The only Lord Mert I've ever heard of flourishing in this city was Mert the Moneylender, who held sway here in the deep a century ago, the nobleman said coldly. And as you're obviously not quite that old, perhaps you'd do us all the courtesy of informing us as to who you truly are? <laughs> I'm still Mert after all these years. The same Mert the Moneylender your father was close friends with and your grandsire and great-grandsire did business with, too. Oh, come now, man, you strain all credulity. To have known my great-grandsire, you'd have to be at least six score years old. Mert nodded. Magic. Lord Ilvastar's exasperated wave sought to wave away this annoying visitor. I appreciate my morning feast being interrupted by neither liars nor madmen. Which are you? Neither, fell hair. But as I don't want to waste any more of your time or mine, suppose I prove to you that I am who I say I am. If this is a prelude to hurling spells at me in my own home... Mert's snort was impressive. <laughs> if I could do that, why would I have to stand here listening to you sneer at me? Nay, lad, let's be about it. How? Well, to begin with, have you ever laid eyes on me before? No. Ilvastar still sounded scornful. And so far as you know, I've never set foot in this house. Of course not. 
Mert nodded at that and grew a wide smile as he lurched across the tiled floor to a striking bronze finial, a statuette of a lightly clad and curvaceous maiden that adorned the top of the newel post at the bottom of the great stair that ascended one side of the hall. Jabbing an indelicate fingertip into her navel, he held his finger there and used his other hand to turn her metal head around on its shoulders. There was a loud clack, but nothing else seemed to happen. As Lord Ilvaster gaped at him in amazement, Mert lurched back across the hall to its far wall, did something to one of the joints between its stones, and a secret door sighed open beside those stones, letting out a puff of dust. Mert indicated it with the flourish worthy of a well-trained doorjack. Shall you go first or shall I? Frowning, Lord Ilvastar strode forward to join Mert, drawing his belt dagger as he came. You go first, he ordered, and I'll be right behind you. Mert nodded and led the way into the darkness. Where, he added about ten paces later as he started up a steep and narrow stone staircase. There's a trip step here. A what? Trip step. It's lowered rather than raised, then has a higher step after it. Kick your boots forward with each step and only step up when you run your toes into stone. Where there isn't stone but should be. That'll be the trip step. But why? Your great-grandsire had it made, so if he ever had to flee this way, up or down, someone racing after him would come a great dragon snout down tumble and he'd get away, Mert explained. Stay right where you are, the dumbfounded Lord Ilvaster said hastily, and bawled back over his shoulder for a lit night lantern. It was delivered to him by the bodyguards who all came crowding into the passage and followed them. When Lord Ilvastar reached the top of the stair, Mert was waiting and muttered into his ear, You might want to leave your bully blades behind. You'll soon see why. Lord Ilvastar regarded him uncertainly. Mert sighed. You hired them, I. They're here for coin, not love of you. So they love the pay more than you, yes? Well, uh, yes, I suppose so. You'll want to send them away, Mert said flatly. And risk myself alone with you? Mert shrugged. I don't kiss lords on first acquaintance, not even you. Lord Ilvastar flushed, harumphed, then turned and curtly dismissed his bodyguard. They'll come looking when you're not watching them, Mert told him, watching them go whilst giving him many dubious looks. If you're wise, Fellhair, you'll tell them about the bones, but not the gold. The what? By way of reply, Mert strode on, beckoning the nobleman to follow. On this upper level, the passage ran straight and narrow, and Lord Ilvastar frowned as they walked along it, looking up and down it and obviously trying to judge what rooms of his mansion it ran behind. All too soon it came to a dead end, where a decaying human skeleton hung facing them manacled to the wall. Who? Mert shrugged. Long past telling now. All for show, this... This skeleton cost your grandsire six shards, and they had to be shiny new minting, too, as I recall. So this is the bones you spoke of? Aye, so we can start counting now and get you your gold. If, that is, you'll give me an honest answer to a question I've come to put to you. An answer? Aye, just words, and I promise whatever you say won't come back to bite you. Ilvastar blinked, then shrugged. Very well. Last night, Mert muttered, jerking a thumb back down the passage, your bodyguards were seen killing a man by the name of Darask Quareth. Why? And you have my promise that your answer will not be given to the watch or made public. Lord Ilvastar looked distinctly unhappy. If this ever gets out. Fell hair, this is nothing compared to what some of your fellow lords and ladies have been getting up to. Believe me, 
So just tell me, I'll not be sharing it from the rooftops. The nobleman sighed, then blurted out, I'm in debt, heavily in debt, and I'll have to spend a lot more that I don't have before winter. The roof of the eldest part of my home is leaking, badly. Southeastern most, Mert murmured. I... yes, yes, that one. How did you... well, uh, one of the most substantial sums I owe is to Vosker, the investor Landarman Vosker, and he offered to secretly forgive my debt to him entirely and just as discreetly to pay all costs of a new roof and give me sixty thousand dragons worth of gems as an upfront if my trusted hands would silence Quareth forever. Mert nodded. Right then, your words reassure me, actually. So now to your gold. Count with me. Twenty flagstones underfoot away from the skeleton's toes. Back down the passage they went together, and at the twentieth stone Mert turned to the wall on his left, jammed his fingers into a seam between two stones, and left them there as he turned to the other wall, chose another seam, and thrust a finger into it. A column of stone blocks in the wall to his left promptly retreated, pivoting into the wall with a brief grating sound to reveal a dark and narrow opening. When Mert put his shoulder to those blocks, they swung open more easily than many normal doors to reveal a small stone closet whose walls were a series of stone shelves crammed with decaying sacks of gold coins and with coffers of gems, Mert confirmed, opening one and showing Lord Ilvastar a sparkling line of emeralds lying on satin within. This, all this, is yours, I, Mert reassured the astonished nobleman, and judging by what I saw of your roofs as I arrived, you're sorely needing it about now. He clapped the coffer into Ilvastar's hand and said briskly, It's been a pleasure visiting you this morning. I hope you found it the same. Yes, yes, the impressed and grateful lord replied. My thanks for this, Vasti. Enjoy your new roof. Mert clapped the nobleman on the arm, spun around, and set off briskly back down the passage, leaving Ilvastar staring after him. A very short while later, he emerged in the marble-clad entry hall and shouldered through the adventurers and their suspicious looks with the sunny grin and a hearty, Adventures never cease, do they, lads? A few hastily wheezing moments thereafter, he was out in the streets again and hurrying to get out of sight of the front steps of Ilvaster Gates before the expected flood of Vasti's bodyguards came after him. He managed it, too, which hopefully meant they'd have to split up looking for him so he'd only have to face one or two of them at a time and not the whole ravening lot of them. Hoy, you, Mert of Waterdeep! He'd made it three streets away before that breathless hail. Mert turned beside a stern and unbroken stone wall that denied him any handy exit or cover. Ah, but the gods all seemed to share the same vicious sense of humor at times, truly they did, to greet the man calling him. He put a wide smile on his face to do it, a smile that widened still farther when he saw it was one, just one of the adventurers, and the man was panting from his haste. He lurched toward the adventurer, reaching out a hand as if in greeting. Aye, Lord Ilvastar sent you? Yes, the man replied, striding to meet him and holding out his own hand. And he wants you to... His other hand came out from behind his back with a wicked short sword in it that swept up to gut Mert like a... Well, like nothing at all, because Mert hadn't been born yester-eve nor the day before that... And when his other hand came out from behind his back, it was full of sand from his handy belt pouch of blinding. Which promptly went into the man's eyes as Mert sidestepped with the bob and weave that belied his ample bulk, hand going to another pouch and hooked fingers into it with deft haste to cast marbles underfoot. The adventurer trod, slipped, swayed wildly, and Mert caught hold of the man's nearest shoulder and enthusiastically helped the off-balance man to a violent face-first meeting with the wall. Teeth flew, blood spurted, and the man left a dark red trail down the stones as he silently descended them. 
Mert did not stay to watch. The other adventurers would be peering and hastening down adjacent streets, and he suspected he would run out of sand and marbles long before he ran out of Lord Ilvastar's roster of bodyguards. The roasting meat and hot-spiced gravy smells of a hot pie shop met his nose before he'd made it to the end of the block, and he peered up at its sign, grinned at the now handy memory of long ago, and ducked inside. The kitchens were busy, but not so busy that the oldest cook didn't have time to overcharge him egregiously for use of the old secret passage that linked a back closet in the pie shop with a fest hall in the next street. The fest hall hadn't changed much either, though he was momentarily startled to emerge not in the costume cupboard he remembered, but in the same room repurposed into a dressing room. All around Mert were slender ladies clad only in false pointed ears and skin paint. Black skin paint. A dozen or more, some of them making faces at him and pointing at a door they obviously preferred he make use of without delay, and others grinning unconcernedly as they smeared and rubbed every bare inch of themselves, turning themselves into crude likenesses of drow. What's this? he asked, genuinely interested. New tastes in the forbidden? Giving pleasure to worshippers of Ilastre, said a pert-fronted lass who was busily pinning a wig of long white hair to her own short and deep red tresses. We've had dozens in here this last ten day, ever since the dark dancer was seen dancing in the moonlight, barely beyond bowshot of the city walls, up the road to Amphail. My, my, Mert responded, heading for the door. When's the next show? The one you're getting for free now, or did you want to pay for something more personal? Mert chuckled. Not now. Terrible hurry. Would love to. Consider me an admirer. In fact, have this gift. And he tossed the actor's mask to her and plunged out the door and so passed the startled duty proprietress in the front parlor of the establishment and out into the street. Heading not south to the palace, but back in the direction of Ilvastar Gates, which had liveried servants standing on its front steps, but offered Waterdeep no sign of Lord Ilvastar himself or any of his well-armed bodyguards. Good, good because that meant no one would raise a hue or cry or get in his way to hamper his patronage of a certain carriage rental establishment on Immer Street, where Mert offered good coin to be conveyed by closed coach back to the palace. It was accepted eagerly, and in a trice he was lounging on cushions with his feet up, peering through shutters at bodyguards hastening along, peering here, there, and everywhere, for a lurching and wheezing old man Lord Ilvastar wanted silenced. That was the problem with silencing people. It was so effective that it all too easily became a habit. Chapter 19 Having Second Thoughts First thoughts may be bold and swift and carry the day or they may plunge over the precipice of dark disaster. If second thoughts come not too late to sway, they may, if followed, prove the wiser master. Yet second thinking always involves a price to pay. If blade comes seeking, you must run faster. And old and anonymous trail ballad of the Heartlands, first collected in Alzer Theron's chapbook Fireside Songs, published in the Year of the Maidens. You have my deepest thanks, Zarela Raylantaver told the underpriest of Timora, leading her through the halls of the temple, and meant it. But you mentioned escorting me home through the streets as an example of the healing power of the goddess. Isn't this the, uh, back door? If the temple mirrors could be believed, there was no longer a mark on her. The ravages of the fire that had burned her so disfiguringly deeply were entirely gone. And so was the pain, which meant the long hours on her knees before Lady Luck's altar as the priests prayed her to ensure her proper humility and thankfulness had all been worth it. She now wore the simple robes of a Timorian temple novice, with nothing at all underneath, but she was quite willing to endure far more humiliation than that, 
and they had fed her very well and restored her prized enchanted rings to her fingers, the iron guard ring and the one that neutralized poisons. They tingled slightly as they slid on, so she knew they were the real thing and not clever but non-magical duplicates. Yet nothing and no one had ever curbed Zarela's tongue, and she was genuinely surprised. They'd been so eager to escort her home as a public demonstration of the care Timora shows to mortal supplicants, but now... Your coach has come for you, the priest murmured, eyes downcast. My coach? Zarela asked suspiciously, very well aware that she owned no conveyance of any sort. It may belong to the lord of the city who awaits you within it. He says he's here to personally escort you home. Masked, I presume? Of course. The priest sounded slightly shocked that she should think a masked lord of Waterdeep could be anything but masked. This should be interesting, Zarela thought, checking her rings again. The priest led her out through a narrow rear door, two steps outside, other priests flanked an open coach door with a mounting step stool. She gave them all a smile and nod of farewell, and stepped up into the dark interior of the coach. It was furnished with two facing benches of well-padded high back seats. Sitting in the far corner of the one on her left was someone clad in the helmed mask of a hidden lord of Waterdeep, and all the vestments. Sitting just inside the door she'd come through on both benches were two guards, two thugs in expensive leather armor, that is, who both held wicked little dart guns loaded and trained on her. They wore gauntlets that sported unsheathed dagger blades jutting from the middle knuckles of their left hands. Well met, the lord said silkily. Zarela Relentaver, it is my distinct pleasure to make your acquaintance. And it may well be mine, too, once I know who you are, Zarela replied politely, as the door was closed from outside and the coach started to move. Someone who cares very much for the future of our great city, said the man. Zarela was sure it was a male voice even through the magical distortions of the mask helm. It came out very deep and with a plotting measure and has become increasingly concerned about the activities of a certain Tash known to both of us, without any need of her full name. Oh, yes, Zarela replied cautiously. I need her watched, and if necessary, thwarted, perhaps even permanently. This scrutiny would best be done by someone within her confidences. Would you be willing? Without betraying my confidence? Very willing, Zarela said softly. Though I would not be so eager to cease our current activities related to forcible and precipitous changes behind masks. We are in accord on this. I also would not want those current activities to cease, the masked lord told her, or be hampered in any way unless or until the removal of this known-to-both-of-us person or her, uh, capable manservant becomes necessary, and I communicate this necessity to you. And what becomes of me, then? Zarela asked coolly. My death would seem to buy my silence more surely and cheaply than any payment. I've always avoided overly risky investments unless I can see a profitable way out. A blood bond between us, perhaps, enforced by a wizard of your choosing and hiring. I shall compensate you for that hiring price afterward, and the bond shall compel me to speedily make a substantial monetary payment to you, swear not to harm you nor to hire or coerce anyone to do you harm and to also tender you the eventual reward of a hidden lordship of Waterdeep, with promises that you shall be foretold of matters to be voted upon in such timely manner that you should be able to arrange investments so as to enrich yourself greatly and often. You are generous, Zarela said warily. I can afford to be, the masked lord replied. And in time to come, 
You shall be able to afford even more generosity than you can command right now. And if I accept, when do we enter into this blood bond? Tell me the wizard to direct this conveyance to, and it can be right now. Laryl looked up from the ever-growing pile of reports to be signed off on and agreements to be signed. Yes, Lady Silver, the servant began, only to be snatched aside with a startled, Ape! by an all-too-familiar fat and hairy hand. Lass, Mert wheezed, lurching into the room and slamming its door in the servant's face. Derask Quareth was murdered at the behest of masked Lord Landarman Vosker. Laryl frowned. How did you know Vosker was a lord? Mert gave her a sour look. I may be a wheezing old man, Lady Lass, but I'm not yet a dullard. I was under the table, I. I have an ear for voices, even if they bothered to guard their tongues when closeted with you, and they don't. Laryl nodded, a ghost of a smile rising to her lips despite herself. Have my apologies. Then her frown returned. But why? A personal matter? I thought Vosker was a staunch member of Cassandra's little cabal. Perhaps he's having second thoughts, Mert suggested, lurching across the room and back again in search of handy decanters that weren't there to find, and disapproves of Cassandra's stacking the slate of new lords. He couldn't prevent it or stop the vote, but he could eliminate some of the new lords beholden to Cassandra and therefore slow the attempt to dominate all lords voting. Or he could just be getting rid of a personal rival he didn't want sitting in the lords with him, needing to do it in a hurry, or perhaps not be seen to have a hand in it, and knowing Cassander has set spies on all his loyal cabal, he called in a favor owed to him by Lord Ilvastar, and had the nobles' slayers do the deed. Laryl lifted an eyebrow. Ilvastar? Well, he's financially desperate enough. Not anymore, Mert told her. I helped him discover some long-hidden family wealth. A lot? Even by the standards of the spendthrift nobles of this city. Mert lurched to a stop beside Laryl's heaped desk and looked down at her. You sure you're reading this aright? That Cassander heads the cabal? What if Vosker is the leader rather than splitting off on his own? or has been given different orders than Cassander by someone they both serve. Laryl shrugged. Perhaps. I've misread people and intrigues before. Yet, in this case, I don't think so. I believe, Mert growled. I'll go and pay masked Lord Landarm Vosker a friendly and discreet social visit. You'll get yourself dead one of these days paying friendly and discreet social visits, Laryl warned. No doubt. Yet not this time, I think. I'll be asking Elminster if he wants to go with me. Laryl winced. And if he refuses? I'll ask a certain Lady Silverhand instead. Laryl winced again. I'll help you persuade El, if we can find him. He comes and goes as he pleases. Yet he always comes when trouble arrives, I've noticed, Mert pointed out. So if I start a little trouble... Laryl winced a third time, and then sighed and quelled the gesture. She was getting too good at it. Having failed to snatch Lord Kalira Aran's daughter Nailvala, this beyond risky venture was now their lot. Hot and hard work on a rooftop overlooking the Trades Ward Tall House that was the home of Masked Lord Irmira Stravander. Her daughters, Dalarla and Ildath, were presumably inside. The stink of the pitch was strong enough that Tashin couldn't smell anything else, not even the sea air that was blowing gently but steadily past them off the harbor. Them, as in her and Drake, as they pretended to be painting the roof they were on with pitch to seal the leaks in its aging, shrinking shakes. Cracks everywhere. This was why metal plating was smarter and tiles smartest of all. Not that either of them really cared about the quality of this roof, so long as it didn't start to shift and slip underfoot. They were really watching the Stravander house, 
waiting for either of their quarries to depart it, or, gods forfend, dusk to fall this coming evening, or masked Lord Irmira Stravander to go out on business or shopping or for a meal. If she departed, they could break in and seize the daughters, hooding them one at a time and hopefully getting their obedience by saying their mother was a captive who'd be killed if they didn't obey. So they could get the daughters to just walk out of the house with them and into a coach they'd rented that was standing nearby. If not, they'd be knocked out cold, rolled into whatever large rugs or tapestries or bedding could be found to have their true nature hidden and lugged to the conveyance. It was a bold and chancy plan, but Drake thought he was fast and agile enough to take out servants before they could flee or raise a public alarm, and she and Drake really had no choice but to be overly bold in the circumstances. I wonder where Antler's spies are, Tasheen muttered, carefully not raising her head for a look at the rooftops all around. I know there'll be some watching us. Drake shrugged. I mark three likely groups of eyes on us right now. There almost always are watchers in the deep, any time and any place. It's how those that don't like honest work and can't win knife fights earn their coin. Isn't that most of Waterdeep? Drake grinned. You begin to see how widespread the watching is. Peering down the street, he checked his chimney-anchored safety line, rose to his full height, and started walking down the roof toward its edge. So how best to get inside if the Lord doesn't leave, and when? Whatever opinion Drake might have offered never left his lips, for at that moment a higher coach rumbled down the street and came to a stop just below. Drake had started his journey to the lip of the roof at his first sight of the rattling conveyance, so he was in perfect position to see who got in or out. No one out but Irmira Stravander, expensively dressed and alone, got in. The coach jack closed the door on her and rejoined the drover, and the coach rumbled away again. This was their chance. Drake unhurriedly rejoined Tasheen. This is it. Let's get to real work. Excitement rising, she hung her brush on the bucket hooks alongside his. She had already decided that if this all went wrong and she somehow survived to start a new life in some city far from the deep, Roof Sealer was not one of her preferred career options. Faw! How'd you stand it? The new arrival was clutching at his tunic, trying to get it up and over his nose. Ah, the full throat-choking reek of vintage guano. The old man tending the birds shrugged. You get used to it. The dovecoat stank, to be sure, and anyone climbing the seemingly endless spiral stair to reach it naturally tried to draw in a deep breath or six once they'd puffed their way to the top. It was all the same to the bobbing, cooing, occasionally fluttering messenger doves on their perches all around Kazuther. As long as they got their cracked grains and grit— they cared not a whit for stinks or human complaints or much of anything else. Kazuther's visitor was peering out through the wall louvers at the forest of roofs all around. Of course, that was the second thing new arrivals always did after getting their breath. This one, however, did not evince a typical reaction to the dovecote's vista of the deep's roofscape. Instead, he stiffened at something he saw, shook his head, and with the full gruff authority of a long-time veteran of the Carpenters, Roofers, and Plasterers Guild, jerked his thumb in the direction of a man and woman across the forest of roofs who were now hurriedly leaving their half-finished roof ceiling and swarming down a ladder, and growled, At least one worker on a roof has to be a full member of the guild, and I know neither of those two. Non-guild work. Very bad. Very bad. He found himself complaining to empty air. Berthold Kazuther was gone down the spiral stair like a bolt of lightning in a hurry for all his impressive count of years. The guildsman stood bewildered. He never saw the old dovekeeper speak to a certain young man in the building below, nor see that young runner sprint off down the street at a most impressive speed. Moving so wildly and swiftly on his most urgent errand, 
that the Harper badge usually hidden under his over-tunic flashed into view again and again for the few panting moments before he was around a corner and gone. All around the puzzled guildsmen, the doves pecked and cooed and pooped. They couldn't have cared less. Landarman Vosker had certainly done well for himself, white marble with gold trim everywhere in soaring, overblown, pillared luxury that Mert thought overdone even for ostentatious seaward mansions, but to each his own. He didn't have to look at all of these ugly, badly painted, and no doubt entirely fanciful portraits of sea captains and battle masters, and what looked like gilded emperors whose faces all bore a striking resemblance to Vosker's, and were probably intended to represent his illustrious ancestors, who were far more likely to have been starving hard-scrabble homesteaders in various windswept wilderland backwaters of the frozen north than to have ever worn all the gilt and fancy fabrics they were depicted in. Their descendant, sitting in a high-backed, curly-cued, gilded, aspiring to be a throne chair under the portraits inevitably looked smaller and drabber, not to mention far less sanguine and more evasive. Yes, that was it. Landarman Vosker was busy being evasive. Mert was getting very good at rumbling, Well, I suppose you would have to, and... I quite see, I quite see, but Vosker, however convolutedly and unwittingly, was imparting enough to confirm that there was indeed a cabal within the lords, of which Cassander was the brains and gave the orders, whereas Hirler Post made all the public noise. Well, but of course, Mert rumbled reassuringly, I quite see that for the good of all Waterdeep. Uh, pray excuse the interruption, lords. Vosker's chamberlain put in smoothly, gliding to a stop beside Mert's chair and dry-washing his hands a trifle nervously. But I must tell you, Lord Vosker, that you have a visitor who mustn't be kept waiting. Those words were evidently a sort of code, for Vosker blanched and almost shot to his feet, barely remembering to mumble, A moment, be right back before he hurried to accompany the chamberlain back through the concealed panel in the walls that the chamberlain had appeared through. Barely had it closed behind them when there was a grunt that became a fearful cry that ended abruptly in a horrid gurgling, followed by a heavy double thud. Mert sighed, clambered to his feet, lumbered to the wall, drew the knife he was best at throwing, and hauled the panel open to find Lord of Waterdeep Landarman Vosker lying sprawled and dead, his throat slit and blood running out across the passage floor. A passage that was empty of Chamberlain, though Mert could faintly hear the man's distant shout, The Watch! Ho, the Watch! Arrest the fat man! Murder! Murder! My lord is slain! There followed a loud ringing din that sounded very much like someone hammering with a cane or sheathed sword on a shield hung on the wall. The city watch of Waterdeep had been accused of many things down the years, but deafness was seldom one of them. Damn. Mert remembered the way he'd been conducted earlier and a side entrance of Vosker's mansion he'd passed on his way to its grand front entrance before that. Surely if he turned here... Yes, he ducked hastily out that side door and slipped away. There was another side door on this side of the mansion about a dozen paces on, and as Mert looked back, it opened to let Braithen Kazander make his own hasty exit out another door. They exchanged fleeting glances before hurrying off in opposite directions. Not having been born the day before... Mert lurched two to three strides and then hopped into an abrupt sidestep, then ran on and did it again. And on that second sidestep, a tiny dagger flashed past his ear to bounce and tinkle away along the cobbles ahead. Poisoned, of course. Mert never slowed and didn't turn to look back until he was finished crossing the street and gaining the handy cover of someone's scalloped stone portico. By then... Cassander was a distant figure just ducking around a corner into a side street and out of sight. 
Mert did the same thing in the opposite direction, wheezing his hurried way a block over, and then rushed back to the palace. Where knowing the old secret back ways and servants' passages to hurriedly reach Laryl proved useful. He'd almost got his wind back by the time he fetched up in front of her desk. Kazander leads the cabal, he grunted, without salutation. So much Vosker spilled before Kazander cut his throat and put the arm on Vosker's chamberlain to frame me for the slaying. I now stand in urgent need of using you, lass, as my alibi when the watch tries to apprehend me. Laryl demonstrated that she was getting very good at wincing. For tireless investors and captains of coin-grubbing industry, Dunblade commented, these lords spend a very long time lounging around eating. They're making deals, Jallister said gloomily, in between all the bites and swallows. How many bottles is that now? Dunblade shrugged. More than have been gathered together on any table I've ever been eating at. As if on cue, his stomach rumbled again. So did Jallister's, a bare breath later, even though they'd both eaten well before taking up their station here, holding the reins of a horse Elminster had arranged for them to tend, on the pretense that it belonged to one of the well-heeled diners inside the very expensive Castle Ward eatery whose many paned windows they were now oh so casually peering through. Watching over no less than three of the surviving original lords of Waterdeep, who were lingering together over the last goblets of a long and leisurely high sun feast. A sleek and expensive dozen-wheeled street coach rumbled to a stop beside them then, the nearest gleaming door of its long passenger cabin swung open and a familiar white-bearded face looked out. In, now, Elminster commanded. Leave the horse. It'll be just fine by itself. Haste, lads, haste. Jallister and Dunblade quite happily made haste the coach moving the moment the hindmost boot among them left the cobbles. Where are we headed? Dunblade asked with the bright smile of someone who doesn't expect a straight answer but is going to ask for one anyway. To a tall house in Trades Ward where at least two miscreants will be trying right now to kidnap the daughters of Masked Lord Irmira Stravander. Jallister frowned. Fast coach or slow, traffic was heavy ahead. Won't we be too late? To prevent the snatching? I doubt that'll prove necessary. The Harpers and the Stravander servants should prevail unless the kidnappers have reinforcements no one's spotted yet. Nay, you're needed to give chase across the city, perhaps under it, when the miscreants flee. I want them detained, or failing that, wounded and unable to be so bold soon again, or failing that, slain. Alive for questioning is best. While you do what? Skulk in the background watching for whoever will be watching the miscreants, and in the process spying on ye. That's why the coach will drop ye and rumble right on to let me out a street beyond, and why ye shouldn't expect to recognize me after that. Water Davians are far more devious than adventurers, Dunblade observed ruefully. It seemed that not only had Landarman Vosker's chamberlain accused Mert of murdering his master, but one Brathen Kazander had evidently hastened to tell the same watch patrol that he'd seen the very same stout and wheezing Mert fleeing to the palace. Laryl had provided Mert with a decanter, a chair, and an antechamber with a comfortably massive chair to put his feet up and enjoy the contents of the decanter in. Then she'd returned to her documents and perused and signed just one of them before a rather breathless watch patrol commander fetched up before her desk, red-faced and scowling. He seemed the always scowling sort, and his temper had not been improved by the flat failures of all his attempts to browbeat palace servants and staff into searching the vast building from turrets to cellars for him. They had all issued various reminders that they were in fact immune to the authority of the watch while on duty within the palace walls. Lady Open Lord, the glowering sword captain was huffing, I find myself wanting to demand your assistance in this matter. I need you to command your people here in the palace to scour every last room and passage for a murderer, a murderer whom I have good reason to believe is within these walls right now endangering your very person. 
And who, sword captain, is this presumed murderer? A miscreant of stout build who calls himself Mert. I'm told he's been seen in the recent past in your company. He's in my company right now, Laryl informed the watch officer crisply, stepping through an open doorway, taking Mert by the hand, and towing him out where the sword captain and his patrol crowding up behind could all see him and has been since very early this morning, officers, discussing irregularities in the finances and tax payments of Landarm and Vosker that he was investigating for me. If I were you, I'd detain that Chamberlain and question him very closely, with watchful order assistance, about any other guests Vosker may have had in his household today. Such persons should also be questioned no matter how wealthy or powerful or high-ranking they may be. I know where the man Mert has been, so I know lies have been told to you. Given how many masked lords of this city have been slain recently, and I may as well tell you that Vosker is one of them, I am intensely interested in who told these lies. Be that as it may, the sword captain said stiffly, the man Mert will have to accompany us now. I am placing him under arrest. He will not. And you are not, Laryl said flatly, stepping into his path as he advanced past her desk. Or has the watch ceased to report to the open lord of this city, and thereby lost its rightful authority and become no better than uniformed adventurers? I report to my superiors, the sword captain told her sternly, not to you. Oh, Laryl asked calmly, who is the head of the watch? The warden of Waterdeep. And who does the warden report to? The lords of Waterdeep. And am I not the open lord of Waterdeep? You are, but that doesn't mean you can give me orders, the sword captain replied firmly. The lords of Waterdeep collectively command the warden, and he commands us. No individual lord can give us any direct order. Except the open lord, Laryl snapped. The laws have not changed, I know, because I reviewed them when I agreed to sit on this throne, and the laws also say quite clearly, as they have for over a century, that any two lords acting in accord with each other and in each other's company can give a direct order to any watch guard. The warden issued a new standing order to the watch yester-eve, the sword captain said carefully that until further notice we were to obey only his orders and not those of the open lord, and as for two lords acting together, I see only one of you. Ahem, Mert rumbled. You seem to forget, Rarker, that I am a lord of Waterdeep, the senior lord of Waterdeep, may I add. He put a hand on Laryl's elbow. And I can count two. I mark two lords standing together here in accord. So obey us. You are an accused, the sword captain replied, frowning. So, ah, uh, Mert interrupted, wagging a finger. Ah, uh, innocent until proven guilty, hey? Protective custody until trial, sword captain Rareker responded, reaching out to try to grab that wagging finger. Hear my direct order, Mert growled, moving his arm so the watch officer couldn't snare his digit. Go and bring the Warden of Waterdeep here to this office and the presence of the Lady Silverhand right now. Detain him if he delays or refuses. The sword captain stepped back and turned to look at his patrol for guidance a little helplessly. In response, they turned in perfect unison and quick marched out of the room. He had no choice but to follow them. Chapter 20 Welcoming Opportunity Lords, know that welcoming opportunity is what I fill my days with, dawn to dark. Opportunities to slay foes or do them ill. Opportunities to exploit friends or make new ones. Opportunities to rut and gorge and dream. Life is all about welcoming such opportunities. Galt the Reaver, in Act Two, Scene Three of the play Three Thrones Riven, by Alander Thorthcrown, 
Playwright of Zazaspur, first performed in the Year of the Wave. Mert lunged forward like a charging walrus and slammed Laryl's office door behind the seething, reluctantly departing watch officer, then shot its heavy and bright new bolts across to keep it shut. Laryl stared at them. Where did those come from? There was an edge to her voice that made Mert hasten to reply, very politely. Elminster installed them last night after I went and bought them from the headquarters of the Splendid Order. Laryl did not need that guild's full title to understand him. When last night? While you were communing with the Weave? Probably about the same time someone got to Draith with a spell or two to get him to concoct such a ridiculous standing order. Or told him that this was his part to play in some scheme he's already part of. I know not which. Laryl sighed, regained her temper with an effort and asked, And if he is corrupt or merely outraged and comes back here with forty-odd armed and angry watchguards, one bolted door won't hold them back for long. As she said those words, someone tried the bolted door from the other side. They exclaimed in surprise, shook the door, tried its ring handle again, then rapped on it sharply. One bolted door won't have to, Mert replied, ignoring the insistent knocking that followed. Because you're coming with me for the next two bells or so, you won't be found to arrest or defy, and neither will I, until we return. And then? Laryl's voice held that dangerous edge again. And then we'll be accompanied by the Black Staff, a handful of the friendliest lords, that is to say, those I've had a drink or two with since returning to my city and sounded out on their support of your lordship, along with some adventurers I've hired, and three resourceful young dock ward lasses who will delight in tweaking the noses of watch guards. Laryl gave him a hard and direct look. It'll be just like the old days, mayhem and bluster and wild adventure in the streets. Lady, Mert told her, mayhem and bluster and wild adventure in the streets isn't just old days in Waterdeep, it's right now. It always has been. Have you forgotten? Yes, Laryl said softly. Yes, I have. My mind has been on other things. Oh, magic and such? Morning, my Kelvin, she whispered. He is everywhere around me in this city. Fighting back sudden and fierce tears, she whirled away from him and wrenched open a part of the wall he hadn't known was a secret door. It slammed in his face, with her on the far side of it a moment later. Mert drew in a deep breath, let it out again in a wheeze, wrenched the secret door open again, plunged through it after her, and yanked it closed. It boomed shut, a bare instant before another secret door opened in the wall right beside it, and a worried-looking old palace servant hastened into the office through this adjacent way, with Sword Captain Maraker of the Watch right behind him. As I told you, sir, Iskrell Blount said, waving his hand at the bolted door, this door has no bolts, nor even a lock, so it can't have been held shut against you. None of the— he stopped abruptly, gaping in surprise, and stared at the bright new bolts. Obviously, the sword captain said dryly, there are secrets in this palace you aren't privy to. Now, what rooms open off this one? Blount indicated every visible door in succession and rattled off their destinations. As he did so, Raker quickly peered into each one. So where is the Lady Silverhand most likely to have gone? Blount shrugged helplessly. The watch officer took him by the throat of his livery jerkin, shook him, and snarled, Tell me, that's an order. I, I know not, Blount replied. Oh, come, come, don't lie to me. You expect me to believe you're unaware of the Lady's habits and this day's schedule? Blount glared into Mraker's face and snapped, Obviously there are secrets in this palace I'm not privy to. Bah! 
the sort captain spat, letting go of the servant, turning on his heel, and rapping on the wood-paneled walls to try to detect the presence of an open space beyond. Blount turned away before the wry smile within him rose onto his face. There was a secret door behind every last panel of the walls all around. They would all sound the same. Senior palace servants were professionals. By the time the watch officer accidentally discovered how to open the doors in the walls and started flinging them all open to reveal empty darkness beyond in every case, Blount's face was politely and placidly expressionless once more. And no matter how much this sword captain snarled and blustered and throttled him, he intended to keep it that way. The dart gun fired almost before Tasheen saw the servant was holding it, but Drake already had his dagger up and moved like lightning. The streaking dart and his blade met with a sharp sound, and the missile sprang away to rattle along a ceiling and fall. That might have been the only dart gun, but its wielder was far from the only servant. The narrow hallway they were in suddenly seemed full of angry men and women in Stravander livery, filling it from wall to wall, and they didn't just have their anger and feather dusters, they brandished knives and at least one spear. There was no way Tashin and Drake could snatch the daughters through this. It's a trap, Drake snarled. Get back and out. Tashin needed no encouragement. She spun around and fled. Another servant loomed up outside as she burst through the door they'd come in by, back out into the street, but Tashin had practiced throwing knives until one of the walls of her bedchamber had needed replacement from floor to ceiling. And no matter how large and fierce a man may be, when he's sprouting a long-bladed dagger in one eye, he goes down. Tashin charged into him and rode his toppling body to the ground to get him out of the way of Drake's escape route and to get her favorite dagger back. Drake burst out amid a ragged roar of triumph from the Stravander household servants, but he'd killed two and maimed another, and their falling bodies slowed the headlong charge after him. He and Tashin were off down the street before anyone made it out after them. Not that there was no pursuit at all. Long-limbed, grimy, smiling figures darted out of alley mouths after them. Drake peered at a few faces and spat, Harpers, run! Tashin swallowed a curse and devoted that breath and all her energy into a frantic sprint to keep her partner in view. He was blazing along, ducking and dodging around the street traffic, dwindling into the distance as grinning Harper swiftly gained on Tashin, and she felt her lungs starting to burn and her legs getting heavy. Her next dodge around a pull cart left her staggering and fighting for both balance and wind enough to go on. They were going to catch her. They were going to... Adventurers in motley gear but bristling with good weapons suddenly spilled out into the street around her from every side street and alley. Tashin raised her daggers in weary desperation, but they ducked nimbly away from her to let her run past, then closed in behind her to pounce on the oncoming harpers. The clang and squeal of fiercely plied swords ringing off hostile steel arose behind her, and when she saw Drake, in the distance, turn around and look back, she dared to do so, too. Just in time to see the adventurers ringing the harpers and overwhelming them, hacking and stabbing viciously. It seemed Antler or someone didn't want the world to lose Tashin Melshimber quite yet. Or welcomed this opportunity to rid Waterdeep of as many harpers as they could. Or both... The man that darted past their coach was running faster than most they'd seen, but one look at him had Elminster flinging the door wide, heedless of what he might do to the faces of others in the street and bellowing at the coach drover to stop. The horses were still just beginning to slow when a woman ducked around the coach door and kept on running, and El gave her a long, hard look and then spun around to Jallister and Dunblade and snapped, After her! And that man running ahead of her, too! Take them both alive if you can. See where they go if you can't catch them. Out, out, go! Dunblade burst past him and down onto the cobbles in a pratfall and roll first, with Jallister right on his heels. 
They roared in pain as they rolled to their feet, knowing the bruises would come, then took off down the street with a right good will. Finally, foes they could see and hope to meet with steel. The shapely woman with the daggers in both hands they could keep in view through the street traffic, but the man ahead of her was gone, as swift on the cobbles as some galloping horses back in Shadowdale. The woman, though, Dunblade and Jallister put their heads down and devoted themselves to catching her, dodging this bewildered pedestrian, ducking around that dray cart, putting on a burst of speed to dart between loaded handcarts being trundled by guild deliverers. They'd pursued for more than two blocks before they saw it. Plunging down out of the sky, larger than many a tall water Davian mansion, huge bat-like wings spread wide and jaws agape, a fat, rippling-muscled behemoth of a dragon, scarlet with glowing flame where it wasn't crimson, a red worm with yellow-white fire blazing in its throat and eyes plummeting down. With a robed and bearded man riding its head by means of some sort of rein and a saddle, one arm raised in a triumphant fist, a wand in that hand coming alive with sparks that trailed out behind as the mighty death swept down. Jallister shouted in fear and Dunblade was cursing, but all around them now was shrieking as water Davians screamed in utter terror, fleeing wildly in all directions. Windows shattered as suddenly riderless carts crashed into shop fronts. Barrels bounced and rolled, and frantic shoppers slipped and fell, dropped what they were carrying, and struggled up to run on, leaving what they'd dropped strewn on the cobbles unheeded. Keep after them! Elminster commanded, his voice loud and firm and sounding as if his lips were right at Jallister's ear. The startled young adventurer turned to see if El really was beside him, lost his balance in his haste, stumbled and, still peering at empty air where Elminster wasn't, fell over, skidding along the cobbles painfully. Oh, for mistress' sake! Elminster's exasperated voice set out of the empty air just above Jallister's nose. He blinked in astonishment at still beholding nothing, and a moment later blinked at seeing Elminster coming down the street atop the turned-around coach, feet planted wide like some sort of daredevil drover as the expensive conveyance rumbled along, hands spread wide in gestures of spell-casting that looked like some sort of emphatic dismissal, eyes on the sky. Dunblade cursed again this time in an astonished whisper, and Jallister spun around in time to see the source of his amazement. The great dragon, wizard rider and all, was fading to nothingness, even as it rushed down upon them wide-open jaws just about to scoop up everyone on the street, now turning translucent, then less visible than that, about to race right into Jallister and Dunblade in uncanny silence and then was gone, washing over them in a singing tinkle of dying magic. Catch me! Elminster bellowed as the coach swept past and jumped. The force of his fall smashed Feral Dunblade to the ground in a grunting, thudding, and untidy roll of boots slapping cobbles and tumbling limbs. That ended with Dunblade sagging to a stop and groaning in a heap, and Elminster springing to his feet, pirouetting to face back the way he'd come, spreading his fingers to let loose a volley of blue-white streaking bolts, the same magic missiles Jallister had seen so many harpers let loose when training in Shadowdale. This, however, was a bright volley that raced down the street and struck adventurer after adventurer amid the distant fray of harpers and adventurers. Jallister gaped as he saw those bright bolts strike home, and a second volley streaked down the street after them, followed by a third, which was followed by Elminster turning his head and barking at him, Did I say you could stop chasing those two? Get after them! But, but... Jallister couldn't find words, but ran to his partner. Dunblade was trying to get up, but failing, blood all over him and jagged ends of bone protruding from his side and one leg. Elminster rolled his eyes, went to the man struggling on the cobbles, laid hands on his injuries, and the very air seemed to turn bright. All sound went away for a moment, and Jallister felt this flowing in the air as everything seemed to fall downhill toward Pharaoh. Right, Elminster said curtly. 
I did this, so tis on me to weave heal ye. But for the love of Mistra, banishing dragon illusions, fighting private hired armies, healing younglings who sure aren't as hardy as young adventurers were in my day, do I have to do everything myself? Next I'll be moving louts off my lawn, I will. And Feral Dunblade convulsed under him, writhing wildly, then sprang up sobbing, bouncing and leaping on the cobbles as if afire with glee and boundless energy, and cried, I don't hurt. I'm whole. Well, ye won't be in a moment, the Sage of Shadowdale snarled at him, if ye don't get going after those two. Dunblade gaped at the old archmage, and then Jalister sprinted past him, plucked at his sleeve, and dragged him into a run. On down the street, after the fleeing man and woman who were far, far ahead of them now, but caught in the usual knot of traffic choking the high road between its moot with the way of the dragon and its meeting with Waterdeep Way. The ground rose enough between where the two former steel shadows were now and where the woman they were chasing had gotten to, that they could clearly see both her and the still-hastening man she'd fled with, who was now well ahead of her. Jallister looked back at Elminster, seeing Dunblade do the same, but the old man had turned his back on them to hurl more magic missiles down the street. I'm sure there's a law against that, Dunblade commented as they started to run north again side by side. I'm sure there is, Jallister agreed, but I wouldn't want to be the watchful order mage who tried to arrest Elminster or face him down in a spell duel. I wouldn't want to be a mage trying to do that if the entire assembled watchful order tried to do it together, Dunblade agreed. Now, if we can just keep the woman in sight... I am the Black Staff, yes, Vadra said gently. And who are you? Uh, a... Uh, an interested citizen. A citizen interested in the beholder Xanathar and the Black Staff of Waterdeep, whose tongue has slipped at least once in a manner that leads me to believe he met Kelvin Aronson in the flesh at least once, Vadra said calmly, which would make you rather older than you appear. So care to share your name with me, your real name? Volo flushed. Um, no, I'd rather not. Squirming under the weight of her regard, he asked. Promise me you won't do me harm? Does your name often make wizards do you harm? Volo winced. Not often, but for long periods. That is, I get transformed sometimes for decades, a few times longer. I'd rather not again. So the prudent thing to do would be to avoid wizards, not follow them, and pepper them with questions. Vadra hefted the fragment of the black staff and added dryly, And don't tell me you had no idea I was a wizard. This is just a trifle obvious for me to believe that. Yes, Volo admitted unhappily. I knew who you were before I asked. It was a way of getting to talk to you. So are you secretly a mighty mage in disguise, trying to catch me close and unguarded so you can smite me? Or one of those who swoons with arousal in the presence of those who wield powerful art? No, Vola replied. Neither. I... I hoped you'd know whether something I'd heard is true or not. Sayer, everything in life has a price. If someone gives you something for free... They're paying the price for you. So, my price for honestly answering you about whatever it is you've heard is your honest answer to my request for your name. Volo eyed the dusky-skinned woman with the very direct gaze, sighed unhappily, and asked, No chance of that promise? Man, I will not harm you or transform you because of your name. I may do both if you attack me or do something sufficiently heinous, but telling me your name, whatever it is, is safe enough. Right then, Volo said. I'm Volo. And my name is Vadra Safar, the Black Staff replied. After a moment, she asked, The Volo, as in Volothamp Gedarm, author of some notorious guides and sometime transformed guest of Elminster of Shadowdale? And several other mages, yes, Volo answered. 
I've been visited often by Mistra in my dreams these last few years. So, Badra told him dryly, have I. Well? Well what? Aren't you going to ask me about what I know about the truth of this matter you've heard about? You've earned an honest reply. I, uh... I have recently had occasion to move in some rather dubious circles here in Waterdeep, Volo faltered. Vajra looked amused. Go on. And, uh, well, certain persons I've talked with over drinks in dockside taverns, you understand, have had dealings with those who have dealings with or work for the Xanathar. Volo, I am familiar with the circumlocution you're employing right now. The black staff's voice was dry again. And I don't bite, often. Say on. Well, there's a widespread rumor among these, uh, certain persons that many of the hidden lords of Waterdeep do foolish, even reckless things because they're under the thrall of the Xanathar. Blackmailed or magically charmed? Uh, the latter. They say the Xanathar has some goo or other that an agent can carry, that can carry the effective end of its eye ray, the one that charms, anywhere, to stab out of the item and affect the minds of folk. And over the years, it's used this to influence the lords of this city. So sometimes they send their bodyguards away or go walking without them, and right now, even with all the Lord's deaths, they're staying in water deep and not hiding or walling themselves up in fortresses because the Xanathar won't let them. Badra nodded, her face now very sober. I have heard the same rumor more than once these last few years, at first I dismissed it as the Xanathar's way of making more of the populace fear it, but increasingly I'm wondering if it can be true, the Gugaw bit, I mean, that the Xanathar has some lords under its influence is, I believe, very likely. My attempts to do something about that over the last few years are why I now find myself rather isolated. Both the former open lord of the city and the watchful order rebuffed me in rather sharp manners leaving me wondering just how much they may be under the Xanathar's influence, frankly. Oh, was all Volo could think to say. So there's your honest answer, Volo. I don't know, wrapped up in strong suspicions. So tell me now, armed with what I've just told you, what do you intend to do? Me? Yes, you. What does Volothamp Gedarm intend to do? Write a scurrilous broadsheet to inflame the city? No, Volo said hastily. No, I've learned prudence. A little. I still let myself be led by my curiosity, but I don't rush to publish. No, I... I have a little art, and I'd like to get better at wielding it. You do not want to be my apprentice, Vatra said flatly. No, no, I wasn't fishing, Volo said hastily. I... Lying low seems wiser right now. But if I may dare farther by asking, and meaning no disrespect, truly, what are you going to do, Lady Saffer? If a beholder is magically mind-controlling the rulers of the city, and they're getting murdered by the streetful, and the watchful order won't help... Isn't it time for the Lady Mage of Waterdeep to step in and protect the city? It is, Badra said flatly. I've made a few missteps and so am proceeding cautiously, but I am well aware of my duty and will step forward rather forcefully when the time is right. And when will that be? When Elminster of Shadowdale is finished crashing about upsetting schemes and goading conspirators, the Blackstaff said in dry tones which will almost certainly be when I, and if you're wise, you take cover, because something fierce will happen. Something fierce? The open lord of the city will finally lose her temper and go on a spell rampage. Great, Jallister groaned, coming to a halt and trying to catch his breath. Gone into a noble's mansion. Now what? 
We go in after them, of course, Dunblade said calmly. Come on. W wait a minute. Jallister was still winded and could see that the doors at the head of the flight of steps their quarry had so recently run up had opened again, and four large and impressive-looking men in armor had just stepped out to occupy that top step, facing out into the city with hard-eyed hostility. You think we can take them? Dunblade squinted. No, and he started forward. Farrell? Jallister hissed fiercely. Do you want to die? No, and that's why I've no intention of disobeying Elminster, who can kill me slowly in excruciating agony as a frog sizzling on a spit or some such. Those gentle sayers can merely shove swords through me. Jallister groaned again. Let me catch my breath first, at least. The ones we're chasing went in there. They'll still be in there a few moments from now. All right, Dunblade agreed, looking up at the four guards, who looked back rather stonily. So where are we anyway? Jallister asked, still bent over and trying to slow his breathing. North Ward, his partner replied. Northwest corner of Galthoon Street and Golden Serpent Street. Large and impressive mansion. Does it have a name? Dunblade peered. There's something chiseled on that gate pillar. He took a few steps, peered, and read aloud. Tall Towers. Which is the water Davian seat of some important noble family or other? Jallister sighed. Do we really have to go up those steps? Jess, I thought you were an adventurer, his partner said reproachfully. I am an adventurer, not an idiot, and no, they're not the same thing. Come on, Dunblade said kindly, and strode to the ornate iron gates. The four guards waited for them at the head of the steps, putting their hand to sword hilts as the two former steel shadows ascended. The ghosts are expecting no guests today, one of the guards informed them coldly. Be gone. Who? This is the seat of the House of Ghost, one of the oldest and most noble of the noble families in Waterdeep, another of the guards said. They do not associate with rabble. Kindly remove yourselves from these grounds and return to the street. We were ordered to follow two persons after they attempted a crime against the lords of the city, Dunblade replied calmly. And they came here, passing through this very door just before you four came out of it. Your orders are of no interest to us, the third guard said flatly. Leave, undesirables, or face bodily consequences. Bodily consequences, Dunblade repeated as if incredulous. You heard me. Get gone, smart jaws. We are watch guards of Waterdeep, Jallister said flatly. Stand aside or be arrested. The fourth guard snorted. <laughs> arrested? By you? Try it, and we'll deliver what's left of you to Castle Waterdeep. You dare to defy the watch? The first guard took a step forward. Dangerous steps, these, he said pleasantly. So easy to break your neck falling back down them. I say again, Jallister told the man, stand aside. We are pursuing two miscreants, Dunblade began, but the first guard interrupted him flatly. The Gosts do not entertain miscreants. A noble lady and her bodyguard entered this house moments before your arrival. They are the honored guests of Lady Myra Thandra Gost. You are not. Lady... The door behind the four bodyguards swung open again, and a short, ancient, and wrinkled but ramrod-straight woman in a garish, gem-encrusted gown glared out at them and said, Cormoral, why do you bandy words on my doorstep with these armed murderers and ruffians who seek to burst into my home and try to slay me? Sword them! Sword them now! And she leveled a cane whose metal-shod end kindled into a magic glow at Jallister as the four guards drew their blades in smooth unison and started down the steps. Dunblade turned like the wind, snatching at Jallister's arm and spinning him around, too and three frantic moments later they were back out in the street and pelting down it in the direction they'd spent so much time running from to get to North Ward. As they ran, a watchhorn blew behind them. Oh, Stlarn, Jallister sighed. 
Can this day get any better? Well, we got to meet the matriarch of a noble family who probably has nothing whatsoever to do with mere watch guards of the city, Dunblade replied brightly, and we didn't get four swords through us. Yet, Jallister replied as they ran, yet. Chapter 21 A Reach Long and Strong Gentles, let me say it plain. I fear most a reach long and strong, so no miscreant can outrun its owner and leave misdeeds behind. We all have occasions to flee our pasts. Zorind Keldrer in Act One, Scene Four of the play Black Blades and Red Blood by Melra Janeth, playwright of Neverwinter, first performed in the year of the turret. Interesting city, this water deep. Dunblade panted as they ran, house bodyguards of a noble not hesitating to openly defy the watch. Wonder what happens if real trouble ever erupts, like a war between two nobles. Pray to all the gods that we never find out, fair, and keep running, Jallister suggested between gasps for breath. They kept running. It's not as if we're wearing watch uniforms, Dunblade added a block or two later. They probably just didn't believe us. Jallister nodded. Didn't get the chance to show our badges, did we? So what now? Do we tell Elminster, and then watch as he spell blasts the Ghost Mansion skywards? Heh, <laughs> he'll more likely remind that crusty old matriarch of some night they shared together a century back, and she'll chortle, and they'll go off somewhere together. Fair. Thoroughly winded, they slowed, and risked a look back. All they could see, apart from the usual traffic that always crowded the high road, was a watch patrol heading after them. Not running or hurrying, no doubt because the right notes of a watch horn would bring whatever patrol Jallister and Dunblade were trotting toward out to block the road and detain two suspicious running men until the first patrol caught them up. Turn right at the next cross street and stop running, Jallister suggested. Dunblade nodded and make for the palace without bringing down Elminster on our heads or the ghosts? Yes. The two we were chasing are long gone anyway. All they had to do if they really were old lady ghosts friends was say, hi, just passing through, and be right out the other side of her grounds and on. They may have been a block or more along while we were facing those guards on the front step, and we don't even know their names. Jallister adopted the deep, gruff tones of an imaginary watch officer. We're looking for a suspicious man and woman, one of each. Can't tell you anything about them except that they were running. He returned to his own voice and added with a sigh, I can't help but point out that Waterdeep holds a lot of men and women. Elminster knows who they are, I think. I'm not so sure, but if he isn't still standing in the street hurling death at those bully blades who jumped the Harpers, we don't even know where to find him. Dunblade nodded. Which means the palace. We're watch guards now, so we'll report our failure to the Lady Silverhand. Huh. Better her than Elminster. And she can find El whenever she wants to, one chosen to another through the weave. I've a strong suspicion that chosen can only be found that way if they want to be found, Jallister said thoughtfully, as they reached a street moot and turned right. She might not be able to handle Elminster, Dunblade observed but I think Lady Laryl can take care of just about anyone else in this city right now. The slow and patient rhythm of dripping water sent its strange echoes through the dark vaulted places of the sewers, rebounding off distant corners. The Xanathar hung above the center of a placid inky pool, one of the few places where underground waters slowly welled up to join the stinking flows of the city's wastes and wash them seawards. It was in conference, the hissing of undercommon susurrating around the chamber. It spent a great amount of time just talking with underlings, but then that was the fun in all of this dominating and manipulating these humans, using them deftly as tools to bring about its ends and thwart the deeds of others, aside from slaying and devouring what else was life for. The human, cowering as far away from the Xanathar as he could get, was obviously terrified for his own skin. 
But the Xanathar wasn't inclined to lash out at the man. He was only a human, after all, and reversals were part of the cut and thrust of the life the Xanathar had chosen. It was the setbacks that made the victories worth something. We have only now succeeded in getting Vosker's remains away from the watch. We don't think anyone of rank in the watchful order examined him, just a patrol mage, and they hadn't managed to get any priest of power to attend the body, but... You have brought it for me to destroy? We have. It awaits in the next chamber, to be brought in at your command. Bring it now. The human scurried out. The Xanathar sighed inwardly. Many rats were bolder. The human returned with two others bearing a plank litter with a blanket-wrapped bundle on it. They set it down and turned to hurry out, but the beholder said flatly, Take your litter and the blanket. Only fools waste resources. Nodding their heads frantically, the bearers hastened to unwrap the body and remove the gear, almost fleeing headlong when they were done. The third human, the Xanathar was sourly amused to notice, removed himself a fair distance from the carrion. You are upset, it observed aloud. Why? Kazander. Because he turned on his fellow conspirator? Reducing the ranks of the lords by one, working with us, however unwittingly, rather than an opponent? I, uh, yes. This was anticipated. All of the lords are expendable, especially now that the city has an open lord who understands more than ambition and power. The turmoil that accompanies all political change affords us the best opportunities for extending and securing our own power without overt violence and the responses that inevitably brings. Cassander's unreliability comes as no surprise. He, too, is expendable. All humans were expendable. Was that not obvious? Yet these humans, like the one trembling and stinking of fear across the room right now, persisted in believing they were special. They alone would be spared. Perhaps that was how humans had accomplished so much, flourishing and spreading across the world so quickly at the expense of all others. They just didn't know any better. They were down in the deepest secret passages of the palace, the damp stony ways that linked to Undermountain, and by the sounds of his grunting and huffing and stumbling, Mert was winded and footsore. Laryl suspected he was more than a little thankful when she mastered her emotions, came to an abrupt stop in a chamber where water seeping out of the wall filled a tiny carved basin, and turned to face him with her face composed again. I'm all right now, Mert. Meaning you want to be alone and have the wheezing fat man go off and leave you in peace? Mert grunted, palming his glowstone so the darkness flooded in. In the dim light that leaked out around his fingers, she saw him bend and draw something out of his boot. It was a flask, of course. He offered it to her wordlessly. Laryl took a cautious sip of its contents, found her mouth full of the fiery sort of wine she'd expected, made a face as she swallowed it, and handed it back. My thanks, she told him. And I'll be even more thankful if you refrain from gathering your adventurers and friendly lords and the black staff. Though if you want to deploy your three dock warders as spies, that's fine with me. I can fight my own battles. And we can help you, the invisible dove and Silune whispered in her ear so quietly that Mert couldn't have heard them. As you prefer, lass, Mert said gruffly. Only trying to help, not hamper the open lord at being open lord. Then they both stiffened as light flared far back the way they'd come, bobbing lantern light getting closer, and accompanied by the scuff of boots and the occasional twang of scabbard on stone, though the marching men were obviously trying to move quietly as well as quickly. A watch patrol, Mert grunted, catching sight of uniforms. They've seen us. And I, Laryl said grimly, see Sword Captain Raker. Leave him to me. 
Lady Silverhand, the sword captain called, sounding more like an anxious young man than an officious, aggressive watch officer. Open, Lord Silverhand. Laryl and Mert exchanged surprised glances. Raker was hastening to meet them, leaving his patrol behind. M my apologies for my conduct earlier, Lady Silverhand, he blurted out. There was fear in his voice and in his eyes. Accepted, Sword Captain, Laryl said gently. I can tell something has happened. How can I help? The, uh... Raker looked from Laryl to Mert and back again, helplessness on his face. Then it all came out in a rush. The warden is missing from his office. It's a wash in blood, disarranged and with sword-hacked furniture. We fear for his fate, and it's spreading through the watch now. We're passing word from patrol to patrol to seek the warden. Did you see what happened to him? Laryl thought at her two spirit sisters. She received two sighs, and Silone said in her head, No, we didn't think to spy on watch officers. They're always so, well, boring. Laryl's mind reply was rather grim. The diligent work, sisters, so often is. Jalister and Dunblade hastened up to the palace. There were far more watch guards milling about than they expected to see, most of them looking stern and with hands on sword hilts. Uh-oh, Dunblade muttered. Something's happened. Hold hard there, you two. Weapons trying to get into the palace in such haste. Halt! Jalister and Dunblade halted. We need to speak to the open lord. Of course you do, a Rorden said crisply. Hands away from your sides, my lads, while we relieve you of all that cutlery. Dunblade took a step back, clapping hand to hilt. We're with the watch and on special assignment. Prove it, the woman snapped, or it's disarming, manacles, and a holding cell for you. What's happened? Jalister asked, producing his badge. Huck guard, the Rorden snapped over her shoulder, and a grizzled old veteran stepped forward and took Jalister's badge. He peered at it, grunted, Looks good gave Dunblades the same scrutiny and nodded his approval, then looked at the Rorden. Yours, she barked at him and spun around to head for a knot of watchguards forming around a protesting envoy who was dressed for warmer climes. Lads, I'm Watch Sword Hawk Guard, the veteran told Jalister and Dunblade, and I'm afraid reporting to Lady Silverhand will have to wait for a bit. We can't find her for one thing, and for another, all watch guards we can find are being pressed into service on an urgent mission. Find the Warden of Waterdeep, as Zender Draith, or his remains, and find out what happened to him. And we should look where? Dunblade asked. Wherever you think he might be, follow your hunches. We've already got patrol scouring all the likely places, short of dead and floating in the harbor, and we'll be looking there soon enough. And while you're at it, keep your eyes sharp for anyone sending bodyguards or armed bands where they shouldn't. This just might be the first step in some guildmaster or disgruntled noble starting a coup. Or those who've coins enough to hire swords in this city might try to settle some scores by indulging in butchery while we're all upset and hunting our own. Jalister and Dunblade looked at each other, and then with one accord resumed their rush into the palace. Lady Laryl or Lord Mert or Elminster might know best where to seek Draith, should be told that the fleeing pair had gotten away and might be linked to the noble house of Gost, and might even agree to vouch for them against Gost if need be. They never saw Hawkguard behind them arching an eyebrow at their chosen route, then narrowing his eyes in suspicion as he turned and urgently waved some watchguards to his side. Those two young lads would bear watching to see where they went and what they did. The hour was late, and Tashin was beginning to know what it was like to feel old and bone-deep exhausted. There had been a lot of running today, and now this last bit of skulking and climbing to safely reach the disused tower of her family mansion to talk where no servant could overhear them. Yet they'd made it. She and Drake needed no lamp to talk nose-to-nose -nose in the old turret room, so they were in pitch darkness as Tashin said grimly, 
I believe that was a test of sorts. All those blades who'd set upon the harpers didn't all just decide they hated harp music at all the same moment. They were mustered and given orders and held in readiness. To make sure we got away, Drake agreed. So we can try again to carry out the order I was given. Three lady lords, each with daughters. So do we try again for the Stravanders, or our Hond, or... Antler wants at least one captured, Drake muttered. Of Delarla Stravander, Ildath Stravander, Nailvala Arhand, or Lailra Serendragon, he sighed and added, This is increasingly likely to get us killed. I know, Tashin replied grimly, but I see no way out. Even if I renounce my heritage and flee the deep, and this city is my home, the place I love, I fear the reach of the one I'm working for is long and strong. He won't let someone who knows as much as I do of his schemes live. She reached out and embraced her partner, pulling him close, and added fiercely, So let us to bed. We could be dead tomorrow. Plans first, Drake murmured. Then pleasure. Tashin sighed. Then let it be the Stravanders. One captive is as good as two, so that gives us twice the chance of success. And after what happened last time we tried there, there'll be far fewer Harpers still alive to try to thwart us. Drake nodded, knowing she'd feel the gesture as their foreheads were touching, and they set off together through the darkened rooms and passages of Mel Shimber House in search of Tashin's bedchamber. All was dark still and silent as Drake opened its door, and froze reaching back to tap Tashin sharply in warning. She backed away, and he went with her. Tripwires, not yours, he breathed almost soundlessly into her ear. I almost tripped them. He went into the unoccupied bedchamber next door, fetched a bedside oil lamp, and flooded Tashin's bedchamber with light. Zarela Railentaver smiled at them from Tashin's bed. She lay atop its covers at ease, fully clad and evidently entirely healed. Did you miss me? she asked lightly. Tashin didn't have to entirely feign her delight. Drake stepped into the room to deal with the tripwires, set, it seemed, merely to topple Tashin's display suit of armor in warning, so she could rush to the bed and embrace her friend. I'm whole and dragon rampant to go, Zarela informed her happily. So, who's next on our list? On the morrow, Tashin replied. We try for Masked Lord Stravander. Failing her slaying, we kidnap one or both of her daughters so we can lure her into an ambush. Up for it? Very much so, Zarela chuckled. Got anything we can drink to it with? I'm parched. That, Tashin said happily, I can manage. A little fine gray dust eddied behind the Xanathar as it drifted back to hang once more over the center of the pool. Lords, courtiers, watch guards, guild members, they all ended up gone. No priest would be resurrecting them. And those who yet lived would continue to be the fools they'd been born to be, the follies of some augmented by its control over them. Prudent or merely terrified humans would have fled Waterdeep days ago, but none of the hidden lords who'd held their masks when this month had begun would leave the city now for any reason, nor do what prudence might suggest to protect themselves. Thralls of the Xanathar, to this slender extent, without a one of them realizing it. Cattle. All humans were cattle. These two chosen of Mistra now within reach were, however, slightly stronger stuff. So it would be pure pleasure breaking them. Drake had slipped off to visit Lord Mel Shimber's private cellar when Tashin had rung for servants to bring her a late supper with suitable wine and settled Zarela in the bedchamber next door for the night. They'd made merry and drunk deep. After Drake had made certain that the servants had obeyed Tashin's orders and taken themselves out of this entire wing of the mansion and then locked them out, for eavesdroppers could be disastrous. 
The food was long gone now, and even all the wine. It wasn't long before dawn, and a stuffed and no doubt internally gurgling Zarela was finally snoring. Drake slipped back into Tashin's bedchamber, carefully closed the door behind him and locked it, then held up some vials. Tashin recognized her own healing potions and larined and made a sour face. Zarela? Drake nodded. I pilfered them back from her. He carefully set Tashin's usual night trip wires, then drew Tashin's coffer from under her pillow to return the vials to their home. Knowing it was too dark and she was far too yawningly tired and eager for his arms to check them, and perhaps, just perhaps, discover that two of them now contained syrup from the kitchens, their former contents, one healing potion and one vial's worth of larand, now resided in different containers in Drake's boot heels. Gallantly, he removed his boots before coming to bed. Laryl rose from her desk just as two courtiers came into the room with fresh stacks of documents. Expressionlessly, they set them side by side on the space in front of her she'd just cleared and withdrew. Laryl glared at the papers, but did not return to her desk from the door she'd been heading for. Another door swung open, and Mert lurched through it, reeking of boar fry and carrying a tankard of ale as large as his own head. He was yawning, but it turned into a belch as he started to smile a morning greeting to her. Senior Lord of Waterdeep, Laryl said crisply, sit down at that desk and start signing things. Mert gaped at her. A what? You heard me. Make some decisions and forge my name just as you've been forging it these last few days to get all that old wine up from the cellars. Mert blinked at her then slowly started to grin. The old bastard isn't even looking guilty, Silene commented, a moment before Laryl was going to say more or less those same words aloud. You have to feel guilty to look guilty, Dove said dryly. You heard me, Laryl contented herself with snapping. Sit down and start signing. You going adventuring at last? Mert asked hopefully. And then, under the fire of her hot glare, he sat down and started signing. Laryl went out without slamming the door. Being open lord of Waterdeep meant iron self-discipline. Bojentra Summertain, lady master of the order, could be tall, imposing, and strikingly beautiful when she made an effort. Right now, she was sitting behind her desk and looking far more like a stone-faced statue though for all her five enraged guests were concerned, she could have been sitting there stark naked with her long hair spectacularly on fire. It was rare for the first light of morning to fall on the semicircular doorstep of the Tower of the Order and find anyone standing at all on it. It was unwise to bother wizards who were at less than their best, even if they adhered to the rules of the Watchful Order. It was still rarer for Dawn to find five dressed fully awake and furious guildmasters of Waterdeep on those steps. Yet this Dawn had, so now they were venting their rage before the head of the order, the short, long-nosed and heavily bespectacled head of the Jewelers' Guild, Ismer Clavith, the fat, fringe-bearded, normally jovial and always sweating lump in green satin that didn't flatter him, Brenlar Bolt Coven of the Baker's Guild, and the mountainously tall, wide, and deep-voiced man with hands as big as shovels, Talstrin Telfeather, master of the Stable Masters and Farrier's Guild. The other two guild masters simmered in silence behind these louder three. The lady master peered, trying to identify them. Dardreth Malasper of the Guild of Apothecaries and Physicians, and yes, Tesker Malverth of the Guild of Glass Blowers, Glaziers, and Speculum Makers. They were so spittingly angry that they'd all refused to sit down, and each of them was trying to pace in a carpeted space far too insufficient for such angry perambulations, so they kept crashing into each other or backhanding each other's jaws and faces when they flung their arms wide to make a point. 
and the tenor of the loud and colorful points they were making was that they and their guilds, and quite likely all the other right-minded guilds of this fair city, demanded, demanded that the watchful order as a guild police its own. When asked to be more specific, they screeched and swore like sailors and stamped their feet, before finally simmering down to a state sufficiently and seethingly coherent to inform the Lady Master of the Order that she was to stop all member mages from such irresponsible illusions as dragons diving out of the sky, and to identify and thwart any outlander mages who are visiting the city and doing such reckless castings. In the meantime, the watchful order of mages and protectors, so derelict in its duty, should consider itself expected to pay for every last copper coin of the damages suffered by guild members in yesterday's uproar. That comment left the Lady Master staring at her own last straw, so she received the demands of her five fellow guild masters frostily, and they stormed out, slamming the door of her office so fiercely that the room shook, a book fell from a high shelf, and the stuffed pseudo-dragon doorstop shuddered enough to make a casual observer think it had come back to life and awakened from a long slumber. Whereupon Bojentra turned toward the tapestry by her right shoulder and asked worriedly, So which member most likely spun the dragon illusion? Kazmult, do you think? A wand thrust forth and shoved the tapestry aside to reveal the second in command of the order standing behind it, leveled wands in both hands. Imindur Glenmar had been at the ready in case the guildmasters got personally violent with Bojentra. He now looked back at her gravely, wearing his usual expression of neutral, wise inscrutability. Kazmultor, Lavalander, he murmured. They're becoming the most independent of us and are already the most dangerous. Sathul came down the steps into the same moldy darkness-drenched cellar beneath the Bloody Fist Tavern and found Belvara of Asmodeus waiting for him, leaning against a wall with one shapely boot propped up on a moldering barrel. Neither of them made a move to approach the small window at the end of the room, because Cassander should not be on the other side of it right now. You've checked? the Elithid asked through his speaking stone, pointing with his tentacles. A mind flayer's tentacles made it unnecessary for nodding or pointing with the inclined head, Belvara thought. Interesting. Just the latest interesting thing about this Sathul. The two of them were here to meet without Braith and Cassander because they were meeting about him. The Xanathar might be gleefully enjoying all the slaughter and mayhem, but the two of them were having serious second thoughts about Cassander's tactics. I have, she reassured him. No sentience is in the next room. Then please begin. No pleasantries? Belvera teased. Then before the Illithid could respond, said, Laryl yet lives but the turmoil we wanted to avoid is spreading nonetheless. I am personally furious that Cassander has had the Warden of Waterdeep slain, and he capped that by having his pet wizard cast the illusion of yet another raiding dragon, and that has goaded guildmasters into going to the Watchful Order, where they are right now. And? Sathul asked the voice generated by his speaking stone decidedly dry in tone. You think the Order can't help them, or won't even try to answer their concerns? Won't even try, and their visit will in turn goad Cassander's conspirator into doing something to them. And once we have guildmasters being slain readily and in multiples— in the same way the city's lately been losing its hidden lords, thanks again to ambitious Cassander, there will be real trouble. He's left Laryl alive, but is slaying everyone else. Not helpful. Not helpful at all, Sathul agreed thoughtfully. So have you a plan? 
Chapter 22 When the Bodies Start to Fall I heard Kelvin Blackstaff Aronson very clearly when he made reply to the rulers of the Lord's Alliance. He told them, Your people want safety first, then clean water, then food, then garderobe flushing to carry off stink. Then temples and good roads, and only then will they have luxury enough for casual complaining. Listen well, for those who don't are always surprised when the bodies start to fall. Their own usually among the first. From Chapter 6 of the Chapbook, Volo's Guide to Good Rulership, by Volothamp Getarm, first published in the Year of the Haunting. I expected no less, Guildmaster Dardrith Malasper snapped. The Order has always considered themselves superior to the rest of us. Wizards always do, and like brigands, their swaggering arrogance is emboldened by their numbers. What a stone-faced bitch, the Master of the Baker's Guild panted bitterly. She could at least have offered us her sympathies, instead of tossing her head like an annoyed steed and giving us cold words. She's not worth wasting our time on, the mountainous Tellfeather rumbled. But she'll take orders from the open lord. That one's a chosen of Mistra, not a mere from-the-book spell-hurler. She'll lay down the law. But will she? Clavith of the jewelers asked. These wizards stick together against the rest of us, you know. Unless they hate each other, Alasper pointed out, and it stands to reason the Watchful Order don't like having someone who knows and hurls the art better than they do sitting on the open lord's throne. I hope you're right, Bolt Kavan of the Bakers puffed heavily, being as we'll have to count on that. The five guildmasters had been striding along the streets as they talked, heading straight from the headquarters of the Watchful Order to the palace, borne along on the hot tide of their anger. The Open Lord is responsible for the safety of the city, Malasper reminded his fellow guildmasters excitedly. That's what we must harp on. If we just keep demanding, she immediately order the Watchful Order to stop the casting of draconic illusions and by nightfall pass a Lord's decree outlawing such castings... We might get somewhere, Tesker Malverth of the Glassblowers said quietly. And we might not, yet it's very much worth a try. The palace door guards were unused to seeing five guildmasters gathered together demanding entrance at anything other than high ceremonial occasions, and seeing guildmasters walking anywhere more than a few paces it took them to alight from a carriage and reach the palace doors was also unusual. Add to that the obvious fury of the five men now stalking toward them, and they scurried to be fawning and conciliatory in accommodating their visitors' every need, which meant that no less than a dozen courtiers escorted the seething quintet to one of the largest and best-appointed audience chambers to await the open lord, while the most senior courtier on duty hurried to find the Lady Silverhand. No sooner were the furious guildmasters shut into a room to snarl and wave their hands at each other and gloweringly echo their outrage than palace staff hastened through the various doors to bring them an impressive selection of decanters and whatever food was ready and then withdraw to leave them to it. Five stomachs promptly rumbled. The five angry men had arisen early and had rushed about with high energy and higher emotion and now discovered they were both parched and famished, and the guildmasters fell upon the food and drink voraciously. Only to soon reel and slump. A courtier came rushing in to tell them the open lord was on the way, stared at them in horror, and was promptly daggered from behind. Not the same poison as took down these five guild ornaments, the courtier's slayer murmured with a smile into the dying man's horrified and pain-racked face as he lowered the palace official onto a heap composed of two of the guildmasters, a hand clamped over the courtier's mouth to stifle any dying cry. But it will do. Lord Kazander took his hand away only when the man's stare had gone fixed, and his last breath had been some time ago. 
Then he calmly cleaned his dagger on the front of the courtier's livery, resheathed it at his belt, and headed for a certain panel in the wall that he knew very well to be a secret door, as he'd used it to enter the room very shortly before. He was still a step away from the panel, hand outstretched to open it, when it slid open right in front of him. Cassander snatched at his dagger but relaxed when he saw who was stepping out of the darkness of the revealed opening into the audience chamber, the wisely intractable, neatly goateed wizard Iminder Glenmar, second in command of the Watchful Order. Glenmar surveyed the slumped corpses calmly. If word of this spreads, the city could erupt. Better six deaths buried for a time than hundreds and citizens daggering each other in the streets. And with that he cast a spell that set all the bodies afire. Servants are so careless, he commented, as he and Cassander stepped through the panel and closed it behind them. It's a wonder fires don't erupt in the palace more often. The two men took secret passages they knew well, to a certain room from which Glenmar teleported them both away. The magical flames they'd left behind swiftly reduced the dead men to ash and kept on merrily blazing away, licking across the polished floor to climb the walls hungrily. A servant came in apologetically, gaped at the rising flames and fled, slamming the doors as he started to yell. Even at that, the spreading conflagration threatened much of the palace until the duty watchful order mages and then Elminster, arriving from the streets at a breathless run, managed to quell the flames. Of Laryl, the courtiers could find no sign. Well, I've waited in less comfortable vantage points, Zarella commented, shifting a broken chair that had collapsed under her when she'd sat in it in wary experimentation. Chair or no chair— she had to be in this spot, or she wouldn't be able to peer through the pigeon-dung-streaked dormer window at the nearby tall house that was the home of the Stravanders. That's good, Drake replied, because I think we'd best wait until after dark to try anything. Try anything? Tashin asked. Don't you mean storm the place? The three of them were ranged along the leaky end of a trades ward rooming house attic that overlooked the Stravander tall house, deciding where and when to best assault it. The dry end was in use, partitioned off into sleeping closets for the house staff. This end was one long, low, open room, given over to the ravages of damp and heaps of broken furniture that might one day yield up useful parts for repairs, or rot down entirely first. Drake shrugged. Haven't decided what our best anything is yet. Until nightfall, we should watch and try to decide how best to get in, and how many people are inside. So we can storm the place, Zarella interpreted with a grin, with style and verve. Drake gave her a smile but pointed out the nearest window. I'm not so sure that storming in the place will work with just the three of us. A watch patrol can get here very quickly if the alarm is raised, and I'm thinking we'll take casualties. So we'll need a diversion, Tashin put in, that drives those inside out to where we can get at them, like a fire. Zarela gave her a look that had drawn daggers in it, but said merely, Explain. Well, if we throw something flaming through the windows on the other side of the house— we can wait on this side to take down the Lord or capture her daughters when they flee. Drake held up a hand for silence and went from window to window, staring hard at where the Stravander's visible windows and doors were. That should work well, he announced when he was done looking, as he reached down both boots and then up his forearms and produced four folded hand crossbows of Kalashite make. Dart guns, Tashin would have called them. He unfolded and assembled them in a trice, snap, 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 and passed one to each of his fellow conspirators. As we have these. I'm having nothing to do with fire, Zarela snapped. I'll be right here in this attic with this, she waved the dart gun. Drake nodded. I've the best arm. I'll throw the fire starter. He pointed at an eatery three doors down from the Stravander tall house. 
When the time comes, Tashin and I will go down and wait in the alley there. If anyone comes, Tash, start noisily throwing up by their slop barrels and act as if you're drunk, very drunk, until someone flees the house and you can get clear aim. There'll be bodyguards and servants to eliminate. You lose first, Zarela told Tashin, and then I'll take down a target. That way we won't waste two bolts making the same corpse. Tashin nodded and looked to Drake. You have a fire starter hidden somewhere on you too? Part of it. I just need a stone for weight and something flammable to wrap around it. I'll go foraging for both now and get us some food and throat slake while we wait. He looked at her and then at Zarela. Play nice with each other while I'm gone. Both women gave him arch looks, then glanced at each other and chuckled. Sambra Lane in Dock Ward was home to more than one nondescript little hovel. The most expensive of these ramshackle rotting residences commanded a view of the city's south gate. The least expensive were those situated closest to where rotting fish was often piled. Most of them had either attics that let in too much rain and sleet and harbor mists for comfort, or filthy windows boarded over upper rooms. Only one of those upper rooms hid a circle painted on the floor that had been enchanted into a permanent teleportation circle. So it was the one that the wizard Glenmar and the investor and landlord Cassander appeared in now. Stepping out of the circle, Glenmar led the way to a door that was barred shut with the complicated frame of sliding timbers set into the thickness of the wall and manipulated that frame so the door opened to let them out into a room reeking of decay. They passed several rotting human bodies. Warnings in case anyone is bold enough to break in, Glenmar explained calmly, to descend decidedly rickety stairs to street level where the wizard ordered Kazander, You go out that door and I'll leave by this one. Kazander found his door was bolted from within and looked a silent question at Glenmar. The wizard nodded. Worry not, I'll bolt it again behind you. So Kazander shot the old but still stout bolts, opened the door a crack and peered out to make sure the way was clear of passing watch patrols or any curious loiterers, then departed. Out of long, suspicious habit, he then raced around the outside of the building to where he could see the other door. But not only did Glenmar not emerge from it, there was some rotting street refuse strewn along its bottom edge that looked to have been there undisturbed for some time. And although Cassander stayed where he was, watching for quite some time before frowningly walking away, the door remained closed and the street wizardless. Hmm. You just couldn't trust anyone in the deep these days. As a means of perception, the weave was most easily used to see the extent and nature of active art. With practice, a weave wielder could learn to accurately see lurking enchantments and magic items and then life and unlife. It took both power and the familiarity of long usage to gauge sentience and to trace chains and rods and then wires, and then, with the greatest of difficulty, organic webbing like ropes and thin cords. Stone and earth barriers that weren't bedrock were very hard to see. Using the weave like a second pair of eyes took most humans decades of practice, and these were not skills Laryl had devoted over much time to, though all of Mistress Chosen had them. However, traveling with her were two unseen sisters who were now of the weave, who lived its flows and patterns and understandings in every passing moment. So Dove and Silene watched for traps and malevolent lurkers as Laryl walked and kept her from harm. No sane person walks Waterdeep's wet-shod navigable sewers alone, but it had been some centuries since Laryl had laid any claim to being sane. She wore quartets of the most powerful battle wands of the palace's arsenal strapped to her forearms under her sleeves, projecting nigh her wrists, so her curled fingertips could just touch them, and so fire them. Spare wands rode inside her boots, hidden under her breeches. This wasn't something she'd felt the need to do often, 
but the first time she'd employed this little trick was more than seven centuries ago, and she'd become very good at making it look like she was deftly hurling spells, not triggering wands. And the beauty of having her sisters silently assisting her was that where her command of the weave was fumbling and feeble and not something that came as second nature to her, Dove and Silune could use the weave to steer a wand fireball to strike a target in just the right spot, or transform that explosion of flame into an explosive disintegration. They were doing that a lot right now as Laryl ducked around an archway to blast her latest death tyrant. She'd destroyed three so far and was beginning to wonder just how many the Xanathar had enslaved, or compelled to serve it, or whatever its arrangement with them was. Where their disintegration rays destroyed walls and enlarged archways and caused occasional ceiling collapses, rains of stones and dirt and old bricks as cellars above fell into a suddenly enlarged sewer below, her disintegrations burst above and behind them targeting their spectral eye motes and twisted by Silene, who'd mastered many transmutations into utter and savage destroyers of those eyes. A death tyrant without most of its eye rays she could destroy as readily as she'd blasted their handful of servant zombies. Alone, armed with just the wands and without the weave, she knew very well that she'd have been dead moments after sighting the first undead beholder though the weave would have then taken her, leaving only her body as a zombie under that tyrant's control, a control she could have wrestled and broken, Silene had informed her. This fourth death tyrant was larger than those she'd faced before, the main eye of its eerie skull a malevolent white moat wrapped in magenta glows, and as she peered at it and then ducked back around a slick stone curve of tunnel wall, Laryl discovered she was growing weary of hurling destruction. It was good that so many beholders were now gone from the roots of Waterdeep, but... Her fury born of the frustrations of being open lord and her grief at the memories of Kelvin so often thrust under her nose here in the deep was now largely spent. It was time to abandon this futile and deadly attempt to reach the Xanathar and return to the streets above and the palace and her accursed desk with its ever-growing stacks of contracts and treaties and studies and forms. So she sent her next wand blast at the ceiling just above the tyrant, and let Dove and Silene gleefully turn the stone shards it showered the undead thing with into jagged spears and darts of radiant energy that melted through the skull and boiled eye motes into nothingness on contact. And when Laryl's next wand blasts were weave-warped into bursts of radiant flame that rent the skull into a cloud of tumbling shards that fell into dust, she found herself truly alone at last. In a dark chamber that led in one direction to a room filled by a placid inky pool where nothing and no one floated waiting for her. In another to a dusty cave-in where a ceiling had collapsed long ago and in a third to a very freshly mortared wall of fitted stone blocks where an open passage had been, probably earlier this same day. In the deepening silence, Laryl surveyed the ceiling and floor out of long habit, in case spectral eyes might open to menace her or a good old stone block might fall, and said, I'm not trying to destroy you, Xanathar. I just want to talk to you. Almost immediately in the archway that led to the chamber with the pool, something tiny fell from the ceiling to clack on the floor. A stone. Laryl sprang back, fearing a deluge of rock and dirt would follow, a crushing and smothering stonefall, but saw a tiny trap door closing in the dark, mold-mottled stones above. After a long and wary time of waiting, she dared to go and peer at the stone. From afar, with Dove and Silone spinning the weave around her into a sort of armored tunnel that moved with her. Cautiously, Laryl reached out with the weave herself, questing toward the stone to probe it for enchantments. When that invisible finger of power reached the fallen stone, a nondescript, rather jagged piece of rock that would fit comfortably into her palm, 
Some magic awoke around it, stirring up into a phlegmy, unpleasantly liquid voice that said calmly, Yet I am not here, open lord, just as you are so evidently not what you once were. We shall talk soon enough. For now, you have more than enough to occupy you in the city above. When you have time to fear, I'll be here, waiting. The atmosphere in the room was beyond tense. Lord Erland Hustim sat in his favorite chair and put on his best smile, but the guests gathered here were his fiercest rivals. It was the same room in Hustim House where he'd met with Lord Orand Garaland earlier, and Garaland was here again. So were three proud lords to whom the name Hustim was a hissing and an abomination. But these were extraordinary times, and they'd been invited in light of the refusal of the hidden lords to elect any of the guildmasters proposed by Hustim, and they had come. Lord Halmor Asumbar, truculent and burly, his beard a flowing, styled, and scented reddish-brown jaw fringe. Lord Harl Britter Cathant, clean-shaven and long-jawed and sharp-nosed, his features twisted in their customary sour disapproval. Lord Eskinel Dermanthar, sleekly fat and darkly handsome despite his advanced years, like a greedy and overfed old cat well pleased with its life of lounging on cushions. All of them now on the edge of bristling, all of them working at stiffly overcoming their differences. It seems, Lord Esumbar was saying grudgingly, our city needs us. And if having a title and pride in our lineage means anything at all, it means standing up for something. I'm prepared to do that, if I hear any sense. So talk, Hustim. You called us here, so tell us what you'd have us do, and may all the gods smile upon the deep and grant that we do the right thing. As always, when the city needs real leadership, Lord Cathant sniffed, we must stride into the breach. The open lord is an ineffectual figurehead no matter who warms the throne. The hidden lords are their own little self-serving private club, filling their purses at public expense and caring nothing for the longer view and the greater good of the city. And the guildmasters are even more selfish, continually pushing to rob honest citizens blind and restrict what others can do to enough. A steam bellowed, the sudden volume of his roar enough to bring startled silence. Your every word may be right and true, Lord Cathant, but if we are to lead and turn the helm so this city sails not deeper into storm and strife, but to a brighter horizon, we have to stop treating the guilds as criminals. We must see them as equals with their own rightful part to play. Or how dare we demand they accord us the same courtesy, the same necessary courtesy. Necessary because we need them, lords. They earn the coins we lack. And admit it, the days when you or I or any of us could buy entire streets of the city on a whim are gone, long gone, never to return. The guilds and the high houses must be partners. We must work together. We may not agree on much. We may not like each other. But if we cannot work together, this city is doomed and deserves to be. A little silence followed his words until old Lord Manthar stirred himself and said a little huskily, Now that was a speech I've waited years, decades to hear. Hustim, command me. That is a vision I can get behind. I, I too, Lord Esumbar said reluctantly. But Hustim, when came you to these views? There was a time when you loudly wanted the guilds broken up and outlawed, and the rights of citizens stripped down, and it was not so long ago. I saw those views as right quite recently. Hustim admitted, the very same night as hope caught fire within me that they could be more than just opinions and loud words. 
The night I saw Laryl Silverhand dining in the Flying Lion before they named her to the lordship, and plied her with good wine and tried to get her to side with the high houses. She said to me then what I've just said to you, soft-voiced but with fire in her eye. Lords, a woman sits in the palace who wants to do just what I do, so at last we have a chance, our best chance. Not with the hidden lords saying nay we don't, Lord Cathant observed sourly. Oh, Lord Asumbar roused himself, his words coming out swift and excited, all trace of hauteur gone. So many of them have been murdered, there soon won't be any left to vote against the open lord. How many are there left right now? Less than a dozen, and there may be fewer by tomorrow. Cathant leaned forward, his eyes narrowing. Is she having them killed, do you think? She arrives in the palace, and they start to fall like flies in a frost. Suspicious, damnably suspicious. Lord Grawland waved a dismissive hand. Or someone else saw her installation as their opportunity, having an open lord who, unlike Neverember, unless I've judged him wrong, won't react to a murderous threat by turning tyrant and hurling the watch into scouring out the guilty like hounds and slaughtering them without hesitation. I saw no signs of her arriving with her own private army, or pet band of slayers for hire. The Lady Mage of Waterdeep may be many things, but nothing in our histories suggests she did daggers behind closed doors. When she had a dispute, it unfolded before the eyes of the populace. No, Cathant, this doesn't feel like her way. Manthar nodded and turned to their host. So, Hastim, what would you have us do? Start meeting with guildmasters, working with them, investing in their projects, reaching out to them instead of our customary sneering at them and seeking to pay one off against another. My lords, it's time for us to grow up. Cathant reddened in anger, drawing breath and filling out his chest for an explosion of rage but he was forestalled by a curious, dry, choking sound from behind him. He turned to peer, like everyone else, at its source. Behind Lord Manthar, Lady Hustim had stepped out from behind a tapestry and was now doubled over in a helpless flood of flammy chuckles. <laughs> she sobbed out when she could find breath enough to think that I should live to hear this. Lords of Waterteef, realizing it's time for them to behave like adults. Past time, I should say. Bravo, my lords. Bravo! And just how long, Lord Cathant inquired icily, have you been eavesdropping? She drew herself up and met his gaze fearlessly. All my life, Lord, all my long and boredom and frustration-filled life. And out from the tapestries behind her came a woman with a sharp challenge in her eyes, a woman Lord Cathant knew all too well, or had thought he had. Me too, Lady Cathant announced flatly, staring hard into her husband's eyes. Me too. Chapter 23 We Go Down Again Fire sears and blood will stain, and death to all who dare complain. For there is pain beyond all pain, when together we go down again. Hobgoblin Curse Chant of the North, quoted in Volo's Guide to the Frozen Far, by Volothamp Gedarm, first published in the Year of the Wave. Ah, there ye are, Elminster thrust a goblet and a bunch of grapes into Laryl's hands before she could do more than roll her eyes. Much has been happening while ye've been off open lording, Lair. Do tell, Laryl sighed, sinking into her chair. Well, at least he hadn't said gallivanting and left her needing to hit him. The stacks waiting on her desk had indeed grown higher. 
A fire, yes. Couldn't help but smell it on my way here. L waved a dismissive hand. Someone disposing of evidence. Someone who murdered five guildmasters who were waiting to complain to ye, and an unfortunate courtier who attended them. Oh, Laryl said, discovering a sudden desire to drain the goblet in her hand. She gave in to it. I cast what spells I dared to on Draith's blood, L went on, but must tell ye I really couldn't manage much in the way of tracing. I believe the warden died in his office and his body was carried down into what was formerly Downshadow, where it seems to have been devoured by something, but the results could be read differently. Laryl sighed. I trust your reading, L. What's become of Mert? I left him signing things here. It doesn't look like he kept at it for very long after I departed. Perhaps long enough to finish his tankard by the looks of it. Wore himself out fighting the fire. Got quite parched. He's doing damage to a keg right now. Should be back here shortly. Did manage his own height in documents signed, lass. Don't be too hard on him. So, what's left? Waved a hand at the towering stacks. The paperwork is unending, L. The boring but vital requisitions and orders and arrangements that are the daily running of the city. Lass, lass, don't ye have rooms full of clerks to see to such things? Yes, but Never Ember had his own people in supervisory positions, and they left with him. Lords, guildmasters, courtiers, and everyone else are all saying the palace spending is out of control and corrupt, and coins are going missing as if they're being poured into the sewers at every flush of the garter robes. Given the reputed location of the legendary Xanathar lair, that may indeed be where all the coins are going. And I can't possibly even begin to investigate all of it if I don't read and sign things myself. If shearing the taxes of citizens is the only thing I end up doing, I'll have achieved more than most open lords. Aye, I'll grant you that. So now... Endless the work may be, but let me sit down and help ye through some small part of it. Reason out thy decisions by talking them through, eh? So, what's most pressing? That's not routine payroll and the like. Laryl sighed. Well, contracts to be awarded for the full dredging and cleanup of the ashes of Mistshore, so that end of the harbor can be cleaned up and a new dry docks built for the use of the refounded navy. She slipped a folder full of parchment out of the stack and tossed it to him. Also the Griffin Cavalry, procuring mounts, their breeding, stabling, training, and doctoring. Who is to do all of these things? Whom should I consult with? That the city may have the best, but none of its foes end up privy to our internal security arrangements. The open lord leads the masked lords, L quoted the maxim gently, wagging a finger at her. Laryl frowned at him. Well, of course the... Oh. Oh, indeed. Laryl's eyes narrowed. Despite the glee Cassander will feel at being handed a chance to meddle in and enrich himself with, well, everything, I need to consult with the Masked Lords, not just to get their advice, but also their buy-in on all of these matters. Or they'll just defeat ye when it comes to voting, L pointed out. Laryl nodded wearily. Arguably, both matters can be seen as within the open lord's purview, being as they pertain to the defense of the city, but some of Cassander's little cabal have already made comments across the council table about defense of the city provisions only being valid when Waterdeep is at war or there's a clear threat of attack. And so? Mert chose that moment, perhaps unwisely, to lurch affably into the room, the inevitable tankard in one hand and a plate of roast bustard in the other. Vintage fire wine, he said happily, and then, catching Laryl's expression, added, Well, someone had to search the cellars. What better place to start a fire if you wanted to really hit the lords where it hurts? I must apologize to you both, Laryl said smoothly for treating you now as glorified message, lads. But I find myself in sudden need of your, uh, diplomatic skills. Mert? L? 
please hasten to all the lords, the surviving originals, and the new, to privately tell each of them to assemble at the palace two afternoons hence for a meeting to vote on important defense initiatives. Mert looked down at his gently steaming bustard and then back up at her. Uh, that's a command? Laryl gave him a small smile and then took it away again. It is? Mert blinked at her for a moment. Then he scooped up most of the hot meat with his fingers, thrust it all into his mouth, chewed hard, cooled the obvious pain this caused with a great swig of fire wine, swallowed mightily, and made for the door, trailing loud, long gasps. On my way, Al, which of the dull, er, lords do you want to go see? Night had just fallen at last, and with it, Drake and Tasheen had departed the attic. Zarela settled herself on an old crate by the window that looked the easiest to get open, the dart gun on the floor beside her cocked and ready. She was cautiously easing the crumbling old window open, prying with the blade of her belt dagger, when there came a slight swift sound from just behind her. Zarela flung herself off the crate and away, snatching at the hand crossbow as she passed it, but a slender and very strong hand intercepted her wrist a moment before its owner kicked the blowgun away. Its bolt thudded hard into the base of a nearby roof beam. Zarela spat out a curse and tried vainly to claw whoever it was, a masked, shapely woman who didn't look familiar at all, but who wore a tiny pendant that was the symbol of Asmodeus? Then she was too busy stiffening as slimy tentacles invaded her mouth, ears, and nostrils from behind, choking her as they slid inward. With easy strength, they swung her head around. The last thing Zarela saw was the glistening mauve face of a mind flayer right in front of her nose. She couldn't see its mouth if it had one, but somehow she could tell it was smiling. Or felt like smiling gloating. Well met. The tone of that thought in her head was pleasant, and somehow conveyed that the name of its owner was Suthul. I require what you know of Lord Kazander. And then the pleasantness fell away like a dark curtain, and surging up to choke her mind in a red roaring wave of bubbles, black oblivion came. Well met, sweet stuff. You look schmoot as well as boo-boo-booful. The reeling man's breath reeked of cheap ale. Tashin grimaced as she fended off his vaguely pawing hands. Why did the gods arrange sheer coincidences so this drunk had to wander into her alley? And as she wondered that, hissing in exasperation, Sudden fire came roaring out of the Stravander house, blowing out a window with its fury, flames and sparks clawing at the night. Out came her hand bow as she danced back from the drunkard, and she watched his face go from amiably slack to alert in an instant, and his hands go from fumbling to grabby. But she put her first bolt through his jaw and neck from point-blank range, and down he went, barely having time to look shocked. Another frasting harper, no doubt. By the time Tashin had recocked and reloaded, the first people were fleeing from her side of the house, its back or east face. It had three doors, but apparently only one was easily opened or gotten to because everyone poured out of it. Tashin knelt, aimed carefully, and shot bodyguard after servant down as they came through the doorway until she was out of bolts. They were still coming, so she was just scrambling to her feet and drawing a dagger when Drake appeared out of nowhere, grabbed her knife hand before she could get that weapon clear of its sheath, and hustled her away. But we can't go, she protested. He'll have our lives if we fail. We haven't, he said curtly. I just killed Masked Lord Stravander, unless she can somehow go on living with a poisoned crossbow bolt right through one eye. Come on, there are more watch patrols converging on us than I've any liking for. Poisoned? Did you give me any poisoned bolts? No, he replied. They're not safe unless you know you have them. What if you dropped one, then picked it up and tested its point with a fingertip? Yes, 
a voice asked crisply from just ahead. What if you did that? Its young owner swung a sword hard at Drake with both hands. He had a taller companion half a running stride behind him who snapped, Where, Jess? and launched his own slash. Drake parried the first sword expertly, ducked under the second blade and tripped its wielder and burst past the two, only to find four watch guards charging out of the night. Before Tashin could do much of anything beyond kick the shorter young attacker's shin and cause him to crash down atop his fallen partner, Drake erupted into the watch guards, hurling two daggers as he went, then slashing faces with another. The watch guards toppled like so many empty wine decanters, burying the first pair of attackers. Fair, one of the pinned men gasped, struggling vainly under the weight of the heap. Fair? Drake swiftly retrieved his daggers as Tashin rushed up to him. Poisoned? Of course, he snapped. Now we go down again. He took her arm and dragged her into a dark alley. Down? As in down shadow? Yes, poison's all used up until I can treat these blades again. They heard the rising thunder of many fast-approaching hobnailed booted feet, and Drake hurriedly tore open Tashin's bodice and buried his face in it. Act like a willing play, pretty, he growled down her front, and Tashin just had time to wrap her arms around his head and utter a pleased but obviously false laugh before a watch patrol came rushing out of the night, heading for the heaped bodies of their colleagues. The moment they were past, Drake tugged on Tashin's arm and they ran. She knew almost nothing. The voice from Sathul's speaking stone clearly held a sigh. Other than that Kazander mistrusts the young noblewoman Tashin Melshimber, who is murdering masked lords for him, on the other hand, I now know far more than I care to about the spiteful feuds and investments of this one and her nine most hated rivals. Nine, and still so young. A life ruled by spite. It made her brain taste as sour as that of a wrinkled old villain. When they find her, they'll know how she died, Balavera pointed out. The hollow skull you can see into through empty eye sockets is a dead giveaway, even to fools like the watch. The mind flayer shrugged. I like to keep the populace of large cities remembering and fearing my kind. It's useful. Even ensconced in her office deep in the Tower of the Order, the Lady Master hated moments like this, which was one of the reasons Vajra knew she'd asked Vajra the Blackstaff to stand beside her as witness and magical bodyguard. Before the Lady Master's desk stood the order member she'd summoned to her office for an accounting. Malrin Lavalander, one of the most powerful wizards she knew of. A man who could turn her into several kinds of croaking frog with ease, and who was seething under her questions right now. Vajra took one look at Beau Gentra Summertain's face and then looked away. She could read the Lady Master just as well as Lavalander could. Right now, Beau Gentra Summertain was feeling sick. She hated controversy such as this. Yet these things had to be asked, and her membership in the Watchful Order, let alone her tenure as Master, would have been short-lived indeed if she'd shirked this duty. Beau Gentra feared that the Blackstaff herself, if not Lady Silverhand at the palace, would have seen to that. So even as she cringed inwardly, her discomfort clear on her face, she forged on. Did he have anything to do with the casting of an illusory raiding dragon over the city? Just what was his involvement in current city politics? Was he covertly working with any hidden lord or cabal of nobles? It was her second such interview of the day. Earlier she'd had it out with Varen Tever Kasmult, and it was going just about as well as the earlier one. Know this, Lady Master, Lavalander snarled, his cold composure breaking at last. 
I am innocent of casting that dragon illusion, or for that matter of any involvement at all in the current politics of our city, beyond seeking sponsors among wealthy private water Davian entrepreneurs for my spell experimentations. I was unaware that it was any sort of crime, and I am certain it is not against the rules of our order, for me or they to seek ways in which my new magic can be used for our mutual profit. Sir Laverlander, it is my duty. So it is. But that does not make me any less furious at being suspected of such irresponsible spellcasting. So this is what you truly think of me. Dangerous Lavalander, building himself into a tyrant. We'd better stop him before his boots grow too small for him. Then his eyes narrowed, and he stalked toward Bogentra. This is because of the murders, isn't it? Masked lords and guildmasters, so swift an assembly of the dead. And you fear I'm mixed up in it, and that you'll be next, don't you? Well, Lady Master... Let me tell you how revolted I am by your craven suspicion, your envy of my achievements, your anger at my growing popularity. You fear I'll try to wrest the order from you, don't you? Ha! That for the high regard of the order. I've bigger and better things to do than sit in an office and wag disapproving fingers at every energetic practitioner of the arcane in Waterdeep. Content yourself with such small-minded service, but stand out of my way. I am doing important work, groundbreaking work, mastering magic that shall have Mistra herself take notice of me. And if you dare to try to discipline me or spread untruths about my... And that, Vajra decided, was far more than quite enough. As Lavalander advanced around the edge of Bogentra's desk, Wagging one threatening finger, she stepped forward to smoothly interpose what was left of the black staff between that finger and Bogentra Summertain's nose. The dark fragment flared into an angry glow. Lavalander froze and fell silent in one trembling instant as he eyed it. Then his gaze lifted so he could give Vajra a look of contempt. Guardian hound, he snapped. Rude, blustering fool, she replied serenely, allowing a match for his contempt to wash over her face for a fleeting moment. And then she smiled almost fondly and added, Your point is made. We have been mistaken in our suspicions of you and apologize, unreservedly. Now be gone. Glowering. Lavalander stepped back, slowly and deliberately, not retreating in fear. Bojentra added quietly, We apologize, Sir Lavalander, and suspect you no longer. He looked at her, then withdrew another step and gave Vajra another glare. Be gone, she repeated gently, and as he met her gaze with a hard stare and stood where he was, silence falling and then starting to stretch, she added impishly, Mistra awaits. With a wordless snarl and a whirl of robes, he turned and stormed out. I believe he's innocent and genuinely astonished that we thought him involved, Vajra said gently as the echoes of the slammed door faded. I read him the same way, the Lady Master agreed, as with Kazmult. So if not either of them, she mused aloud, then, who? Vajra shrugged. Where's Glenmar? I expected him to stand with you in this, too. Bojentra gave a shrug of her own in reply. He has much to do these last few days, preparing protective order guards to watch over the new hidden lords, and... The door that had closed behind Lavalander swung open without knock or fanfare, and Eminder Glenmar hastened into the room. I saw Malrin Lavalander storming out of here with a face like thunder, he said, eyebrows high. What happened? What did I miss? It was another bright morning as Elminster and Mert strode side by side into the innermost chambers of the palace. The courtiers opened doors at their approach now, Mert noticed. Progress. 
As they came into the room where Laryl had feasted and met with the assembled hidden lords of the city with its great arc of a table, El sniffed the air. Oil? Are they oiling the lord's moot floor again? Mert asked, only half a breath behind. Was there a cut-price sale on oil or some such? Laryl, who'd spread her paperwork out along the table in a thus far successful attempt to get organized and speed her signing and deciding, looked up and gave them both a smile. It seems to be something the palace staff love to do. Then she saw their grim faces and sighed. What now? Hidden Lord Irmira Stravander was murdered last night, Helminster told her and the remaining original masked lords and the just-voted-in new ones have all heard about it, Mert added, and are all keeping to the strongest refuges they can find, every last one of them, surrounded by their bodyguards. Watchful order and watchguard details are stationed as near at hand as is practical without revealing to the entire city the identities of the hidden lords, Elminster put in. None of them want to emerge to attend any meeting regardless of what the open lord has called it to deal with, not until the murderer is found. Mert cleared his throat, looked at the ceiling, and asked, Or is the murderer a murderess? The open lord herself, perhaps? That made Laryl lift her gaze from the documents at hand to favor him with a look. Lair, let me explain, Helminster said smoothly. Disquieting rumors are being energetically spread all over the city, all variations on this theme, that a dozen guildmasters went to see the open lord, and she murdered them on the spot. Reduced them to ashes with fire magic, Mert put in, waving his hands, right in her office in the palace as they were being served wine. Laryl rolled her eyes and brought one fist down on the parchment in front of her. But she did it resignedly, not as if the documents were foes whose jaw she could break as she drove them through the table. Lass, Elminster said gently, I want the rumor spreaders found and questioned to see who's behind them. Yet you are the open lord in earnest now. We'll follow your orders and so need your approval to undertake such a hounding. Laryl nodded her thanks and sighed. Do what you must, she said wearily. This has gone too far for gentle patience now. It's gauntlet's time. Spiked gauntlet's time. Oh, Mert had grown a grin. Can I watch? Laryl gave him a quelling look. Volo lives indeed. L opened his mouth to say something, the corners of his mouth curling in mirth, and she snapped, You, old sage, can be of great help by observing silence for once, right now and lasting until you're gone from this chamber, less than a breath from now. That's right. Get you gone. I need to do a little thinking without two grinning helpers standing over me. Thank you. Is Krell Blount? Shrike Gulk muttered over his shoulder. Braithen Kazander looked up from his wine and his perusal of detailed maps of the city. Let him pass, he smirked. Iskrell Blount had been a servant at the palace for a long time. Some of the younger folks in livery made use of the palace laundry, but Blount considered that less than ethical, and he had no particular desire to have young lasses grinning at him because they knew the hue of his clouts. So twice a ten day for his small clothes wardrobe was not large. He took half of his laundry to a small washerworks in trades ward and fetched the other half home again for use. Or at least that was his public reason for taking his laundry elsewhere. The real reason had to do with the unmarked door beside the laundry jakes and the stair ascending behind it that led right here to Cassandra's duty guards. One of them was a scarred mountain of unpleasantness who held a spear in one hand like a toy, until such moments as this one, when he aimed it down the stair, wicked sharp tip, at the throat of anyone coming up the stair. In this case, an uncomfortable-looking Iskrell Blount. 
The other guard was the cold-eyed, earless, and sinister Shrike Gulk. Blount shrank away from him as he passed the earless man. Cassander nodded politely to the palace servant who knew that cue and hastily babbled that the watch had scoured the city, even pounding on the doors of nobles, but had found no sign of Warden Draith. The, the man has just vanished. Cassander smiled thinly, thanked Blount, tossed him a gold coin, some foreign minting, not a good water Davian dragon, and told him to hurry back with his laundry. These days, the watch has spies everywhere. The three men in the room watched Blount hurry back down the stairs. After the door at the bottom had closed, Shrike Gulk turned to Cassander. We took the body to just where you said. Of course, Cassander smiled. He'll be naught but gnawed and scattered bones by now, so he'll be telling no one that Glenmar inspelled him so I could command his tongue when I chose to. We can't have the open lord learning of that. My, my, no. All this weave work was exhausting, but this particular working had to be done. Laryl checked the locks on the doors of the little disused room one more time, satisfied herself that she was alone, and by the lack of sounds outside, no servants or courtiers were bustling about looking for her, lay down on the floor, closed her eyes, and called on the weave. Sinking down into its flow, she called on the power she could tap there to work a telepathic link, reaching out to Daggled Neverember, Lord Protector of Neverwinter and her ousted predecessor as Open Lord of Waterdeep. This was dangerously close to the mind-touching Mistra had forbidden, so she forced all the mental damage the contact would do back on herself to leave Neverember unharmed. The weave was quiet but ripple-filled this morning, its surges more white than blue. Laryl was amusedly reflecting that such a description would be meaningless even to most wizards when, quite suddenly, she found herself in contact with Neverember. He was alone in an office, sitting at a desk, writing. Laryl sent her mind's eye drifting closer writing payment orders for his treasury so workers on the road building between Neverember and Waterdeep would be paid. Her contact with him had been so easy because he'd just thought of her, specifically about how to proceed with negotiating a deal with her so Neverwinter and Waterdeep would cooperate on patrolling the road. Armed patrols, strongholds located along it at regular intervals, and adjacent encampments with shelters for travelers. The pain of the contact was rising fast. Suffering, Laryl spoke abruptly. To him, it must have seemed as if the empty air was suddenly interrogating him. Daggled Neverember, I am Laryl Silverhand, and I must know— are you involved in the murders of masked lords of Waterdeep? Neverember drew back as if he'd been slapped, hearing not just her words, but feeling her mind against his, and said curtly, No, I am not. The mind link was deepening, and her agony with it. It was intimate enough now that Laryl knew he was telling the truth. I must use this when judging criminals, whatever the pain. She hadn't time for such thinking. The pain was beyond bearing. She fought to form words before it overwhelmed her. Thank you, Daggled. I believe you. I just had to hear it from you personally, so I could tell my fellow lords that I'd asked you. I admire the work you did in Waterdeep and appreciate both the hard choices and the tireless diplomacy you've made such a success of to accomplish what you did. She managed to impart friendliness toward the man wrapped around the diplomatic words and knew that he could mentally see that she was telling the truth. That genuinely pleased him. He smiled. In the instant before her suffering overwhelmed her entirely, forcing her to dissolve the link, Laryl flung some last thoughts at him in a sobbing mind scream. 
She and Waterdeep were otherwise fine. The road is a good thing, and she valued him as an ally. But she must go now because of troubles with this magic. The last Laryl knew of Daggled Neverember. He was frowning thoughtfully at those thoughts. And then agony and the weave broke over her, and she plunged deep, hurtling into darkness. Sister, she heard Silone say urgently to Dove, or thought she did, this is how the weave can heal her. Work with me. Oblivion meant the pain slipped away. Chapter 24 Weaving Much from Very Little You are not the first fool to overreach herself in clutching for gold and glory and a throne. The world is full of ambitious fools trying far too hard, making noise but weaving much from very little. Seldrith the Sage in Act 2, Scene 6 of the play I Had a Dream Once by Dareth Torar Playwright of Serlagall, first performed in the Year of the Prince. It seemed as if all Waterdeep was suspicious of them. Jalister Silvermane felt the weight of unseen and decidedly unfriendly eyes on his back now, and he could see by Farrell's face that his partner felt the same. The Watch hadn't wanted to release them. They'd faced questions barked as well as snarled. Where'd you get the watch badges, hey? Hey? And, so just why are you two still alive when you were found under officers of the watch lying dead of poison? What can you tell us about how you got there, hey? Yet they'd been reluctantly released at last and had headed straight to the palace where the door guards had declined to let them in. They'd produced their watch badges in an attempt to win their way past and the door guards conferred doubtfully, consulted a superior, then relented. Jalister let out a great sigh of relief as he stepped inside the palace, but Dunblade looked quickly back over his shoulder, as if expecting a firm hand to clutch at them and haul them back. This way, Jalister suggested as they strode along, trying not to seem in too much of a hurry. All right, Dunblade agreed, but why this way exactly? It should be our best chance of finding Elminster or that Mert or the Lady Silverhand. Through that door is the four chamber, the outermost audience chamber of three before the one with the big table, where the lords of the city all meet together and eat and vote and so on. Each gives in to the next. Remember when El took us to get hired? Vaguely, Dunblade admitted. I usually remember every door and direction so I can get out of a place in a hurry, but this palace... He shook his head. They held up their watch badges as they saw the door jack ahead of them stiffen and then start to step into their way, and he drew back again, face acquiring a slight trace of respect. So they passed through the door he was guarding and into the forechamber, and saw Elminster and Mert standing, goblets in hand, talking quietly together, the tall bearded man and the short stout one. Elminster, Jalister couldn't keep from calling. The Sage of Shadowdale gave them a smile. You're bursting with some news, lad, so out with it. We only just got out of the watch's clutches. They kept us for questioning. Wise fellows, ye were on a mission. What did ye get up to that was so suspicious? Last night at the fire at the Stravander's house, we saw a man and a woman there and tried to fight them, but the man's a swordsman who can carve out both our vitals in a trice, and he downed us, and then a lot of watchguards fell on us, dead from the poison on his daggers, and they were too heavy, and we couldn't... Mert was chuckling, and El held up his hand and said, Hold hard, lad, hold tongue. We know what befell the Stravanders. Just tell me about this man and woman. They were together, yes? Yes, and they might be the two you had us chase earlier who got away through the Gost's mansion. So they might, but tell me now not mites, but what ye know from last night. They had poisoned weapons, Dunblade spoke up, and the man told the woman he'd just murdered Masked Lord Stravander, after the woman told the man that they couldn't go because he'll have our lives if we fail. Would ye recognize those two if ye saw them again, do you think? Jalister nodded. 
Oh, yes. Unless they were heavily disguised, Dunblade amended. Good. L looked past them then to give a glare to two men who'd sidled up behind Jallister and Dunblade to listen. These two outrank ye in the watch now, so obey them rather than trying to arrest them for something, he commanded the two. Oh, the older of the two undercover watch guards asked, and just who are you to give us such orders? I, Elminster told him firmly, am the new warden of Waterdeep. What? That should be what, sir, El informed him dryly. Now get ye back to Castle Waterdeep and inform everyone that these two are to be trusted and obeyed, not hampered at every turn. The undercover watch guards exchanged doubtful glances. They were still doing so as the Sage of Shadowdale advanced on them and snapped crisply, Go! They went. Al promptly hustled Mert, Jallister, and Dunblade through a solid-looking part of the four-chamber wall that turned out to be a sliding panel and along a narrow and dimly lit passage behind that panel to a shelf-lined chamber with a door that locked. Once they were all locked inside, he said, Stand still. I am a trifle rusty on my disguise spells. To Mert's eye, what L did then looked more like weave work than a proper spell, and so it was, but L silenced him with a look. Then he stepped back and announced, Behold, we all look, well, like down-at-heel shop help rather than our usual selves. He then rummaged in some boxes on the shelves behind him for a moment, produced watch badges for them all to hide in their boots. Yes, a second set for ye, lads. Let one be confiscated, and ye're still watch guards for the next folk ye need to cow. And they took back passages to deeper rooms filled with clothes of all sorts that were shimmering with faint, failing preservation spells. Tarthus did this spell work, Al murmured, lost in memory for a moment, and Kitten provided most of these garments from her collection of disguises. You want us to put these on? Bert rumbled, lifting two of the jerkins with a critical air. Yes, tis time for us to play at being shopkeepers. He handed two slumping cloth bundles to Jallister and Dunblade. False bellies. There are side slits neath the padding. Hide thy swords in there, scabbards and all, mind. Jallister gave him a disbelieving look, but Dunblade grinned and started strapping on his false belly. What's all this for? Jallister inquired, holding up his belly with an air of incredulous helplessness. Hunting the ones spreading rumors about the open lord murdering guildmasters, and for all I know, nobles and masked lords of the city and dung carters too, lad. Think we'll hear any unguarded speech if we walk into a tavern as a wizard, a lord of Waterdeep, and two watchguards? Now hurry up, even the secret tunnels in this place have traffic jams. Sea Ward featured only expensive and exclusive eateries. Diners did not expect the crowding, poor lighting, and noise they could readily find in lesser establishments, should they visit other wards of the city. Yet in Sea Ward, as elsewhere, the more outrageously expensive a place, the sparser its clientele. Even in fabled Waterdeep, there's a limit to how many individuals will regularly part with a gold coin for a tiny glass of water, sparkling or otherwise. So it was that at about the same time as a disguised Elminster and his three confederates were striding through dark and narrow passages eastwards to reach the cellars of less pretentious eateries, a water clock was chiming gently in the hushed and nigh-deserted upper dining lounge of Mermaid on a Dolphin, with only one diner there to hear it. Braith and Cassander had been enjoying the view from the windows— the mermaid occupied the southeastern corner of the moot of Vondel and Feather Streets, and although he always found the passing parade of Water Davians interesting, one invariably saw an exalted selection of better folk through these particular windows. He dined alone, thoroughly enjoying a platter of his favorite mixed fowl-stuffed eels. As the last of the chimes died away, he unhurriedly drained the last of his post-prandial drink, rose and made his way to a discreet door in a dim back corner, passed through it, 
and found himself facing an impassive guard in livery at the foot of a narrow staircase. The man was wider and taller than some doors. Each of his hands was as big as Cassander's head, and his eyes promised cold death. Cassander gave the guard a handful of gold coins and spoke a certain word, and the man stood aside, whereupon the mermaid's lone diner ascended the stair and at its top found himself facing another two liveried guards, one with a wand in his hand and the other holding a long rapier Cassander knew to be tipped with sleep poison. The right passphrase got him past these impassive sentinels. He opened a door beyond them and stepped into a room where a lone man was sitting at a table set for three that a graceful, silent woman in the same livery was just clearing platters littered with the remains of a meal from. She replaced them with a fresh decanter and a second glass that matched the one the man at the table was sipping from, and withdrew, leaving the two men alone. "'I trust you enjoyed your meal?' Cassander asked politely. "'I did. A rare pleasure. The notorious Varen Tever Kasmalt seldom dines in public,' came the sardonic reply. "'Thank you for paying for this.' It is, of course, a prelude to your requesting me to do something. Offering to hire you to do something. Something dangerous. And expensive. What makes you think mere coin will interest me? Kazmult, your purse is nigh empty. You've been deigning to go to revels thrown by lesser wastrel nobles these past few months, and you hate such people. You're attending so you can get something to eat and drink without having to spend coin for it. You weave much from very little, the wizard replied coldly. You lost the patronage of Tallest Alamber three summers back. The Sar Sales shipwreck cost you so much you had to sell your last two trades ward properties. The failure of Tranter Scroll Works lost you more and your work for the Master Mariners was ended by them two months ago. You've been seen visiting the moneylender Alrasklin, who's far from the willing first choice of any water Davian seeking a loan. Shall I go on? Your spies are diligent, Kazmult said sullenly. But even if I was starving in the alleys of Dock Ward, why would mere coin interest me? It doesn't have to. What I want to hire you to do is something that will be to your liking regardless. And I can and will pay so well that your coin troubles will be flung far behind you for a very long time. No matter how bad your investments and how expensive your future spell experimentations. Oh? And how do I know you'll pay what you promise? The nature of the tasks mean you can easily betray me unto death if I don't, whereas your magic can take you far enough from Waterdeep to survive if your part in our agreements becomes known. So just what are these tasks? By way of reply, Cassander made a certain gesture, but Kazmult waved a dismissive hand and told him, I've so shielded this room that even an arch-wizard— Nay, even a weave-working chosen like old Elminster himself would have to be sitting at this table with us to overhear. Cassander promptly waved his hands through the air just above the two vacant chairs at the table, evoking a thin smile from Gasmult. Well, then, the masked lord said, I thought we'd begin with something I'll pay you one hundred thousand dragons for. Ten thousand delivered into your hands by nightfall if we reach an agreement here and now, and the rest when the task is done. Kazmult leaned forward, unable to conceal his eagerness. The task, Cassander said softly, is to slay in such a way that it can't be tracked back to you or to me, especially not by someone using spells to try to do so, even someone like Eminder Glenmar, who, like all of the Watchful Order, should remain utterly unaware that we are working together, a hidden lord of this city. Kazmult didn't even blink. He was still leaning forward, hungry for money. Any hidden lord? 
I would expect it to be a particular one, and not you, Lord Cassander. Cassander shrugged. I'm not surprised that any wizard of standing in Waterdeep knows I'm a lord of the deep. No, not me, and not just any other lord you can reach either, but a particular target, Kalira Arhand. She's a lord? That I did not know, Kasmult replied. I accept the task. There will be more and similar? There will, and for the same amount, leading to a task I know you'll enjoy very much, for which I will pay four times that fee. Kasmult looked a silent question, but Kazander merely smiled, and waggled his finger that was adorned with the Mind Stone ring. As subtle as a fish in the face, the wizard murmured, but he was smiling. I believe we can work together. Oh, yes. You'd prefer our Hand destroyed in a way that she doesn't see and can't know her slayer, I presume? You presume correctly. How soon would you like her unfortunate demise to occur? How soon do you want to be paid? Kasmult smiled again, sat back, and replied, very soon after I have another glass of this escalant Karskatal. Jalister's eyes told him they'd trudged into a tavern called the Sleeping Dragon's Den. Jalister's aching feet told him they were somewhere midway along North Front Iron Post Street. Jalister's brain was wearily marveling at just how many taverns stood in Trades Ward and at just how much wine a disguised ancient wizard could drink. By the way he was stumbling and slurring, Dunblade was also feeling the effects of the ale he and Jalister were sticking to. Why trades, Ward? he asked curiously as they sat down heavily at a corner table, and he almost grounded his nose on its scarred stickiness. Why not Doc Ward? L was looking merry and entirely sober. Most dock warders already think the palace is the home of their foes and the open lord is a corrupt tyrant. That attitude is only modified in the case of this particular open lord for a few of them, who think she's someone they might want in their beds if they could have her without her world-blasting magic. And Sea Ward and much of North Ward sees the open lord as a necessary evil, an opponent whenever he or she isn't their puppet. So it's the shopkeepers and guilds that remain to be turned against the open lord. And that's trades ward before all others, Jalister said slowly. It all makes sense once you see it the right way. Ah, Elminster grinned. And there's the problem. Folk who see it other ways dismiss ye as crazy. They're right about the madwits, but not about the dismissal. Mert reached across the table and tapped the back of the old sage's hand with his forefinger, then used that same finger to point back at himself. Or, no, Jalister decided, back through himself at the table behind him. With one accord, they leaned their heads together over their table, as if listening to something Mert was whispering, but he kept his mouth shut so they could all strain to hear what was being said at the other table. Drink up, drink up, a man was saying jovially, for the next round's on me, too. And you've got to hear this. I'm told the open lord's taken to slaughtering guildmasters. She's already killed a dozen or more of the hidden lords. I don't think she'll stop until every last person in power in the deep is dead, and she's the only one left. Lads, the city of splendors is well on its way to becoming the city of the tyrant. Oh, come, come one of the drinkers protested mildly. Surely you weave much from little. Didn't they all die in a fire? They burned in a fire. All their bones were found in a heap, as if they were already dead and piled up in a corner of the room they went to meet the Lady Silverhand in, to yell at her over something they were raging about as they walked the streets to the palace. She's a wizard, you know. They always turn to fire in the end. There were nodded heads and wary murmurs all around the table. So what do we do? I can't leave the deep. Where else will I find work at guild rates? Neverwinter? 
They say the Lord never remembers itching to ride back here with an army if need be to retake the open Lord's throne. Which will mean water deep and never winter aren't safe to be in. Folks die in wars and pillagings and all of that. Or we could watch for someone standing up to her, and when that happens, rush in and help that someone, showing the tyrant she can't get away with it, see? So just who has she killed? Elminster grew a big smile and turned in his seat and asked, I, who has she killed? The man buying the drinks looked over at him, his eyes narrowing, and said, I wasn't talking to you, friend. But I live in the deep, so I'm naturally concerned when I hear the open lords going around murdering people. So either tis true and something must be done, or it's just wild jaw-wagging and I can dismiss it and order another ale. So tell me now, where did you hear this and who got killed exactly? Details, details. Well, uh, the stablemaster's guildmaster and the head of the glass blowers and the master of the jewelers and the bakers and I forgot who the fifth one was, but there were five, I know that much, and more'n a dozen masked lords too. No, from whom? Or were you there watching while she was burning and blasting all of these people? I... Abruptly, the man got up, gave Al a glare, and announced to his table, I have to go to the Jakes. I'll be right back, so drink up. Drink up and order the next round. I'm paying. Then he hurried off. Mert rose, grinning, and Jallister and Dunblade were only half a stride behind as the fat, wheezing man announced, I'm for the Jakes, too. The retreating man who'd been telling his table all about the murderous open lord cast a look back over his shoulder saw three drinkers joining the one who'd started asking him all the awkward questions, and suddenly decided that Jake's just off the tap room wasn't good enough for him. He bolted across the tap room and up the stairs that climbed its far wall to the rental rooms above. Chambers by the evening or half evening or overnight. Ideal for private parties, for the business meetings that so enrich our city, or for trysts with our handy low-coin lasses. They gave chase, Mert lumbering to the lead, but the four reached the top of the stairs to the echo of a slamming door, and found themselves looking down a passage that sported six closed doors. Mert promptly hauled the nearest one open, two merchants facing each other across a table, with papers spread out between them, looked up to tender identical unfriendly glares. Private deal, one of them snapped. Mert yanked the door closed again, took two lurching strides, and snatched open the next one. There were five men and women seated around a table in this room with a board between them depicting the city of Waterdeep. One of the men was grinning and announcing gleefully, Time for a mandatory quest, I think. As none of the people in the room were the man they were looking for and there was nowhere for him to hide, Mert sighed and slammed that door shut again, too. He promptly tried the next door, which lacked a table sporting instead a four-poster bed that held three unclad women and a slithering python, a bed with a middle-aged man wearing only a pot of flowers strapped to his head. Oi! the man barked. I paid for private time. Go find your own flower waterers. So they tried the next door. It had a drapery-covered window, and its bed was a large and grand affair that had skirts all around and draperies adorning its four-poster frame. A man lay on the bed, spread-eagled and tied to the frame, and a woman was lying atop him, both of them looking scared as they stared back at Mert and the others. Elminster's eyes narrowed. Block the doorway he muttered to Jallister and Dunblade, then rushed to the bed and plucked the bed draperies aside. There was no one behind them, but the man they were seeking promptly erupted from under the bed and, because Jallister, Dunblade, and Mert were all blocking his way to the door, tried to leap out the window, only to rebound back into the room reeling and topple senseless to the floor. His crashing meeting with them hadn't even left a mark on the shutters that were still dogged shut over the window. They had utterly refused to yield before his charge. 
El took hold of the fallen man by the collar and said to the couple in bed, Pray excuse the interruption, by all means continue. Were ye at the tickling stage or still at the archly purring and being sinuous? Uh, ah, uh, the man sputtered. The woman smiled, relaxing, and replied, Being sinuous, thank you for dealing with our unwanted visitor. He threatened us with a dagger, told us it was poisoned. It probably is, Mert grunted, and he and L dragged the unconscious man to the door. Jallister managed to favor the woman with a bright smile and a little wave before their newfound captive was dragged out, and they could close the door in his wake. Drag him, Mert grunted. He's not worth carrying, but by the head and shoulders, so it'll be his feet that bump down the stairs, not his other end. However, when they reached the head of the stair, six glowering men were waiting for them at the bottom with drawn swords. Ah, now, Mert and Dunblade said in almost perfect unison, this is more like it. And they laughed merrily, drew their own blades, and charged down the stairs. Cassander was the lone man sitting at the table for three in the mermaid's exclusive upper room when its door opened and the wizard Varen Tever Kasmult entered. The serving maid glided into the room but vanished again at the slight shake of Cassander's head. Kasmult watched a side door close behind her and then said with a smile, Success! Kalira Arand is no longer among the living. Gazander clapped his hands, and the maid's door opened to admit not her, but four strong men sweating under the weight of a chest large enough to serve as a big man's coffin. They set it down and went out and fetched another, and another. Gazander slid a key across the table. You will want to count it, no doubt. Rest assured that the sum total is ninety thousand dragons to go with your advance payment, and discreet delivery to the address of your choice within the city walls is free. Kasmult took the key, then almost bolted to the nearest strong chest, unlocked it, and flung the lid open. An unbroken sea of golden coins gleamed in the light. Good water Davian dragons, all of them, Cassander purred. That key opens all of the strong chests. Kasmult scooped his hand through the coins, let them fall back in a metallic singing of small clinks, sighed with relief, and then threw back his head and laughed heartily, and a little wildly. Kazander smiled politely, and when the wizard's mirth died away, said, There will be others, hidden lords and the heads of noble houses and senior members of the Watch, but I have reconsidered matters since last we met, and believe you should commence the fourfold payment task I mentioned, one that may take longer for not being traced and achieving complete success at the first strike are more important than haste. I will pay a quarter of the fee here and now if you accept here and now, though for practical reasons the amount I can personally carry— I can only pay it in gems, not in actual coins. I am interested, Kasmult said flatly. Who? The wizard Glenmar, Imender Glenmar of the Watchful Order. Kasmult's smile was slow but broad. It will be a pleasure. I thought as much, Kazander replied and slid a large coffer across the table. Kasmult opened it. Rubies, he purred. I have always loved rubies. Cassander produced a decanter from where it had been standing down beside his right leg and pushed it across the table, too. And Karskatal, Kasmult smiled. Chapter 25 The Gods Spinning Fun for Us All My Dark Luck the exasperated merchant calls it, the thorny way things always seem to turn out, saith the weary crofter, while others mutter of curses, and proud folly leading always to a fall. And I? I say it's the gods, spinning fun for us all. Shardretha the Dowager Queen, in the first canto of Sword-Hewn Road, 
A Poem of the Fall of Alufin by Tarler Holland, Bard of Burdusk, published in the Year of the Moat. We only need one alive, the bully blade at the back of the waiting six told the others in the mid-air moment before Dunblade reached them. He sprang into their midst, slashing and hacking furiously to strike aside their waiting blades and find himself footing enough to fight. Mert, on the other hand, bounded off the last step into a ponderous roll that snatched the feet out from under one man and felled a helpless arm-flailing second beneath the fat man's progress. Whereupon Jallister and Elminster rushed down in Mert's wake, Jallister laying about him wildly with his sword, and Elminster dodging and ducking until he could touch their assailants with his bare hand. And whenever he did so, that man collapsed in an instant, crashing heavily to the floor, out cold. In a few panting, whirling moments, all six were down, with only two of them wounded. That one, El directed, pointing at the man who'd given the one alive order. And our jaw-wagger. The rest we leave. He strode across the astonished and gawking taproom. Ho, tavern master! I wish to buy some lamp wick and some wine flask wire. When he produced a handful of coins that gleamed golden, the tavern master was suddenly delighted to sell those two sundries, and so it was the four victors were soon escorting two terrified and rather helpless trudging captives back to the palace. The little fingers and thumbs of both men had been wired together behind their backs, and lengths of lamp wick cord run from those wire bindings to encircle their throats from behind. El and Mert kept firm hold of those cords, and their unwilling captives went where they were directed. I wonder, Jallister sighed, as the now familiar soaring facade of the palace loomed larger and larger ahead. What reception we'll get from the door guards this time? Mert chuckled. So, lad, want to be made a lord of water deep so you can just give yon guards their orders? Jallister rolled his eyes. No, I'd prefer to live a little longer than that, thanks. Laryl was floating in drifting blue-white oblivion. Immersed in the weave, feeling the pain in her head slowly, oh so slowly, ebbing as the power rolling through her renewed and healed. It felt good to just let all of the tension and striving and stress of being alert and keeping so many trains of thought all racing ahead fade away. She was dimly aware that her body was lying still locked in the small room at the palace, because Dove had affectionately shown her an image of her senseless self with the teasing words, Looking good for an old one. Looking good. Oh, go carve up a dragon, she thought back, amused. What news, sister? You are supposed to be healing and leaving all cares aside, Silene told her severely, sailing up to join them on the flowing currents of the weave. How can you heal if you try to work harder than ever, Lair? Humor me. Laryl thought back. We always have, sister, Dove told her gently. We always have. Laryl sent them both a mental sigh. So do it one more time. What news? Silene's mind voice sounded amused. Well, it seems you now have cultists as neighbors in the somber hills. Elemental cultists, Dove put in. Earth, air, you know— the air cultists are calling themselves the Cult of the Howling Hatred. Wasn't that a hobgoblin adventuring band about a century back? Howling haters, sister, howling haters. So beware earth tremors and odd storms, Silene added, as they may be more than freak weather. Particularly watch out for a lone racing cloud that spits many lightning bolts as it travels. And there are some odd reports from the Underdark, too. Dove said, of a weakening and lots of fluctuations in the fares risk. What? You asked, Dove's mind voice sounded tart. And we have less realms shaking news, too, from Amaroon and her Arklath and Storm. They're still in Cormir. And Sembia and the Dales, working hard to establish new cordiality among Cormirian commoners and nobility, and alliances between Cormir and Sembia and between Cormir and the elves of Semberholm under the coronal. 
That's a life work. Perhaps many lives if things go wrong. Silene was demonstrating that she could sound tart too. But Storm has a direct warning for you, Lair. The next mind voice riding the weave was deeper, richer, and familiar. Storm herself. Well met, sister. Storm, how are you? I live and learn collecting more bruises in the process. Yet before we get lost in pleasantries, there's something you should know without delay. At least one Thultanthan survivor, a nasty young arcanist named Gwelt, was seen a day ago by a harper whose eyes I trust, slipping through a gate in a ruined and forgotten keep in the North Dark Woods near its northeastern edge, a gate that leads to just one place, behind a particular crypt in the City of the Dead here in Waterdeep. Laryl was wearily amused. All of the world's troublemakers seem to find the need to visit the City of Splendor sooner or later. I just wish they weren't all feeling the need to do it right now. My platter's full already, and they're causing traffic jams. And then a thought struck her, and she asked sharply, Quelt, did you say? One of our murdered lords was named Amasker Dwelt. I wonder if there's a connection. Quite likely, Storm replied. Isn't there usually? I think it's the gods spinning fun for us all. More fun, Laryl sighed wryly. But of course. Hold! Jallister shook his head. Was he ever going to get into the palace unchallenged? You'd think. Oh. Of course, elves spell spun disguises. The duty mages could see the magic and know the likenesses weren't real. Elminster and Mert had come to halts, holding their captives, who chose that moment to struggle, but subsided promptly as Mert rammed an elbow into the gut of his, and Elminster's cowered as the stern-faced watchful order mages cast a dispelling that looked and sounded far grander and dreadful than it needed to have been over them all. Watch officers were already stepping forward to take them into custody, but they stopped abruptly as the nondescript men turned into Elminster, Mert, and two young men who were now brandishing watch badges. These two, El told the watch guards before they could say anything, were spreading rumors about the open lord being a murderess. Oh, oh, the eldest watch officer replied through an impressive but graying mustache. We have three of those in custody already. They're being questioned with the aid of the order here and some tongue-loosening herbal concoctions to try to find out who's behind the rumor spreading. The Watch is happy to take these two off your hands and treat them the same way. No torture? El asked sharply. None. Tortured prisoners tell you whatever they think will make you stop their pain. It may or may not be reliable. Then we relinquish them. The senior watch officer waved his hand, and his fellow watch guards hustled the fearful captives away. Then he jerked his head at Elminster, signaling his desire to talk to him alone. They took a few paces aside, and he muttered, Lord Elminster, I'm guard sword Melrose Therendar, and I like what I've seen of our new open lord. So if it helps, we've learned this much. In all cases, the rumor spreaders were hired by a man with one ear. Tall, muscular, and bald, scarred face, broken nose, and one ear sliced right off. He's known to the Watch. That is, we don't know his real name and origins, but in the streets of the city this last six years or more, he's gone by the name of Lastalin Shrike Gulk. Thank ye, Elminster told the guard sword and meant it. We go to find the open lord right now. He led the way deeper into the palace, seeking Laryl but finding no sign of her. The Lord's Moot Chamber was deserted and reeked of yet another treatment of floor oil, and every servant and courtier they spoke to had no idea of the current whereabouts of the Lady Silverhand. Frowning, El tried to recall the most private spell-casting chambers, Mert making suggestions to help him, and the four went from one to another until they found a locked one. They pounded on its door. Yes, Laryl replied through it. Her voice sounded thin and tired. Open up, lass, El told her kindly. 
Put aside all the wild young lads ye have in there with ye, and let's talk business, as in the latest troubles of ruling this pestilent cesspit of ambitious coin-clawing creatures from all over Faerun. And beyond. Wild young lads, Laryl was smiling as she opened the door, but she looked not just alone, but weak and wan. Wrong room. Ah, well, twouldn't be the first time for that now, would it? El asked dryly. I can find you such a room, Mert offered helpfully. Laryl looked amused as she replied graciously, Out of the throes of temptation, I find that I must decline. Lair, a man by the name of Lastalin Shrikegulk might be hiring the men spreading rumors about ye. How would ye feel if I tried to, uh, make contact with the Xanathar to try to learn his whereabouts? Shrikegulk, Merck waved a dismissive hand. Hold hard there, mighty spells. I've a faster way of finding low lowlifes in this city than trying to find and negotiate with an eye tyrant, and one that'll cost us much less, too. Thy three lasses, you'll shorten their lives for them, ye will. Mert shrugged. We none of us know if we'll see tomorrow. The gods spin fun for us all, remember? He lurched away, saying over his shoulder, don't get up to anything interesting while I'm gone, and then spun around, pointed at Laryl, and added, You could get her food, drink, and a bed, even if Chosen don't sleep, she could use a rest. Dunblade looked at Laryl. You don't sleep? She rolled her eyes. Some hot food might be nice, and when Mert gets back, sit him down and get him to sign more documents for me in a room far enough away from me that I'm spared both his jests and the oaths that tend to erupt out of him when he's unwise enough to read what he's signing. Mert strode out onto the front steps of the palace, planted his hands on his hips, executed a slow bump and grind to the astonishment of the door guards, and whistled a loud trio of descending notes. Almost instantly a head appeared in an upstairs window of a nearby expensive club and gave him a disgusted look. It was Rava, and by her dress she was working, or at least posing as a maid. Mert beckoned her with an imperious finger. She made a different sort of gesture with her fingers that ended in a point down at a spot in the street below. Mert nodded and headed for it. Rava soon joined him. You're about as subtle as a slut street harlot, fat man, she reproved him as she took his arm and marched him toward the nearest alley. And I ought to know. Mert shrugged. In this matter, the time for subtlety is past. Drella and Waratbra were waiting in the alley, and the three lasses quickly surrounded him. If anyone comes close, Rava asked him, we're negotiating prices for slap and tickle, right? Right, Mert agreed. Now. If I was wanting to find a bald, one-eared man calling himself Lastalin Shrikegulk in this city today rather than a ten-day from now and, uh, detain him, where would I be likely to find him? Oh, him, Waratbra said scornfully. One of the I'm-tougher-than-anyone-and-oh-so-sinister sort. A trifle smarter and more diplomatic than most of them, but not really much more than a blackmailing thug. He usually hangs out in Dock Ward, Rava put in. Upstairs, in a gambling den and moneylenders on Nag Street called Tarstroons, Drella interrupted. He and five other equally unsavory citizens share a rented upstairs room there. He sleeps there when he isn't off elsewhere, though I doubt he has any official domicile to the tax collectors. We'll go see if he's there now. If he is, one of us will come back here and tell one of the door guards your new boots are ready. They'll believe that. And what's wrong with my boots? By way of reply, Mert received three withering looks, and then with merry giggles, the three lasses set off down the alley, leaving him to return to the palace alone. Uh, if it's ladies you're seeking, one of the door guards began. Mert handed the man one of the withering looks he'd just received and lurched his way back inside. The cellar was very dark, and the adventurers gathered there were wary. They eyed the mouths of various unlit passages that led to unknown destinations, 
and one kept a striker flint poised above the dried leaves clipped to the wick of a waiting lantern in case anything happened to the lone lit one. Their host, Kazander by name, was a landlord to some of them. He was standing well back of the table on which the scraggle-bearded leader of the adventurers was counting gold coins and was down to the last few now, slowing and frowning. Seventy-one dragons, Scragglebeard announced finally, starting to sweep them back into the leather drawstring bag they'd come out of. I've counted them twice. Yes, seventy-one. You'll all find one extra coin in your advance pay, Cassander told them all. It's my way of making sure no one feels cheated because this coin is worn thin or that one is misshapen. Remember, thrice that each will be yours when the task is done. He stood aside to point at a stack of identical flat wooden cases with rope handles behind him. Each adventurer went and took one. These are standard light fouling bolts? Scragglebeard asked. Cassander nodded. Except for the poison, don't be tempted to finger-test the points. That would be bad, the leader of the adventurers agreed, and Cassander waved farewell and ducked down a lightless side passage, using his glowstone to turn a corner and step through a secret door before even a racing adventurer could hope to see where he'd gone. A little prudence came never amiss. It wouldn't do to have louts like these blundering into his trapped lair. They might trigger the falling wall before it claimed its intended victim and ruin everything. After all, he only had one more in reserve. Trapped lairs were getting expensive these days. Rumors had raced across the city about the body of a shapely woman found with an empty eyeless skull. The morbidly curious and those seeking a missing loved one or debtor were flocking to see the remains laid out in one of the wall tower watch posts, into which the watch were inviting the public in hopes of identifying the corpse. Tashin and Drake had recognized Zarela all right, though they'd neglected to inform the watch guards standing over what was left of her on its bed of melting blocks of ice of their recognition. Now they were back out of the wall tower and well away from it down a handy alley. Tashin cast a look back and ahead and then up to see if anyone was watching from a roof or window. Finding no one, she dared ask, What did that to her? Mind flare, Drake muttered, or so the watch guards were saying when they thought no mere citizen could overhear. They're wondering where it's hiding in the city. A mind flare? Tashin didn't bother to try to hide her terror. We're going to die, she hissed, and soon. Not if I have anything to say about it, he muttered, looking up and down the alley and walking a little faster. Antler did this, Tashin whispered. He had Zarela killed because her usefulness to him was over, and that's just what he'll do to us. It's time for you to tell me more about Antler. A man who wants to root out corruption at the palace. He has a slow, deep voice. He's the one I've been taking orders from to kill masked lords, and he promised to make me one when the killing was done. At first, it seemed the right way to finally strike down the corrupt and decadent, the grasping commoners and self-serving nobles who've always ruled the city, but now, now, it's gone too far, much too far. Waterdeep is in an uproar. I thought we'd be purging this city, but we're destroying it. We're killing hidden lords Cassander doesn't control so he can replace them with lords he can control, Drake said flatly. He's trying to become the tyrant of Waterdeep. Cassander? Who's Brathen Cassander? He's your antler. He's a masked lord himself and a moneylender, investor, and a landlord in every ward of the city. A proper, ruthless coin mountain, and always has been. Some say he strangled his father to get hold of the family wealth and businesses. How do you know this? Drake shrugged and smiled. I'm a spy, and a good one. He's been paying me to spy for him for some time now. 
To spy on me? To spy on everyone. A wise would-be tyrant trusts no one. He set at least six other spies on me. At least six? Drake shrugged again. Six times I've been able to take down a watcher following me when I thought there were no witnesses. He's probably hired a seventh by now. I know he's been hiring wizards. He's closing in on the open lord now. Unsurprising. But how do you know that for sure? Good spies stay alive longer by spying on their employers. So we're being watched right now by this seventh. Almost certainly. And probably by an eighth. And they likely have someone watching both of them, too. Tashin drew in a deep, shuddering breath and left her guiding dreams behind her. So we have to take disguises, then get to the palace somehow to warn the open lord before he takes her down. Or us. Drake nodded, took her hand, and started to run. They rushed down the alley together. Tashin was just starting to get winded from the pace when he tugged hard on her hand, dragging her into a precipitous fall on her face on the ever-present refuse. A crossbow bolt promptly whistled past her head to shiver against a wall not far beyond. This way, he hissed, rolling sideways to the wall. He pulled her through a door into the kitchen of an eatery. Tashin endured a brief confusion of steam, sizzling aromas that were far more pleasant than she now smelled, thanks to the alley, and startled cooks, before Drake plunged her down a dark, foul-smelling stair. Into utter darkness, a faint smell of mildew and dank air. After they'd felt their way through a room, there was another flight of stone steps taking them even deeper. Where are we? Down, Shadow, Drake muttered. Tashin rolled her eyes. Again. Vajra drew in a shuddering breath. Mistra, but this was hard. Kelvin had been a chosen and an arch wizard of experience and accomplishment who dwelt in Waterdeep longer than any other sworn of Mistra. Reading patterns and disturbances in the weave across the city must have been second nature to him. He'd used the black staff to focus his weave reading so often that something of how to do that had been imprinted and fused into the staff itself, which was the only thing making this possible for her at all. The surviving fragment of the black staff hung in midair, drifting gently to and fro as the weave coursed around it, visible as eerie surging and swirling threads in this spell chamber of black staff tower. Vajra stood facing the dark relic, gazing at it but trying to see through it, because that seemed to work best for sharpening and holding her mind to meld with it. Weave reading was a more raw process than her training, a matter of gilding rushing power rather than crafting tiny hooks and containments for such energies, which is what spell work was. She wasn't just learning as she went by trial and mostly error. She was having to wrestle with the looming dark presence of the staff in her mind, wrestling with the black staff to turn it to her will, and at the same time avoid yielding to its way of doing things, which courted falling under its influence again. Wiping sweat from her face, watching gods, but she was dripping, she grimly went in again. She was the black staff now, she was the lady mage of Waterdeep, and she would prevail. It was becoming easier, and with deepening control she could read the weave more clearly, following its flows without becoming as confused as she'd been earlier. Yet she still wasn't learning much that was useful, for too much was going on across the deep in the way of castings, which flared up like briefly blinding stars to blot out her mind gaze time and again. The spell work seemed to be mainly watchful order mages working magic for noble and wealthy clients all over Seaward and Northward, and minor castings at that. But small lamps can still blind or burn when there are a lot of them gathered in a small BAM! BARAM! BARAM! BLAM! BLAM! Those deep drum beats rolled and echoed, but her ears told her that they were both sharper and lesser than her mind did thanks to warning intentions of the various casters who'd woven the rich web of enchantments through Blackstaff Tower. Short, sharp raps rather than deep boomings. 
someone was knocking on the doors of Blackstaff Tower. Vajra broke off her concentration on the weave, irritated at the interruption, and used the same magic of the tower that had disturbed her work to see who was at the door. Two men and two women, faces all familiar. She knew none of them well, but recognized them. Three guildmasters, Andral Theorendral of the Surveyors, Map, and Chartmakers Guild, Belrin Zorinder of the Cooper's Guild, and Felmera Undreneth of the Council of Farmer Grocers, and standing motionless in their restless midst like a flagstaff, the matriarch of a noble house, Lady Hamalea Zulpair. By their body language there were neither two couples, nor all that were at ease in each other's presence. Now what could bring such a mismatched group to her doors? Wiping her face again, Vajra let them in, took the black staff from its hovering into her hand, and strode to meet them. Uh, Lady Blackstaff, Theorendral began uncertainly. Lady Sapphire, the noblewoman interrupted crisply, you'll be wondering at the reason for our unanticipated interruption of your day. Let us unfold our business with you before we waste more of your time. Vajra smiled. I am not unentertained. Please do. She appreciated Lady Zolpair's brisk style and replied in kind. In brief, swift speeches, queries, and replies it unfolded. These four wanted her support of their newly hatched proposal to have the guilds and the noble houses collectively house and protect by providing bodyguards and secure accommodations with the financial support or the loans of suitable city properties by interested sponsor nobles, the hidden lords of the city, without trying to pry into their identities until the slayer of the lords was found and dealt with. Badra found their proposal well meant and even touching, but wasn't sure any of the hidden lords would trust it. Moreover, she could see it stood open to those involved trying to influence or even imprison and coerce lords, or at least the rest of the city thinking they'd be doing so and therefore that the rule of the city was co-opted by what would probably be deemed jailers. She said as much and forestalled their stern protestations by adding, Nevertheless, I promise to take the proposal to the open lord without delay. Her four visitors looked troubled. You cast about for the right words to voice your disapproval, Vajra observed bluntly. Why? It was Lady Zulpair who said, We are reluctant to involve the open lord in this one way or another, for she may be part of this, uh, problem. Involved in the killings? Both of the men nodded grimly. Vajra gave them all a shrug. Whether she is or she isn't, you'll have to deal with her one way or another soon enough. The lords are not hermits, and the watch is not mute. She'll know what you're attempting, and if you do it without informing her beforehand, she'll assume the worst and react accordingly. If she is a part of it, you'll be handing her the pretext she needs for sending in armed guardians, arranging protective custody of the lords wherein accidents can so easily happen. She let the black staff wink and glow with power to impress them, and added, If I champion your cause, it shall at least get a fair hearing, and if spurned out of hand, we shall all learn something. Her four guests eyed each other, and then reluctantly agreed. Well, well, so you could teach Water Davians prudence after all. Chapter 26 We don't get many of those. At first I thought you were just one more adventurer, out to steal and slay and threaten folk out of their gold. But now I perceive you have higher ambitions, and wish to seize thrones and behead emperors, to make yourself a new world tyrant, yet aren't raving, and actually have a plan. Well then, be welcome. A sane world conqueror. We don't get many of those. Immel Glare, the impressive, in Act One, Scene One of the play Snow in Neverwinter, by Rol Verlin Death Marian of Silvery Moon, first performed in the Year of the Saddle. The shutters are open, 
Warat muttered. And look at the flies. Someone's dead up there, sure, Drella agreed. But six men, remember, and their doxies, and those who come to have dealings with them. Could be anyone. Lorana said Shrikegulk went up and hasn't come down again, Rava murmured, as they climbed the narrow and evil-smelling stairs. Lorana will say anything if she's paid to, whereat were hissed back scornfully, as they flitted down the dark upper corridor like three racing shadows. Hand me your knives. What's wrong with your own? There's not enough of them, that's what's wrong. Rava sighed, slipped her hand in under her clothing, and when it emerged again she was holding two slender, dark-daubed, wickedly sharp daggers. She slapped them into Waratra's waiting hand and was rewarded by seeing her friend's mouth pucker at the taste as Waratra stuffed Rava's blades and drellas all into her mouth pommel first so her distended jaw bristled with an outflung array of blades. Waratra didn't try to say a word around them, but merely waved at Oskulk's door. Drella gave her a grin and glided forward, combing a lockpick out of the hair above her right ear. Yeldrin Oskulk rented the small and leaking ceilinged room next door to the larger chamber shared by the six men. Oskulk was a carpet merchant and a drunkard, he was probably sleeping off his latest guzzle, because that was how he spent most of his time, it seemed. Drella cheerfully picked his lock in three swift moments, then pushed the door in with her fingertips as far as Oskulk's loose floor bolt permitted, and held out her hand just as Waratra had earlier. Rava knew what was expected. She had her rope belt off already and handed it over. Drella took it, reached her arm in through the gap and around the other side of the door, swung a loop of Rava's belt with deft accuracy to snag the bolt, and yanked it up. Rava got her belt back in her face even before the door swung open. They strode right past the huddled and gently snoring Oskulk, and Waratra undid his shutters, thrust them open with the expected and unavoidable squeal, and swung herself onto the sill while the carpet merchant was still rumbling himself awake and reaching under his pillow for his trusty cleaver. He came wide awake with a start as he discovered it was missing, but his instinctive roar of oaths was forestalled by something abruptly thrust into his mouth. Something soft, curvaceous, and feminine. Oskulk managed only a morumph as he stared blearily up at a smiling Rava, whose hands were now at work lower down on his person, and then he relaxed and stopped trying to bellow anything. He merely smiled and lay still. Rava didn't even see the need to brain him with the back of his own cleaver. Outside, there came a solid fluck in the wall as Waratra drove her first dagger into the weathered and decaying wood of Tarstrun's sagging upper level, followed by another. Thud, 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 knife by knife, she made her way to the open adjoining window, twisting and swaying as she hung from one knife and reclaimed the previous one then, and tossed it back to Drella at the window she'd come from. Then she was up and into the room next door. Rava planted a kiss on Oskulk's forehead and was up off of him and gone. Drella, a step ahead of her, and both of them made it back out into the passage in time to see its door swing open. Well? Murdered, Waratra whispered, emerging to join them. I'm sure it's Shrikegulk, but someone sliced his head off and took it away. Flies everywhere. And Gresker, too. Smeared on everything to harm the watch and anyone else trying to search the place. Gresker. Gresker was the most potent contact poison that could easily be had in Dock Ward, if you could pay enough, stay discreet, and ask the right folk for it, but... Doors opened up and down the corridor, and hard-faced men stepped out with cocked crossbows in their hands. Rava, Drella, and Waratra barely had time to curse and fling themselves headlong at the still-open door Waratra had come through. It was Drella who got hit, snatched down the passage by the two bolts that transfixed her. Before any of the girls could even scream. You're the open lord, Elminster was saying. The decisions must be yours, so... And then his face changed. Morden Canaan? Laryl asked. 
Elm nodded and waved a farewell. He was still waving when he was suddenly not there. She was alone again. Laryl shook her head, turned, and... The door opened, and she found herself staring into the eyes of the Blackstaff. Vadra looked apologetic. I know there's no such thing as a good time, lady, so... Vadra, call me Lair, please. I... We're not alone, Vadra said quickly. I have Lady Zolpair, Lady Hamalia Zolpair with me, and three guildmasters. They have a proposal for you that seems to me to have enough merit that you should hear it. I do not think they intend ill. And I think, Laryl replied with the beginnings of a smile, you should usher them in and I should hear this. So it was that the masters of the surveyors, map and chart makers, the coopers and the council of farmer grocers were ushered in. Vadra smoothly introduced their idea and let them stumblingly unfold their whys and wherefores to the open lord. They were in the midst of it when more nobles and more guildmasters, in pairs or alone not in cabals, arrived demanding audience. Laryl waved to the courtiers to admit them, and in the uneasy silence that followed, she smiled and said, Lords and ladies and sayers, you all want to inform me of or ask me my permission for or need me to... what? It took much gentle questioning on her part to nudge her array of visitors into admitting they wanted to preserve and protect the system of hidden lords and keep their identities secret, not replace them with the council of guilds or ruling circle of nobles. Your position is clear, and I happen to agree with it, Laryl told them. Yet we share a problem. I am, in fact, not the tyrant of Waterdeep, and can't decide this or any matter of governance over the Hidden Lords for the Hidden Lords without the voted consent of, yes, the Hidden Lords. She gave them all a wry smile and added, Those same lords will have to be assembled to hear any ideas and motions, and right now assembling is just what they're refusing to do. The doors behind the last arrivals among the nobles were still ajar, and from the passages beyond rose a sudden din. The sounds of running feet, someone in plate armor crashing against a stone wall and then falling and rolling. And then the doors crashed wide open. Nobles scattered with concerned shouts, and Vadra and Laryl both raised their hands to hurl magic. They found themselves facing a lone intruder, her chest heaving and her hair wild, who went to her knees and gasped, Lady Silverhand, your life is in peril. I was hired to murder masked lords, and the man who hired me and who's behind it all wants you dead too. He's hired wizards to kill you. Many in the room knew the woman on her knees by sight. It was the Lady Tasheen Malshimber. Behind her, a lithe man was calmly fending off three watch guards with sword and dagger, even as more came charging along the passage. Watch guards, stand down, Laryl bellowed. Amid the echoes of her shout, the startled men stopped fighting. In the silence that fell then, Laryl asked, Lady Malshimber... Who is this man who hired you to kill lords of this city? His name, Tasheen gasped, is Braithen Kazander. Rava and Waratra furiously snatched up the daggers that had fallen from Drella's grasp and hurled them down the passage at the thugs, but they'd already taken to their heels, not one of them tarrying to reload. Drella! Rava cried, whirling. This was a trap for watchguards. Waratra snarled. Since when do we look like watchguards? The bolts were right through Drella, and she was drooling dark red blood, her eyes all unseeing whites. Drell! Drell! Rava snarled. Hang on! Then she hissed to Waratra. Help me carry her! Where? To healing! That new wave hall of Valkyr on Net Street! It's closest! They half-carried, half-dragged the limp Drella down the narrow stairs and out of Tarstroons, right into the midst of a passing watch patrol. Now what's all this? Stand away from her, you two. What happened to her? Get out of the way! 
Rava roared, producing her last hidden blade and brandishing it in fury. Ho now! Watchguards stepped back, faces hardening, and went for their own weapons. Which gave Rava time to fumble out something she'd almost forgotten she was carrying, having won it from Waratra at cards. That watch badge they'd liberated. She held it out as if it was a sword, thrusting it at the watchguards. We're with the watch! Now help us! Carry her to the wave hall on Net Street! Lass, one of the watch officers said gently. There's no need for shouting or haste. She's dead. Rava and Waratra looked down at Drella, lying on the street between them. Her face was white and lifeless, her eyes staring sightlessly at the sky. Rava and Waratra looked at each other and exploded into tears. The Many Masks where every patron attended in disguise, retaining a mask when they doffed all else, was a converted mansion, not a purpose-built brothel, and its elegant wood-paneled entrance hall and passageways had a few bottlenecks, at the first of which, just inside the front door, the house door guard was stationed. The duty guard just now was a tanned and muscled blonde giant with a chin as elegant as many a beautiful maiden's. He blinked at Sathul's approach, but managed to maintain his broad and welcoming smile. His teeth were pearly white and flawless. Ooh, a mind flayer. We don't get many of those, and such a good disguise, too. You almost had me fooled that you were for real. I can't see any stitching at all. I'll convey your compliments to the next elder brain I have dealings with. Sathul replied in very dry tones and swept past. Belvara knew he was moving quickly to keep the simpering brothel door guard from noticing the Mind Flayer's peculiar voice was coming from the ovoid stone at Sathul's throat. Are you seeking someone in particular? the door guard called after him. Belvara hastily tendered the Mind Flayer a solemn wink in case her disguise as an overpainted caricature of Lady Laryl Silverhand foiled him as she undulated toward him. Suthul collected that wink and turned and told the man, Not seeking. I've found her. Very clever disguise, a honey-voiced woman with a figure of truly spectacular proportions said admiringly as she swept past with leather reins and a whip in her hand, setting a brisk pace that forced the bridled and saddled hooded men in her wake to crawl at almost a canter. Belvara had not thought it was possible for an illithid to nod a polite reply in utter silence yet clearly make the gesture sardonic, but Suthul managed it. She chuckled. Our rented bower is right this way. The Mind Flayer deepened his nod into a bow, waving his arms in a courtly flourish that indicated she should lead the way. The Many Masks was crowded just now. A woman whose most prominent frontal features were adorned with chiming bells reached out a teasingly caressing hand to trace the line of Sathul's nearest tentacle as she passed. He made the adjacent tentacle caress her back, and the chiming lady had time to look startled before her patron, an aging noblewoman whose blue and white jester's cap and attached white face mask did little to hide her true identity, tugged on her throat leash and dragged her inside a love-making bower very like the one Belvara was leading the way to. Once they were through the door and had dropped down the privacy bar, Belvara turned to face Suthul and said mockingly, Oh, yes, Lord, such a clever disguise. Ah, but I can hide nothing from the open Lord of Waterdeep. The voice from the Mind Flayer's speaking stone came right back at her in identical tones of mockery. She bowed, then proffered a locket with its lid up to reveal the enchanted gemstone glimmering within, halting so he could see it clearly. When he nodded, the agent of Asmodeus activated it with a kiss and whispered word, then teasingly undid her bodice. Artistic verisimilitude? Sathul asked. Belvara put an admonishing finger to her lips. 
He nodded again, and they stood facing each other like statues as the shifting dark shadows of her gem's privacy rose and swirled around them. Only when those shadows entirely hid the walls, ceiling, and floor around them did she speak. He's gone to ground, she said without preamble. One of his bolt holes in North Ward, the one he just finished having renovated, which means he expects troubles to begin soon. And no wonder. He's taken several strides too far. The voice emerging from Sathul's speaking stone was sharply bitter. Hiring wizards to slay for him, and then wizards to kill those wizards, that will bring real chaos to the city, whether he succeeds or not. And once others get wind of that tactic and get, shall we say, inspired by it, then we must bring him down swiftly and brutally, Belvara concluded so they learn that it's a strategy that ends in doom for those who try it, not any measure of success. Ah, but where to begin? At Laryl's command, the Watch had taken Drake, Tasheen, and the rest of the nobles and the guildmasters to the Lord's Moot to talk things over all together. Dove and Silene had privately assured Laryl they'd listen in and relay anything the watch guards learned that they might decide not to share with the open lord. That mass exodus left Laryl alone with Vadra. I think I can help you trace Cassander's whereabouts, the black staff promptly offered. Laryl gave her a smile. Good. Finding him quickly is now highly desirable. So how? Well, Cassander habitually wears at least four enchanted things I know of. A mind stone, akin to a ring of mind shielding, a ring of spell turning, a brooch of shielding, and a gorget of far speaking. The first three are known to me, and I can guess what the fourth is by its name, but pray enlighten me as to its specifics. Vajra frowned. It's very rare. A wearer can speak, and their voice will issue not just from their mouth, but from a matching gorget, no matter where that linked throat plate is, worn or not. We could only trace the other gorget of a matched pair if we had one, and the link was active, that is, a wearer of one of the two was actually speaking. Laryl nodded, and Vajra went on. So what I thought might work best is trying to trace the blank spot a mindstone generates in very close proximity to a brooch of shielding. If he's still wearing both, then where they are is where he is, too. I can't do this by spell, so... She looked at Laryl, who shook her head and admitted quietly, Neither can I, but I remember something of how Kelvin could compel the Blackstaff to search for the signatures of magic items active at that moment in the city from within the Blackstaff Tower. If you'll allow me... She reached out, and Vajra flinched away, trying to take the black staff out of her reach for a moment before she mastered herself and sat grimacing in shame. Laryl laid a hand on Vajra's cheek and said softly, Be at ease. I know what you're warring with, remember? And through her touch, she sent memories flooding into Vajra, who trembled, opened her mouth to say something, and then closed it again without a word. She shut her eyes tight and concentrated on what Laryl was sharing, remembrances of Kelvin calling on the black staff to focus and weave power seekings and scryings for him. After a moment, Vajra whirled away and started to pace, holding the black staff up before her like some priests held holy relics aloft before them as they processed to an altar. She started to mutter, half words and slurred sounds Laryl couldn't hear. After watching her for a moment, Laryl went to her and shadowed her from a careful step away, moving with Vadra as she wheeled and walked blindly and wheeled again, ready to reach out and catch her. What the Lady Mage was doing was exhausting intense concentration, and soon enough, Vadra started to reel. Laryl hastily took hold of her and helped her across the room to a chair and table so she wouldn't fall. The Lady Mage was spent, 
out on her feet, so much so that halfway across the room she dropped the black staff. It plummeted to the floor, bounced once, then hovered just above the polished floorboards. Laryl got Vadra sitting. The black staff, the lady mage moaned, must have... Laryl managed to keep the pity from her face as she fetched the black staff. The surviving fragment was the head of the staff and the shaft just below it, where Laryl had been wont to grasp it, and it felt so familiar, so right. Firmly she put it down on the table right beside Vadra and guided the Lady Mage's hand with, then let go. Vadra embraced the staff, clawing it to the edge of the table and lying with her cheek and breast against it. She panted as if exhausted from a long run, then pulled the black staff against her breast and sat bent over in the chair, hugging it. After a time she sobbed and shuddered in pain, as if someone had driven a blade into her, threw back her head and spat out, I can easily trace the inspelled helms of the masked lords, and there's one in the same place as a mind stone and a brooch of shielding. The rings have been moving, borne by someone walking to a certain building in North Ward, but the mask has been stationary in that building for most of this day. Several masked lords could have all three rings, Laryl pointed out gently. True, but I've detected a mask in this spot on and off for months now, so I walked there two ten days back to take a casual passing look. I can tell you that the building the ring-wearer has entered is a former wealthy Waterdavian's private mansion recently renovated that now bears the name Thantilver Investments. It's the third building in from the high road on the south side of Tarnath Street. And how likely is it, Laryl asked softly, that Thantilver Investments is a business established and owned by one Brathen Kazander? Vadra smiled thinly. Being as it's registered with the palace tax takers as owned by one of his maids, who just a summer ago was a hand-to-mouth alley kiss-and-cuddle lass dancing in the saucy satyr club in Trades Ward, highly likely, I'd say. Laryl nodded. Now hear me well, Vadra. This is an order. Stay away from Kazander. I'll handle him. What I need you to do is find Elminster and tell him about Cassander, as I'll probably need El's aid in dealing with our villainous masked lord, who's not to be slain whatever befalls. We need to learn from him every last detail of his conspiracy, so we can get every last individual who's working with him and stop the murders, not just slow them down, but leave ourselves a lurking menace that'll strike later. Vajra rolled her eyes. You think just like Kelvin did. Laryl smiled. Who do you think taught him that patience, dear? He was a tad too much the righteous smiter when we first met. She turned away suddenly and added in a whisper Vadra had to strain to hear. And when I miss him most, my patience, my iron patience, is almost all I have left. There you are. Mert bellowed. What? Jallister and Dunblade, who'd been running with him, hastily drew out of the way, and Mert caught sight of Drella lying still on the temple steps, and Rava and Waratra pleading on their knees with priests of Valkyr. Valkyr? Two lumbering strides took him close enough to Drella to see he was looking at a corpse. He rounded on the priests and roared, How much? How much to have her back alive? The largest, fattest priest looked pained. No amount of a hundred thousand dragons, Mert shouted. No, no, as I've just been explaining to these young, er, uh, ladies. Two hundred thousand. The priest drew himself up disdainfully. Do you seek to buy the consecrated? Mert's hairy hands descended on the man's shoulders, and although the priest was a shade taller than the old lord in the flopping boots and food-stained garments and every bit as fat, he found himself being hoisted off his feet and dragged nose to nose with a maw as loud and raging as any dragon's. No! 
I seek to have them do their holy duty and raise my friend from the dead. Or do I have to get Valkyr to do it myself? Yes, yes you do, the priest sputtered, and no amount of bribery. Mert sent him down gently on his feet, dusted off the front of his vestments while the priest sniffed, lifted his chin and put the beginnings of a sneer on his face, and then without any wind-up slammed an uppercut into the man's jaw that smashed him off his feet and slammed him thunderously into his own temple doors. The holy man slid down them, limbs limp, and the underpriests ran to him. His neck's broken, one gasped. He's dead, the priest who'd gasped that turned and shouted accusingly at Mert's back. He's dead. Just like my friend, Mert spat without turning. Valker will be so pleased. The priests traded wild, helpless glances and then the doors of the temple were thrust open from within, shoving the body aside, and more priests came out. He just killed the wave master, one of the underpriests shouted, pointing at Mert. Gaping and then looking angry, the new arrivals from inside the temple surged forward. Only to recoil as a dusky-skinned woman in dark robes, who was clutching a fragment of a magical staff that had blue sparks buzzing about it like angry bees appeared in midair right in front of them. She spun around to face the lurching man they were headed for, who was now bending over a body of a girl who had two crossbow bolts through her, and two sobbing girls of like age cradling her, and said to his backside, Mert, Mert, where's Elminster? Gone, Mert snapped without turning. Departed precipitously by magic when something went wrong with the mad wizard he's nursing back to health. Who? Ask him, Mert barked. I haven't lived this long by spilling the secrets of angry old archwizards who happen to be the chosen of your actual goddess of world-spanning magic. Vajra rolled her eyes and pleaded. So where is he? I know not, truly. Somewhere wizards go. Vajra cursed long and colorfully, and was still doing so when a dozen priests of Valkyr tried to shove her aside to reach Mert. The black staff flashed blindingly once, and twelve sets of shoulders thudded into each other and the temple doors. Before the groaning priests could fall to the waiting stone steps, the lady of the staff was gone again, having teleported away as abruptly as she'd arrived. Remind me! Rava said fiercely through her tears, to have little to do with wizards as possible in future. You'll have to sign for them, the palace courtier said, a little uncertainly. Will I? Laryl's voice was mild, but he shrank back from her as if she'd thrust a flaming sword at him. E yes? Very well the open lord of Waterdeep replied, and plucked the clip slate from him, slipped its quill from the top of the clip with the deftness of long practice, and went down the lists. One rod of absorption, one iron guard ring, hmm, one that I created, I see, and gloves of missile snaring, one pair. There, that seems to be in order. Uh, uh, that's my line, the courtier faltered under her gently smiling gaze. Her eyes held eager death, and that smile, that smile was hungry for blood. So it is, Laryl almost whispered. You'll have to forgive me. I can be indiscreet when I go to war. Chapter 27 So Beautiful and So Deadly See the dark dancer through the trees? "'Tis not the goddess herself, but one of her mortal worshippers, "'sleek and lithe and shapely, a creature of the night, "'so beautiful and so deadly, like black flames, "'too close and you'll be burned. "'Dancers of Ilastray, a ballad by the minstrel Ondamer Jareth, "'chapbook published in the Year of the Scythe. "'There it was, Than Tilbury Investments, Laryl strode to the door, stepped calmly to one side of it, 
took the discarded tree branch she'd picked up four streets back and used it to operate the knocker. Nothing happened except a cheerful distant shout from within of, It's open! Laryl pushed with the branch and the door swung open. She held it out like a sword and proceeded through the door, stepping back out across the threshold immediately. But nothing plummeted down from above, and although she looked to left and right, no one was lurking against the inside wall on either side of the door or waiting with leveled crossbow. All she could see down the length of the high-ceilinged and dimly lit room was Braith and Kazander, sitting at a scroll-littered desk under a lamp calmly working. He looked up. Ah, Lady Silverhand, what an unexpected pleasure. Is it? Laryl asked in quiet challenge, stepping through the door and taking two swift steps to the left before proceeding down the room. Its floor was of large, smooth flagstones laid solidly, and she could see no hint of waiting traps. The room was long and straight, like a wide corridor, intersecting at the back with a cross corridor, with Cassandra's desk right at the meeting point. He was giving her a pleasant half-smile of greeting and murmuring something under his breath. Laryl guessed he was using magic and called on the weave. He was the gorget, and she heard him mutter, Glenmore, I need you. Laryl's here. Destroy her. She neither slowed nor stopped, but kept on walking, wrapping the weave around her like unseen gossamer armor as she went. Open Lords of Waterdeep did what they had to do. This was it. Braith and Kazander felt the tingling as the gorget awakened. Glenmar, he murmured, not letting the smile leave his face. I need you. Laryl's here. Destroy her. This was the great gamble. He was trusting that Glenmar wouldn't betray him, and that Kazmult hadn't killed Glenmar yet, and for that matter, that Glenmar didn't yet know Kazmult had been hired to kill him and by whom. Gods, but there was a lot of trusting involved in deception. Laryl was walking right into his trap. She probably knew it, but she wasn't here to kill him out of hand. She'd have blasted in his front door and the building it was part of and him with it from the street without warning if she'd been here to do that. No, she wanted him alive to question him, and that gave him the upper hand. The upper spike-gauntleted hand. He managed to keep his smile from widening. The walls flanking her as she strode so confidently toward him were both false, grand moldings and all and had been built a few feet shorter than the lofty two-floor-high ceiling of the building after he'd had it gutted. On their tops rested a row of crossbeams with heavy stone blocks laid atop them, concealed by the nicely plastered ceiling. The false wall on Laryl's left had been built just inside the real side of the building, but the one on her right stood about ten feet out from its adjacent real wall, and its support uprights, hidden from her on its inner side, had been sawn right through and were just resting atop their bases, ready to fall. Then, quite suddenly, Glenmar was there, appearing in the gap between the sawn-through false wall and the real wall beside it, giving him a grave nod before turning and going to the tiny opening concealed in the wall molding. It was behind Laryl now as she walked, and Glenmar unhurriedly cast a spell deftly through it. She whirled around in mid-step when his prismatic wall flashed into being behind her, its shimmering hues so beautiful and so deadly. And Glenmar took three swift strides to be right beside her with the false wall between them and reached out, the ring on his finger flashing as he called on its power. Then he was sprinting right at Kazander to get out of harm's way as the ram his ring had sent forth smashed a sawn-through pillar off its base behind him, and the whole flimsy wall came down with a roar, beams and massive stone blocks and all. Ah, but it was wonderful. The false walls and ceiling collapsed just as they'd been designed to, slamming into Laryl 
and driving her, struggling and shattered amid a welter of tumbling beams into and through waiting prismatic doom. And Glenn Marr, turning to see his work while he was still running, gloated aloud, Ha! So easy that the Chosen must have been fooling us all along. They're not mighty arch-wizards after all. So the infamous Elminster who's been seen with her here in Waterdeep will prove no trouble at all. Unseen behind the crowing mage, Cassander's own growing and gleeful smile fell right off his face. He had to get rid of all wizards in the deep, except himself. Mistra, the pain. So this was what it felt like to be of the weave, forcibly torn from a buried and broken body. She was fire, silver fire, and yet she was Laryl. She was agony, burning, crackling agony, agony that could see and hear and feel. Oh! Whirling up into the weave, Laryl felt the pain start to ebb for the first time and stopped trying to scream. All that came out was raw silence anyway, and... Far below and behind her, rubble shifted as a splintered beam groaned and split farther, and two wedged stone blocks tipped and rolled. One of them crushed her skull like a small and delicate egg. But the wizard who'd slain her, it was Imender Glenmar, yes, couldn't see that. He came rushing over, alarmed, to plant himself and work another spell. Was Laryl Silverhand going to rise up unscathed or heal herself in a trice through some trick of the Chosen? He was going to make very sure of her demise with a... Laryl knew this casting well, a cone of cold to be hurled at the little bit of her he could see. One bared hip exposed in the torn edge of a heap of fallen wall and ceiling. She looked instead at Cassander, who was looking just as apprehensive as Glenmar. But his eyes weren't on the shifting rubble, but on Glenmar's back. And he was hunkered down behind his desk now and tearing off every last bit of magic he had, fearing being traced, of course. A moment later, as Glenn Marr was watching the searing cold of his spell strike home, Cassander stole out of the room behind him. Laryl darted after him, an unseen shadow in the weave. The man ducked through a secret door and into a passage. It forked and forked again, and all of the side passages in the walls of adjoining buildings had scores of exits. Cassander must be counting on Glenn Marr not having time to check them all. Neither did Laryl, for right around her, with all this magic being unleashed, the weave was seething, and she was being torn apart all over again. It didn't hurt this time, but she was having to chase after herself, to cling to what was her and rebuild, melding what was Laryl amid the rippling, roiling chaos. It would be so easy to just leave it all behind and ride the weave. She was back in the tower. This room in Blackstaff Tower dominated by its table with the magnificent map of Waterdeep, the room where she felt most powerful, most in control. Most in control, not truly in control of anything. The Lady Mage of Waterdeep she might be, the Blackstaff, but here she was sitting in a chair clutching the black staff to her face and trying, trying to feel Elminster's whereabouts through the weave and failing miserably. She was a pitiful excuse for the black staff, a mere echo of the great Kelvin, and she was fumbling and ignorant of this weave work, this huge world of surging power she'd avoided until now. Avoided when she should have dared to master it before the city stood in such need, before she... Ah! Out of North Ward, like a fist hard into her face, came a tidal wave of raw, screaming agony that smashed into her and washed over her and raced on. She was dimly aware that the Blackstaff had crashed into the far wall. She was on the floor, writhing on her back, with the chair she'd been sitting on riven into shards and splinters far away from her, and she was arching in agony that wasn't even hers. Someone had died up in North Ward, someone of great power, 
someone she knew, some Laryl. And gradually, Vadra also became aware that her throat was afire, and the long, raw keening she'd been hearing, the throat-stripping screaming, was coming from her own throat. A moment later, through swimming eyes, someone appeared above her, where there had been empty air up to the ceiling only a moment before. That should be impossible. No one should be able to teleport into Blackstaff Tower when she had the wards up. No. From somewhere she could hear a man of mature years singing. It was wild and carefree, but somehow she knew it was not drunken song that ended abruptly when the man above her turned his head, long white beard swirling, and said, Morden Canaan, must ye? I've got the lass here shrieking in my face, and... The singing stopped, and Elminster bent down and asked gently, What's wrong, lass? What's happening now? Vadra could only find tears for an answer. The adventurers, who'd collected their coins and their crossbow bolts earlier, were startled to see him, and no wonder. They'd probably thought the bit of wall he'd just stepped through was solid. Help me into my armor, Cassander snapped at them, nodding at a closed closet door across the room and tossing its key to the nearest gaping man. They looked amazed for a moment longer, then all scrambled to obey, rushing the closet as if it were a foe. Ah, the power of shiny golden coins. With their help, he donned his gleaming suit of armor in a trice. It had been expensive, but worth it. Though he lacked a helm and gauntlets, he felt shielded against the world, yet still able to move easily, and he knew he looked grand. Scragglebeard, for one, was looking at the armor enviously. Best not to give him any time to get ideas. Not that he had time to spare right now. Time to use those poisoned bolts, he told them, and make no mistake when you do. Surround him before he realizes his peril, then feather him well. He's a formidable wizard. Casmalt, yes? Scragglebeard asked. It was always Scragglebeard. Casmalt, Cassander confirmed, making it as curt as he could. Then get away back here, shaking all pursuit, for I may need you to dispose of another wizard for me. If I do, you'll get paid double, and I'll provide new poisoned bolts. If you don't, I'll pay what I've paid you already over again, for nothing but your silence. He was gambling that the adventurers wouldn't get to Casmalt until after Casmalt had killed Glenmar. He had to. He took his leave in haste, through the secret door that had the strongest bolt on its other side to discourage any explorations, and took the fastest way to the palace, emerging into the open only when he had to. Shopkeepers and carters and a watch patrol gave his gleaming armor curious looks, but his lack of weapons forestalled any watch guards questioning him. Wealthy citizens did buy armor and walk about trying its fit and comfort after all, and he made good time. He was mere steps from the open plaza in front of the palace, with the Garen's Tower looming up before him when he found himself passing the Dragon's Head Tavern. Struck by a sudden thought, he ducked inside. The words tumbled out of her, Laryl's fate, what she'd felt, all of it. She was still stammering out her explanation when Elminster's face, which had been looking increasingly grim, suddenly swirled, and she was staring at Laryl. Vadra gulped. Before she could find the right words, Laryl's beautiful lips moved, and a higher, gentler version of Elminster's voice told her sternly, Stay out of what is to come, Vadra Sapphire. Do not try to follow me. Bide here in Blackstaff Tower, because if I fall, lass, and Laryl has truly fallen, ye must survive to hold Waterdeep together. Half afraid and half angry, Vadra started to protest. As the Blackstaff, I should be part of any battle to— The stern face staring into hers turned disgusted. Duty, El snapped. Time for ye to learn what it really is. He waved a hand— one of Laryl's shapely hands waved almost as Laryl herself did, 
and the black staff came hurtling from the far wall, slammed into Vajra, and raced her in a bewilderingly whirling, elbow-banging instant out of that room, and the next thing Vajra knew, she was sitting on the old stone seat she'd always thought of as Kelvin's throne, with the black staff across her lap and holding her there as solidly as any iron bar. Manacles of crawling blue-white magic were holding her wrists and ankles to the stone, rushing strands of the weave that touched her knot, yet held her limbs to the chair as securely as if she'd been wired there. She fought to free herself, and it was like struggling against the entire world. Heads turned all over the taproom of the dragon's head as Kazander strode in, magnificent in his gleaming and ripplingly bright unblemished coat of plate armor. He let a confident half-smile ride his face as he sought out the faces he was seeking. Aha! There they were. A bored table of adventurers, all boredom dropping from their faces as they looked up and recognized him. Took you long enough to remember us, one of them called, just as Kazander exclaimed. There you are. Stand up, all of you. They stood in hasty union, the power of the coin again. He peered at them all, gauging their height, then pointed. You and you, come with me. Leave your swords and axes behind. Bring daggers only. You're posing as my bodyguards, but say as little as possible. Come. Where? Bodyguards don't ask questions, Kazander snapped over his shoulder, already back toward the street. The adventurers looked at each other, shrugged, and rushed after him. Than Tilver Investments was now a ruin, or at least the front two-thirds of it was. Glenmar surveyed the frost-caked tangle of riven beams, rubble, and huge blocks of stone with some satisfaction. He'd hurled two more spells at whatever was left of Laryl's body, pulverizing the rubble that had buried her, and could see a severed hand, lying still, thank the gods, a lot of scorched dark wetness that had once been blood and not much else. Now, aside from dust and a little smoke lazily curling up from the rubble, all was still and silent in front of him. It seemed he'd just destroyed a chosen of Mistra and gotten away with it. Forgive me, Mistra, he murmured just to be safe, but couldn't keep a wide smile from his lips while doing it. Kazander had fled during the battle, of course. Coward. Still, the man wasn't the sort of audience a mighty wizard wanted to preen in front of anyway. Glenn Marr turned away, finally allowing himself a gusty sigh of mingled smugness and, yes, relief. He managed to take just a single step before the open Lord of Waterdeep, Lady Laryl Silverhand, appeared right in front of him, intact and looking less than pleased. Glenn Marr gaped at her, dumbfounded. How could she have survived that? Her body was destroyed. How? He wasn't going to have time for any speculations. Laryl was already saying bitterly, Traitors have never impressed me. The air filled with the racing swarm of blue-white bolts, magic missiles that should have been absorbed off by his ward spell, but he already knew somehow that they wouldn't be. Eleven, twelve, he hadn't had time to count them all as they slammed home through a tingling of the air that could only be the weave, risen and raging. They were followed by a kick to the crotch that sent Imender Glenmar flying, writhing in agony. The palace door guards gave way when Kazander told them curtly, Lair, the Lady Silverhand has requested my presence here for an important vote. I'll be in the purple audience chamber awaiting her. He led his bodyguards into the palace, murmuring to certain palace staffers and courtiers, It's time, as he passed. In every case they nodded, looked anxious, and hurried away. Kazander turned aside from the route that led to the purple audience chamber to step through an unmarked door into a linen closet. One end of it was hung with replacement draperies rather than fitted with shelves for sheets and towels, and Kazander ducked through them to slide open a concealed door in the back wall 
and step into a dark space beyond. The moment the door had been slid shut behind him again, a drift glow began to glow, illuminating the small room Cassander and his bodyguards now stood in. All around them were racks and shelves crowded with the helms and vestments of the hidden lords of Waterdeep, kept ready here for the use of lords desiring to enter the palace as themselves and robe up in private. Cassander selected those he'd long ago set aside for himself as the best fit and directed his two bodyguards to don the complete regalia themselves. Once their identities were concealed by the mask helms, gauntlets, and floor-length vestments, he led them at a swift pace to Castle Waterdeep, where he ordered the gate guards, It is imperative that we speak with the most senior watch officers on duty here without delay. Assemble them. In a surprisingly short time, he found himself facing a grizzled old veteran of a watch sword whose name was Hawk Guard or some such, one of the two women who were watchlords, Talia Hameyerhart, as it turned out, the seneschal of Castle Waterdeep, Hardaunt Maskridge, and Lord Armorer Belarkin Vangelar. The slayer of masked lords has been found and caught, he told them without any greetings or courtesies, and is being detained at the palace. It's imperative that all of the lords of Waterdeep, including those newly voted in, be gathered in the Lord's meeting chamber in the palace right now to decide the fate of the guilty party and to restore the stability of the city. I know not how quickly we can, the watchlord started to say, but Cassander interrupted her. Arrest them and carry them in bodily if you have to, he snarled, but get them here. And then he turned to hasten away, the two adventurers posing as masked lords hastily joining him and snapped over his shoulder. We also require an armed and ready watch patrol to accompany us right now. There's treason afoot. Even before he spoke, the girls knew from his face and slumped shoulders that the news would be dark. Mert stepped back out of the unicorn horn surmounted front doors of Unicorn Hall, followed by a downcast Jalister and Dunblade. This lot won't even try to bring Drella back either, he growled. No matter how much coin I offer them, all they say is, the hallowed horned dancer now frowns on returns to life, except for resurrections that enjoy her personal blessing but they'll see Drella washed and made whole and buried as befits a lady with full reverence in the city of the dead. Well, Rava quavered through fresh tears, that's something. Drella, a lady. And she tried to laugh. It turned into a snort, and she ended up crying again. Waratra hugged her, tears streaming down her own face. Strong, Rava, be strong. Nothing we do now will bring her back. She's gone. But I don't want her to be, Rava bawled. Let me pretend a little longer, Wara, please. Both girls stiffened as Mert suddenly grabbed them and said in a voice that sounded distinctly like Elminster rather than his own, Get ye to Tarnith Street in Northward, three doors east of the high road, to Tan Thilver Investments. Go around the back way and hurry. Laryl has urgent need of ye. Rava, Waratra, Jalister, and Dunblade all stared at Mert. The fat old man was staring off into the distance, his eyes not fixed on them or the just-finished temple of Luru beside them, or Rainrun Street around them. That's Elminster's voice, Jalister snapped. Come on! And he turned and started to sprint. Dunblade slapped Mert's face and barked, Come on, old wolf, run! They all started to run. Whatever befalls, we must not split up, Jalister shouted. I'm not sure Dunblade and I can find this place speedily without you locals. Watch patrol ahead, Rava called, and they're pointing at us and waving. They want us to stop. We're in Castle Ward, remember? Scatter, Jalister snapped. Split up, crashed it. Mert, deal with them. Oh, I give me the fun tasks, Mert growled as they saw no less than three masked lords in full helms and vestments striding among the watch guards. 
One of them pointed right at the four and declaimed in a loud, deep voice, Those are the slayers of Lady Laryl Silverhand, the open lord of Waterdeep. Arrest them, and if they flee, cut them down in their own blood. Oh, dung, Rava gulped, as she, Waratra, Mert, Jalister, and Dunblade all scattered, running in different directions. Amid the rubble of Thantilver investments, the Laryl who was not Laryl fell to his knees, fire raging in his head. Whoa, the pain! He had to abandon his weave-boosted attempt to read Glenmar's mind. It was simply hurting too much to keep his will bent on forcing his way into a pain-racked, dazed, and hostile mind. Sorry, Mistra, he murmured. There came an immediate silver and blue flood of soothing energy through the weave by way of a reply. El sighed in relief and resignation. So, he mumbled aloud, we're to stay out of minds no matter what. The blue-silver surge flared up at him and then winked out, a definite affirmative. El sighed again, nodded, and carefully cast a force cage around the huddled and writhing Glen Mar. The last word of the spell had just left his lips when the meteor swarm crashed into him. Vadra yawned, again. Upset she might be, and Waterdeep might stand in great peril. But she was trapped in this stone chair, and now all the worry and haste and rushing about were catching up with her. It would be so easy to just let sleep take her, and let Elminster the Almighty deal with his own messes, if he was so bound and determined to hurl orders and cry duty. This throne was by no means comfortable, but Vadra had slept in worse conditions, and what was this? To her astonishment, the weave bonds were loosening, fading. Her excitement leaped, and they tightened again, rushing faster and glowing brighter. Oh, ho! It took her a seeming eternity and all of the self-discipline she could muster to relax into a deeper calm than she'd felt in days. Yes, it was days. And as she grew calmer, the bonds binding her to the throne loosened and faded. When at last she relaxed entirely, telling herself nothing really mattered, in the grand march of the gods' scheme of things, the bonds let her go. Vadra got up and stepped away from the throne as gingerly as any cat burglar. When she was a safe six strides away from it, she put her hands on her hips and told the empty air, If this was some sort of lesson, Elminster, I don't appreciate it. Chosen of Mistra or not, don't decide my duty for me. Old ways are for old days. The black staff promptly rose up in front of her nose. Don't you start, she snarled at it. Am I to be forever hindered by the schemes of old men? The black staff went dark and fell to the floor. Leaving her staring down at it, dumbfounded. Then she hastily bent and scooped it up. For the first time ever, it felt lifeless in her hand, just an old stick of wood. I didn't mean it, she pleaded in sudden fear, shaking it and then lifted her chin and told Blackstaff Tower around her as calmly as she could, Yes, I did. I am the Blackstaff. I walk my own road. Chapter 28 Treason Keep and deliver me, warded bright, against treason, fang, and blight, for I would see the morning hail and know the bliss of deep sleep's veil. From Warding the Fifth in the chapbook Volo's Guide to Rhyming Incantations by Volothamp Gedorm, published in the Year of Rogue Dragons. Into every life a little ceiling must fall, or a lot. Tis my time for a lot again, it seems. L couldn't move, and much of him was broken. 
He only just had strength of will enough through the agony to call on the weave to flow hard through him and deaden the pain he was feeling. A little. His shattered body, still in the slender and shapely likeness of Laryl, was pinned under the shattered tiles and heavy roof timbers and masonry. The thunderous roar of the building's roof coming down had ended, but dust still roiled thickly. Not that his rib-pierced and blood-full lungs would let him breathe, and damned if this mage who'd laid him low wasn't casting acid-splash spells on the bits of him that weren't buried. One, and then another, followed by an angry scream of, Die! Why won't you die? Wizards these days. Arrah! That inelegant battle cry was Mert, whooping enough breath into his straining lungs to try to dissuade Kazmult from hurling yet another spell. Windmilling his arms for balance, the fat man came lumbering into the ruined building like a team of galloping, snorting horses, with Jallister and Dunblade and Mert's young dock ward wenches. Only two, what had befallen the third? Had he lost one already? Careless, careless, followed by red-faced and huffing watchguards with two masked lords? Kazmult retreated, abandoning whatever spell he'd been going to cast, so that was one good result, but the watchguards were going after Mert and the others with their blades out. Get me out of here! That was Glenn Marr in the force cage calling to Kazmult, who'd thus far shown no intention of freeing the deputy master of the watchful order, and looked as if his disinclination was quite likely to continue. Defend the lords, the watch officer in charge of the patrol bellowed. Protect them at all costs. Then he snarled to the two lords. You really shouldn't be here, lords, too perilous. And what happened to your, er, colleague? Fell behind two blocks back, one of the lords told him, sounding irritated, and slipped away, don't know where to. Well, with all respect, follow him, the watch officer barked. Get you gone. The open lord, that was Mert. She's buried here, see? We must dig her out. When that shout failed to stop the two watch guards trying to sort him, he disgustedly plucked up a lump of jagged stone from a shattered cornice, beamed one of them, and then rushed the other as that armor hastily backed away from his toppling comrade's sword, took the man by the throat in one large hand, and introduced the watchguard's head to his own upthrust knee, and then bellowed again, Watchguards! Sucker for the open lord! A rescue! A rescue! Chaos. The usual utter chaos. Twas always thus, probably always would be. The two masked lords had fallen back uncertainly, but not departed. Watch guards were listening to Mert, but doing nothing to follow his exhortations, and Kazmalt was now eyeing the force cage, but was also retreating beyond the desk to where he could put his back to an intact wall and shoving up his sleeves to ready himself for spellcasting, as his gaze came around to Elminster again. Aye, this one intended to destroy the open lord for good perhaps disintegrating what was left of El. Everything was darkening now, unable to breathe, body shattered, agony becoming utter. Elminster put all of the tattered will he could muster into pouring himself into the weave and using it to create a wraith of himself, something that could fly threateningly at Kazmul to delay the man's spell hurling. Rava's gasp told him he'd succeeded in gathering enough of the weave to create something rising and ghostly and visible, but everything was going dim. He, he lacked the strength, lost in the darkening depths of this damnable pain, to, to... The wraith wavered, started to collapse back into air like drifting smoke, and El put the last of himself into a fierce mind shout. It's up to ye now, Lair, if ye can hear me. And ye too, Lady of the Staff, I'm done. And he gave the last of himself to the weave. El, El, hang on! Laryl's mind cry thundered through the weave, and something that might have been El seemed to wink and flash in the distance, as if turning to heed her. 
Yet the wraith was falling to the rubble in front of Rava, fading and collapsing like so much discarded emptiness. If Elminster Omar still existed, he was gone for now, lost and scattered, riding the weave as she so wanted to be. So it was up to her. Laryl gathered all that was herself out of the swirling flows, so addictive, so enticing, so pleasurable to be part of this endless rushing power, and plunged into the wraith, making it boil up again, rising more tangible and darker than El's feeble effort. Watchguards cried out in profane surprise, and the faces of Kazmult and Glenmar tightened with fear. I am the open lord of Waterdeep. Laryl mind thundered at them all, drawing the strength from the weave to make her voice audible. Watch, guards, do you dare attack my friends who are loyal to the deep? Strike rather at these mages who serve only themselves. Kazmult was readying a spell now, fingers flashing, so Laryl flung her wraith self at him. Shadowy arms outstretched, head darkening and shaping dragon-like, so she had jaws to gape at him, eyes starting to blaze. A spell she did not know, slicing blades of force that crackled with lightning, melted into whirling existence and raced at her, washing over and through her. All it did was impart an unpleasant tingling. Kazmult tried flame next, face fearful. And then, out of its fierce conflagration, she was upon him, buffeting and blinding him with all the dust and debris she could whirl up, but unable to harm him more. This. It seemed as if a window opened in her mind then, and she was handed a memory not her own, of calling on the weave to twist the magic of others and drain their energies into herself. She realized Kazmult's last two spells had vanished so swiftly in her wake because this had been done to them, and she already knew by whom. His taste was all over the memory. L, she thought. So this is how you do that. Why did you never teach me this? She'd instinctively drawn away from Kazmult as the memory blossomed, not wanting him to ever have an inkling of how to work with the weave and the man seized the instant given him to claw out a wand. Lightning snarled from it, and down the room, snatching a quivering watchguard off his feet and then stabbing at a masked lord, where the bolt ricocheted off his enchanted helm, it forked into half a dozen crackling, clawing smaller bolts. Careful. That thought was faint and wavering, but it was definitely Elminster. Laryl sent him wordless, joyous affection and rushed at Kazmult again. He gave the room lightning again, a desperate outpouring that flung Waratra against a wall and made her dance involuntarily along it, limbs quivering, toppled two watchguards with smoke rising from them, and lit up the two masked lords like torches. They barely had time to shriek before they fell. And then Laryl was upon him, burying him under weave flows, battering down his limbs so he could barely cling to the wand, let alone aim it, shoving against his chest so he panted to draw breath. The wand exploded. Laryl was flung away, feeling fresh pain rip through her, and then the dissipating energies sank into the weave and left her stronger and she turned to face the howling Kazmult, whose hands were now ruined claws he was wringing and hunching over, face a red ruin too, and called on the weave carefully, not hurrying, to power a spell. A force cage formed around the stricken wizard. So easy. So dangerous, El warned weakly. Too much, and ye burn the air around us, leaving it dead to magic in a trice. That is the sin in Mistress' regard. So use sparingly, Laryl thought back. Aye, I'm going to make an exception, she told him, and turned to the rubble that buried them both. It rose gently into the air, as Mert and watch guards and the others gaped, and uncovered what looked like a crumpled, shattered Laryl, but was really L, 
or rather the latest borrowed body L had reshaped into his own, and a smear of blood and one severed hand that was all that was left of her own body. Laryl quietly melted those remains away. Gently she floated the broken false Laryl body out and over to the desk, and then let the rubble fall again, and poured weave energies carefully into healing and making whole. There are limits, L warned faintly. No bringing back from death. Mistra now reserves that for herself. Laryl nodded, intent on restoring every last ravage to his body. He'd shaped her more sleek and unblemished than she was, she judged critically. Probably the way I looked when he last saw me unclad, rising from Kelvin's side and the bed in Blackstaff Tower. She altered the body to match what she looked like these days, ignored the blood stains and scorch marks and half-destroyed garments, but took the opportunity to trim nails and clean hair, because she couldn't remember the last time she'd had time to spare for such fripperies, and then drifted down into it. That first breath was agony. L, she thought, nettled. Why did you not warn me? If ye remember to expand thy lungs first, he thought wryly, that first breath hurts not at all. Bastard, she sent affectionately and sat up. Just two watch guards were still standing. So were Mert and Jalister and Dunblade and Rava, but the two young lads looked battered, to put it politely. Laryl sent them all healing weave energy. It was wonderful to see them straighten as the pain left them, but Rava went straight to Waratra's sprawled body and froze. Like the two masked lords who weren't masked lords at all so far as Laryl could tell, and one of the unfortunate watch guards, Waratra was as cooked as a well-turned roast. Rava turned a face that held no hope to Laryl. Lady? I fear not, Laryl replied. Only the direct hand of a god can bring her back, and I believe I'm in enough trouble with Mistra right now that even if I pleaded, my entreaties would go unheard. L, she thought, have you any idea what Cassander is up to right now? His reply was a mental shrug and the thought, Trace him. Laryl turned, walked to where the floor was clear of rubble, and called up the weave only to have the empty air in front of her suddenly fill with a furious Vajra Sapphire, the black staff flaring with fell radiances in her hand. Not so fast, traitor, she snapped. I don't know who you really are, but Lady Silverhand, you are not. I felt her die. Raising the fragment of the black staff over her head, she snarled, And now so shall you. It had taken her what seemed a soul-stripping forever to awaken the Blackstaff again. She'd thought at it and cast spells at it and daubed her blood and spittle on it, all to no avail, and finally abandoned her attempts as something she'd no more time for just now and turned to the powers of Blackstaff Tower itself to scry across the city where a nigh-blinding outpouring of magical power up in Northward had riveted her attention, just in time to see lightning die away, leaving two masked lords of the city in full regalia dead. So this must be the slayer of lords they'd been seeking, as she'd felt and heard Laryl's dying agony herself. This Laryl couldn't be the real one. She'd rushed around the tower gathering an arsenal of magic items to gird herself with in breathless haste, and when she'd snatched up the last one, a staff of frost she'd never thought she'd ever have cause to touch, she'd turned to find the black staff floating in midair nigh her shoulder, awake and silently in rapport with her as if nothing had ever happened. She would never understand the art if she lived to be three hundred and studied it hard every day. That thought brought a feeling of silent amusement that certainly wasn't hers. Vajra froze, heart pounding until she realized it must be coming from the Blackstaff. 
Mistra, thy wonders, she whispered aloud, shaking her head. And then she took the black staff into her hand and made the preparations for battle. So when she teleported to that ruined building in Northward, her magical arsenal came with her, floating in a cloud around her, linked and controlled by the black staff. Whoever this false Laryl was, she or he was formidable, and so shouldn't be given a moment to muster magic against her. With her denunciation still ringing in the air, a hitherto never used wand of magic missiles flared like a tiny star and crumbled to nothing as Vadra drained it, hurling all of its energy into a volley of streaking blue-white bolts. Reliable death to lessen, if not dispatch, an imposter and they all hit home. Yet Laryl merely smiled, standing seemingly unharmed. If anything, she seemed somehow bigger and brighter. Not that Vajra was waiting to savor her own dismay. The staff of frost floating above her left shoulder flared into life and unleashed a roaring cone of frigid air at her foe, who smiled waved her arms back and forth in the air like a tavern dancer, and somehow, without casting a spell that Vajra could see, though surging magic crackled in the air all around them, caught Vajra's magic and hurled it back, not at her, but at the floating black staff, as a beam of sparkling whiteness that howled its way through the air. When it struck, the black staff screamed. The staff of frost and several of the smaller floating items of Vadra's arsenal burst, shards flying everywhere, as Vadra tumbled in the air amid them, clutching at her head as it exploded into raw red pain that precipitated a flurry of involuntary confused memories, one melded with another in a meaningless and bewildering chaos. Out of which... She dragged herself with a snarl, and with clenched teeth and pounding head told the black staff to awaken the staff of thunder and lightning she brought along to unleash a lightning strike. The black staff shuddered. It had fallen silent after its shriek, but now let out what Vajra could only think of as a groan, and flared with brief radiance that was echoed an instant later by the staff, which spat a leaping lightning bolt. Death that the false Laryl leaned smilingly forward to embrace as it crackled and played around her. Then she did something with all that energy that Vadra couldn't see or understand. Baffled and furious, fear rising, how could this be happening? Who is this? Will she survive this battle? Vadra called on the Blackstaff to echo her mightiest spell, a meteor swarm. It almost deafened her, twice, hurling her back against the rear wall as the fiery tumult raged down the shell of Fantilver investments blackening the shattered walls, and leaving a scorched Vadra facing an unharmed Laryl, who stood calmly facing her, with Mert and the others standing untouched behind. That's what she'd spun the earlier spell energies into, some sort of shield. Vadra's foe calmly lifted a hand, and the black staff, which had slid down the wall with Vadra to the floor, rose and began to glow. And Vadra found her arms couldn't move, nor her mouth. The last of her arsenal of enchanted things from the tower vanished from around her, and a voice said gently in the depths of her mind, Lady Vadra, have done. You mean well but have been sorely mistaken. I am Laryl Silverhand. Please stop before I am forced to destroy you. This sounded like Laryl right enough, but still, Vadra would not soon forget that dying cry. That had been real. And sudden ire kindled in her. She was sick of losing, of being bested, of being surprised at every turn. She was the Lady Mage of Waterdeep, Frastit, the Lady of the Staff, the Black Staff. She reached out with her mind and will, hot with rising anger, and called on the Black Staff to free her, to slice away whatever power was holding her arms and mouth immobile. 
The black staff soared into the air, flickered with black flame, and she could move again. Vadra raced to grasp it, chased by a tiny distant mind voice saying disgustedly, Ye learn one new trick, and now ye're going to repeat it and repeat it and call this victory. Bah! That was Elminster unmistakably, but the black staff was soaring into the sky, up through where the roof of the building had been. Vajra clung to it stubbornly, fighting for control of it with this foe who wore the likeness of Laryl, who was somehow controlling the staff without having worked a spell. Vajra have done. That was not Laryl, all stern and commanding. Never, Vajra snarled back aloud and with her mind hot with fury now. Speak no treason to me. Very well. I'm too busy to reason with you now, so be gone. And the black staff raced high into the air in a great arc as Vajra desperately flung her arms around it to keep from losing hold and falling, a plunge that would surely be to her death from this height and wind-whistling speed. She was sailing away over the city, hurtling to her doom, the black staff utterly ignoring her attempts to slow or steer it. Sorry, Vajra managed to cry aloud, hoping she'd been wrong and it was Laryl, after all, who might hear her and somehow relent and release the staff and let her. And even as the shout left her lips and was whirled away in her wake, control of the black staff was hers again. Oh, Mistra. Now, if she called on it thus to power a teleport into safe and familiar Blackstaff Tower before she crashed into anything. She was plunging down the descending side of the arc now, and some of the spires and chimneys were flashing past uncomfortably close. Something moved ahead of her, something large and dark and solid. It was responding somehow to the staff, and Vadra only just had time to recognize that what she was seeing was the walking statue known as the Great Drunkard, as it, amid a great groaning of stone and terrified screams from Gralkin's tankard, the tavern in its lap, as the floor abruptly tilted and the walls around them started to crack, reached up one of its great stone hands to intercept her, before she crashed into that very, very solid stone, and the world went away just like that. Laryl sighed, shook her head, and said sadly, Idiot, I didn't want to have to do that. With almost impatient haste, she let go of the barriers shielding Mert and the others, and drew energy from the weave to power a teleport. She had to get to the palace now, before Cassander had time to... Rather than translocate her to the little private chamber she was picturing, the weave power rebounded and slapped her across the face with force enough to dash her flying into an indelicate rump-first meeting with some rubble. What by the mysteries of the lady? The black staff had left her a parting gift, it seemed, a hopefully temporary area where magic was roiling wild, an area that was all around her and somehow clinging to her. Why now and why me? Seething, Laryl staggered to her feet, her head ringing. She could barely see, couldn't feel the weave flows at all now. She was dazed and numb. She reeled like a drunkard sideways into the wall, rebounded off it, and when she determinedly kept walking, found herself crashing into it again and sliding along it, her cheek crushing a long streak through the black ash. She tried to recall some sufficiently sulfurous curses and couldn't collect her wits enough to remember any of them. Oh, gods! Not now, not now! She was outside the ruined building now, out in the street, and she knew vaguely which way the palace was. She started trudging in that direction. L, she thought dully. Any brilliant strategies? We're in no condition to trade spells with anyone. If we arrive at the palace and get into any sort of fight, any sort at all, we'll be destroyed. Lass, the faint voice that was in the depths of her mind replied, we're chosen of Mistra. 
We don't turn our backs or slink away to await a better battlefield. We go in. Laryl found some curses and spat them out loudly and with feeling. I know that, L. I don't need rallying talk. I need a scheme or secret up your sleeve weapon. Give me one. L chuckled ruefully. That's right. Order me to save the day. That'll work when ye have my body and all. I've no secret weapons, lass, but as for schemes, I'm not advocating we confront Cassander and any mages he has left in some sort of spell duel. We sidle into the palace and gather whatever magic items we can before any confrontation. I'm crazed and inexorable, not a fool head. Now that's a rallying cry, Laryl snorted. So we sneak in the back way and make it up as we go along? I have every confidence in thy ability to carry that off. Tis what I've been doing for over a thousand years, lass. It must work. For you, old weird beard. For you. Laryl was dimly aware that she was heading south that she could now walk more or less upright and more or less in a straight line. The fire of roiling, dancing agony in her head and the fog of confusion wrapped around it told her not to attempt any weave work or, for that matter, spell casting for a while yet. There was so little left of El's boots that she was practically walking barefoot on the cobbles, and his robes were such scorched rags that she wasn't all that far from naked either which explained the many curious looks she was getting. Who's that, mother? The voice was young and from behind her, not far away to her left. You're in water deep, dear. It's probably some high coin lass who got drunk and rolled into someone's hearth fire. Just look the other way and hurry past. And a block later, who's the half-naked, half-scorched lady? Dunno, but I like what I can see of her, and I can see a lot of her. It took another block before she ran into a watch patrol. Luckily, the duty-watchful order mage walking with the watch guards recognized her even before the watch could issue a challenge. Lady Silverhand, what's happened? Treason, Laryl said grimly. I need you to use your horns to summon other patrols until at least three mages are gathered together, four or five would be better, and go to Tarneth Street, three doors east of the high road where you'll find the smoldering remnants of a building. Look for two force cages there and take into custody the two wizards inside them. One of them is Eminder Glenmar, but take no commands from him. His treachery is clear. Drug them into slumber if you must, but at all costs keep them alive but unable to work magic or escape until I can deal with them. Oh, and be warned, magic is going wild in the ruin right now so the force cages may have failed, or have done strange things to Glenmar or Kazmult, or... Kazmult, did you say? The watchful order mage gulped. Laryl smiled thinly, stepped around him, and repeated to the watch guards, Use your horns. Then she walked on without looking back. Behind her, the horns blared out. The entire city now knows I'm a lord. Someone is going to pay for this. Brathen Kazander knew that voice. The shouting man was Lamech Heerler Post, enraged but with fear swamping his anger. Is the crazed witch Laryl having us all beheaded? Open fear in that cry, followed by wild curses and babbled orders that were obviously being ignored by the impassive watch guards hustling Heerler Post along. At Kazander's orders, of course, and with him, all of them converging in their own ring of watch escorts, unmasked fellow lords Gruthgar Hrimral, Kasalra Maremther, and Sarathlu Surendragon the first two looking as angry and frightened as Heerler Post felt, but Surendragon seemingly calmed. Various nobles and guildmasters were crowding in, too. Why are they here? Heerler Post demanded furiously. By what right are they being admitted? There should be citizens to witness what's likely coming, a senior watch officer replied. What? 
Just what is likely coming? But there came no reply as they were all hustled in through the doors of the Lord's Moot, the huge floor oil reeking chamber where Brathen Kazander, his identity hidden beneath his full helm mask and complete formal vestments, was standing alone atop the great meeting table, grandly addressing his growing audience. He was good at full-on doom-laden haranguing if he said so himself. He spread his arms now as the watch brought in another fearful and angry lord, one of the newly voted ins, the wealthy merchant investor Halark Tarncrown, and raised his voice over Tarncrown's loud demands to know what was going on. A dark threat lies upon our fair city, he thundered. An evil monster masquerading as Lady Laryl Silverhand is on the verge of ruling us all beginning a reign of murder and tyranny that threatens every one of us and every last member of our families, too. A murmur of alarm and consternation arose, and Cassander cut through it with a bellow. This foul beast has killed and impersonated the real Lady Silverhand. The only way to foil its diabolical plan is to remove Laryl Silverhand as open lord, by open public vote, here and now. Chapter 29 The Howling of One Angry Man Hark, I hear a curious sound, ringing off yonder keep. Tis not the roar of a triumphant raider, nor yet a dying scream, but the howling of one angry man. Prince Merdelan, in Act Two, Scene Six of the play One Crown Cheaply Bought, by Dara Olthlone, playwright of Melvaunt, first performed in the year of the Prince. Sister, you smell like Elminster. Dove sounded more amused than disapproving. That's because I am Elminster, Laryl told her. I walk in his body that he altered to look like mine. You lost yours? Silene did sound disapproving. Careless of you. Careless is my latest tactic. Hmm, needs work. Down, girl. Later. Busy saving water deep right now. Where's Kazander? Making speeches in the Lord's Moot, where at least four other lords have been hustled in by the watch, Silene sounded grim. A lot of the courtiers and palace servants Cassandra's bought are in that room, Dove added. We go to see more of what's unfolding. We're expecting a grand entrance from you, so make it good. Such supportive sisters I have, Laryl sighed, but they were gone. She was alone, well, as alone as a girl could be in L's body with L, again, as she skulked through the back passages of the palace. Cassander sounded ready for her, with the few enchanted items she'd managed to snap up on her way through the behind end of the palace be enough. Lass, we just can't take the time to go and pluck up more. This particular armory will have to do. Well, at least L sounded calm. Yet her gloom didn't lift. All she had was a pale lavender iune stone, a ring of spell storing that contained a lone spell, wall of force, and two potions, one of healing and one of gaseous form. This isn't going to go well, she thought. The trick, L thought back, is to make Cassandra think it hasn't gone well, that's all. Ah, uh, but how? We'll do what we always do, stumble along and improvise. That hasn't worked out all that well recently. Do we have any other choice, Lair? A vote must be taken right here and right now. Cassander was in full and confident career. To stop this menace, Laryl Silverhand must be removed as open lord of this city. Before her imposter can get here and work dark sorcery on us. What dark sorcery? a baffled courtier demanded crossly. If a monster is eaten and replaced the Lady Silverhand, isn't her magic gone with her? 
Seize that man, Cassander bellowed by way of reply, pointing at the courtier. He must be in league with her. Some watch officers hesitated and then started forward only to be dragged back by others. The warden's standing orders about obeying the arbitrary commands of lords, remember? Cassander heard this and yelled, Yes, the warden, the missing warden. Someone Laryl blasted to ashes so she could rule unimpeded. Did none of you notice that? Wonder about that? This man, one noble at the back of the room muttered to another, is mad. Most Water Davian commoners are, the second noble replied. They just don't get as good audiences as this one's managed. I'm waiting for Laryl to show and the spells to start flying. I call the vote, Cassander cried, his voice echoing back off the rafters. Shall we dismiss Lair? No! That shout came from Laryl's seneschal, Talon Telfeather, standing in the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder press of courtiers over by the north wall of the Lord's Moot. As there are now seventeen lords of Waterdeep, not counting the Lady Silverhand herself nor the returned one Mert, a winning vote to depose Lady Silverhand must be no less than nine lords. Listen not to this blatant delaying tactic, Cassander tried to shout Telfeather down. This man may be Silverhand's stooge, but would the rest of you defy the clear will of the lords? The vote makes clear the will of the lords, Telfeather shot back. Not your blustering. We have clear rules, and I stand firm that they be followed. Any attempt to set them aside will be treason. You dare accuse a lord of the city of treason? Watch, arrest that man. No, the nearest officer barked and looked to the ranking watch officer, who boomed. We shall have the rule of law, not the howling of one angry man who wants his own way. There will be a vote only when there's quorum present. Nine are needed, and I see only six lords here. The words had scarcely left his lips when one pair of rear doors into the lord's moot banged open, and a seventh lord, another new face, the moneylender Zareth Kelterand, was brought in. Cassander had scarcely drawn breath for a triumphant comment when the other rear doors swung wide, and yet another new lord, the shipping fleet owner Perengol Yuskalant, was hustled in by his watch escorts. And then a concealed inner door opened on the other inner side of the room, and a lone figure stepped through it without an escort. It was Laryl Silverhand, smeared and scorched with her robes half burnt off her. Utter silence fell. Laryl knew better than to pause to make her entrance grander. She headed straight for the great meeting table, specifically straight for the center of its arc where Cassander was standing, and found her strides suddenly something she had to fight to accomplish, every muscle trembling. Her mind was under an abrupt, silent, and brutal mental assault from an unseen foe. A... a mind flare. Sathul, she heard Elminster's voice say in grim challenge from the very back of her mind. Well met. There was a surge of surprise from the dark and powerful mind weighing on hers, and then a roiling of memories as warring sentiences thrust at each other, grappled and stabbed anew and that searing agony returned, soaring through her until she whimpered. Mistress Prohibition Pain was back, besetting Elminster but ravaging Laryl's brain, too. And, she realized with satisfaction, El had found a way, by wrapping his thoughts around the illithids, of being felt by it as well. There came a last frantic flurry from the Mind Flayer, and then a sort of pulsing, struggling silence, which was broken by a clearly pain-racked L. I can trammel him for a time. He's never had a mind embrace his before. Cassander, however, remains thine. Her head felt like it had been bounced off unyielding stone walls, and rippling surges of mistress agony still jolted her at every step. So Laryl staggered and swayed, 
and kept on coming. A meeting of the Lords and a vote? I'm glad I didn't miss this, she told the room crisply. So, who called this meeting and why? I did, Cassander snarled from atop the table. To have you voted out of office, imposter. Imposter? When did this happen, and however did I happen to miss it? Those words brought her to the table, and Laryl started to clamber up onto it, not easy with head pounding. Cassander came rushing, shuffling his feet as he arrived so as to aim a vicious kick at her head. Laryl swayed back to let his boot whistle past her nose, then caught hold of his foot and twisted, putting all her weight and strength into a roll of her body. Cassander toppled like a tree and crashed heavily to the tabletop, cracking an elbow and letting out a roar of pain as he bounced. Laryl ducked beyond the range of his flailing feet and managed to get atop the table while he was wallowing. As she raced for him, he clambered up to his hands and knees, his back to her and unaware of all but his anger and the curses it was making him spit. Laryl caught hold of his flaring metal lord's collar, wrenched ruthlessly, and then snatched off his helm. The lord's moot echoed with a sudden collective gasp. Unmasking a lord was not done. How dare you, woman! Cassander snarled, making a grab for the helm in her hands. Laryl flung it in his face, knocking him back onto his behind again. As we were speaking of impostors, Braith and Cassander, she told him coldly, I just wanted to make sure I was speaking to the real one. I should hate to publicly accuse the wrong man. Accuse me of what? he scoffed. What desperate tactic is this? As he found his feet again, he drew a dagger. Keep back, everyone, Laryl snapped. Yon blade is poisoned. It is nothing of the sort, he sneered. Oh, then prick your little finger with it. Just a tiny nick. Cassander's hesitation was so brief that only those nearest could have seen it. And then he was shaking his head almost sorrowfully as he resheathed the dagger. No, no, none of your tricks, no distractions, false open lord. You are not, Laryl Silverhand. You are a shape-shifting monster seeking to become the tyrant of Waterdeep. I am, Laryl, Laryl repeated levelly, and you are the one seeking to rule Waterdeep by having lord after lord murdered and replaced by lords you control. Ha! Prove it! I can help with that, a new voice rang out from the rear doors. Tashin Melshimber had just come through them with Drake at her back. You hired me to kill lords of this city, Braithen Kazander. By all the gods, Kazander exclaimed grandly to the crowd, spreading his hands dramatically. I'm beset by lying women this day, it seems. Why would I hire some disaffected, wild-blood young noblewoman to do anything? And if I was trying to have anyone killed, why a noble? Everyone knows they can't keep secrets. I can prove what I say, Tashin said firmly, looking around her to meet the surprised gazes of nobles, guildmasters, and staring lords. Regardless of what this villain claims, so hear me. Drake? Cassander said quietly. Tashin turned. Darleth Drake was standing right behind her with a dagger in his hand. It was one of her own missing blades, so she knew it was poisoned. He raised it, point gleaming. Sathul reeled and almost fell, shoulders quivering. An astonished Belvara of Asmodeus turned and thrust herself against him, trying to hold him up by awkwardly pinning him against the wall of the dark passage. Sathul's eyes bulged as he stared at her, betraying his startlement. She was trying to be gentle. The caresses that followed banished all doubt. She was trying to comfort him. Through the frustration, the exhaustion... 
the speaking stone emitted a despairing, descending, wordless babble as he tried to force thoughts through it faster than it could translate them into speech. Satul dismissed its use with a wave of disgust. His thought, when it burst into Balvara's head, conveyed the same pain and exhaustion of a man's gasp. I've beaten him, but I can't destroy him. He clings, he clings and just keeps fighting and calling on the weave. Can't break his connection to it. So we get out there and destroy his body, Balvara snapped excitedly, before he breaks free and does you worse harm. No, a new voice hissed at them out of the darkness. Belvara whirled, a slender blade suddenly in her hand, but the source of that voice, a maid in palace livery, was standing just out of reach. The maid pulled down her blouse to reveal a glowstone hanging pendant on a chain, depending from a far more innocent luck charm riding higher in her cleavage where it could be seen. And by the light of that glowstone, they could see another chain ran down from the glowstone almost to her navel, and at the end of that chain hung a third and lowest gem. A glossy hemisphere of black opal that had tiny metal eye stalks raking back from its edges, the whirlpool symbol of the Xanathar. The gem was glowing, and out of it came the oily voice of the Xanathar speaking under common. Kazandar has gone too far, so I have new orders for you both. Drake's dagger was raised on high, but he was looking at Kazandar, not Tashin. No, he said simply, and flung the dagger down. Tashin's eyes couldn't help but follow it as it bit into the oiled wooden floor and quivered there, upright and deadly. What? Kazander roared. Your blood bond compels you. I love the Lady Melshimber. I will defend her, not slay her, and I stand here now to attest to the truth of her words. Kazander looked disgusted and wrenched a tiny vial from around his neck, the delicate thread that held it parting in a trice. Snarling a magical word, he dashed it to the tabletop. The high, ringing tones of its shattering were lost in sudden leaping flames as its contents blazed up, and Darleth Drake shuddered, convulsed, and backed away from Tashin, or tried to as he spat out flames. What he did instead was stumble and fall, limbs spasming as more fire leaked out of him. Tashin wondered wildly where her nearest healing potion might be. He was fighting to look up at her, struggling to say something. Love you, Drake gasped before he collapsed and the flames leaped up. His eyeballs sizzled and popped, his skin darkened, shriveled and shrank in a racing destruction as a reek like roast boar arose under Tashin's nose, and she stood in helpless horror, flexing her hands but finding nothing for them to do. Her drake was doomed. Her drake was dead. And as she burst into tears that spat and sizzled in the flames that kept her from even embracing him, Tashin realized how her world had darkened forever. She had loved him, this man, and had now lost everything. Everything at all. Behind her up on the table, Lord Kazander laughed. So ho ho perish all traitors! Except you, perhaps? An angry voice, a woman's voice, hissed in one of his ears. He whirled, but no one was there. He'd walked away from Laryl, and she was now a good ten steps from him, at least. Boo! Another woman spoke in his other ear. Braithen Kazander recognized neither of them, having never heard Dove or Silune speak, but guessed this must be some trick Chosen could play. He batted the air wildly around him to be rid of the voices, realizing as he did so how ridiculous or unhinged this would make him look. That fueled fresh rage. 
He strode down the arc of the table to its end, stepped down onto a chair he'd never considered himself a lowly enough lord to occupy, and shoved courtiers and servants out of the way as he headed for the wall. Or rather, a gong on the wall. And now, he snarled, striking the gong with his gauntleted fist, I've had quite enough of this. In answer to the gong's ring, doors along that wall flew open and various palace servants peered out through them with loaded crossbows in their hands. Seeing Cassander, they looked to him for orders. Feather anyone who tries to get me, he commanded, waving at all the nobles, guildmasters, watchguards, courtiers, and servants in the room. Anyone! Fire at their heads! Then he took something from a pouch affixed inside the metal cuff plate of one of his gauntlets, turned to address those same folk, and sneered, All of you are standing in a chamber whose magnificent floor was freshly oiled yester-eve at my orders, so you can all burn. He whirled, drew back his arm, and hurled what he was holding straight at Laryl who had guessed what he might be about to do, though not his target, and readied the ring she wore. So when his nine-bead necklace of fireballs came arcing toward her face, it met the wall of force she'd called out of the ring, rebounded almost as hard as it had come, struck the table, and burst. That part of the table and the room beyond where the table most closely approached the south wall, an area crowded with Cassander and many others, erupted in shattering flame, the table riven asunder in a storm of flaming shards and splinters. Everywhere in the room, frightened folk started to scream and run. Flames snarled up the tapestries along the south wall, burned bodies that had been hurled against them tumbled back to the floor and Lord Brathen Cassander picked himself up off the floor beyond the blazing table, apparently unharmed despite his smoldering vestments. Armor of fire resistance, he sneered, gesturing at what he was wearing underneath as the spreading flames revealed it. Two watchguards dared to charge him through the flames, but Cassander's co-opted palace servants, aiming their crossbows from the open doorways, took them down. Cassander went to that wall, walked along it out of the flames to the large hanging map of the trades ward that adorned it, and did something that made the map swing open like a door to reveal a storage niche behind it, out of which he took a staff. A staff of the Magi, he gloated, hefting it. It's amazing what treasures are just sitting around the palace awaiting anyone who bothers to look for them. He turned to level the staff at Laryl, just as there came a peculiar groan from the back of the now empty storage niche. Cassander spun back to face the niche just in time to see that the groaning was coming from a long disused panel. The back of the storage niche was swinging open and into it, out of the darkness beyond, stepped a lithe and slender dark woman. She was dark-haired, dark-eyed, and dark of skin, and she wore form-fitting black clothing and high black boots. Belvara Bowmantle at your service once more, Brathen, she purred, and through the opening behind her stepped a mind flayer in dark high-collared robes. The sight of it dragged dismayed curses out of watchguards and nobles all over the Lord's moot. Are we too late to the revel? the agent of Asmodeus asked sweetly. Ah, added Sathul through his speaking stone gorget. I see we're not. Good, good. Cassander smiled. You're in time to watch me slaughter these fools, he told them, turning back toward Laryl to aim at her again. With that? Belvara asked, pointing at the staff, as Sathul stepped around her and drove a needle-thin poisoned blade right through the Lord's neck from behind. <coughs> Brathen Cassander gurgled, eyes bulging in astonishment and agony. 
Belvara brought a hand crossbow out from behind her back and coolly took down the only palace servant who looked likely to let loose with his crossbow. Then she stepped around Cassander so his body shielded her from the other crossbow holders, plucked the staff out of Cassander's failing hands, and tossed it into the rising flames. We took the real one more than a year ago, she informed the dying lord and left that duplicate, mere carved and painted wood bearing not the slightest magic at all, in its place. Check and recheck, foolish man. Don't just check once. As she calmly recocked and reloaded her blowgun, Cassander turned to flee. He managed only two steps before sagging to his knees, his face going purple. His eyes bulged and stared, pupils so large almost no whites showed, and yellow foam spilled from his mouth. And think more than once, Sathul told him. Your mad hunger for power has cost you your life and ruined all our schemes. We prefer Waterdeep as it is. Then the Mind Flayer looked out over the flames at everyone else in the Lord's Moot, his gaze fixing longest on Laryl as his speaking stone flashed and the peculiar voice emanating from it rose in volume to carry clearly across the room. We'll be going now, he announced crisply. If anyone is as foolish as Cassander here and tries to stop us, they'll share his fate. If we're chased and taken down, Belvara added, the dooms we've prepared and left ready will be unleashed, and plague will grip Waterdeep. Into the shocked silence that followed those words, a watch officer barked, Ready, bows! to the watch guards all around the chamber, and Jalister and Dunblade rushed through the flames at Belvara and the Mind Flayer swords raised only to falter and reel as Sathul mind-blasted them, leaving them stunned. Belvara put her next crossbow bolt into the face of the watch officer who'd barked the ready order, and then she and the illithid, moving in smooth unison, pounced on Jalister and Dunblade. Holding the limp-limbed pair as body shields against any archery, the Mind Flayer and the agent of Asmodeus headed back toward the panel to make their escape. Both Jalister and Dunblade tried to struggle, limbs weak and clumsy at first, their swords clanging down out of numbed and weak hands. Belvara deftly swung around behind Jalister, one arm wrapped around his throat and the other darting stiff-fingered to specific spots that made his hands go burningly nerveless, but Dunblade wrenched free of the mind flare, slicing its tentacles with a dagger. Sathul tossed its head in pain and drove its intact tentacles into Dunblade's ears, and the young man quivered horribly, ululating and clawing the air vainly as the Mind Flayer mind-tapped and drained. Whereupon Laryl gathered all the weave strength she could from around her, and the magic baubles she still bore, and attacked Sathul mind to mind. Mr. Forbids, Dub thought at her, she can punish me if she sees fit, Laryl thought back grimly. Me, I think saving thousands upon thousands from plague, more if they flee the city and carry it with them to infect thousands more all across Faerun, is worth the transgression. As a startled Sathul stiffened and turned to face Laryl, the air between them, above the now dwindling flames licking up from the polished floorboards, blossomed into a brief blue-white star. Out of it stepped Vajra Safar, the seventh black staff of Waterdeep, with the staff whose title she bore blazing black fire in her hands. A walking statue caught me and held me, she hissed, and so I live. Die, whoever you are, my would-be slayer. The black staff roared forth ravening dark fire. The cozy room was lined with shelves crammed with all manner of books except for where the door was and the fieldstone chimney and hearth rose. The wizard Morden Canaan was sitting at ease in a worn and comfortable old overstuffed chair beside the fire, reading. 
He was smiling and even chuckling as he turned the pages, and had been for some time, when he suddenly sat bolt upright, eyes gleaming as he stared across the room at nothing, his current chapbook falling from his hand. Elminster? he snapped. What are you up to? Is that a mind flare? Then he winced, shook his head, looked down at the large goblet of wine balanced on one arm of the chair, a glass he'd been trying to empty slowly after El's last sarcastic comments, acquired a look of disgust, and dashed its contents into the fire. He shook his head again and retrieved his book. Now, where was I? He flipped pages quickly until he found the right one. Oh, yes, the fourteenth dastardly Cormirian noble and the young lady from Sambia with the volcanically erupting breastworks. The fire from the black staff crashed into an unseen barrier halfway along the smoldering great table, a barrier it snarled up, curled around, and consumed, fading greatly as it did so. That attack, and the time it took to destroy the wall of force, gave Belvara the moments she needed to shove Jalister away and dart back into and through the niche she'd come in by. Laryl left off her attempts to mind-fight the Illithid and called on what she knew of the Black Staff's enchantments, quelling its dark fire in an instant. A moment later, she'd seized control of the staff which thrummed eerily under her governance and hurled it across the room, towing Vadra, who'd clung to it desperately trying to regain mastery of what she held, through the air. The Lady of the Staff was still trying to impose her will on the hurtling fragment, when it brought her into a bone-shattering collision with the Mind Flayer whom it pierced and pinned to the wall. Suthul writhed in pain, impaled on the staff, and held grindingly against the unyielding stones by the enchanted fragment that still sought to race on through both illithid and stone wall. The Mind Flayer was still struggling, tentacles flailing in pain, when Laryl charged up to it, caught two of those tentacles in her hand, and severed them with her belt dagger. Into the burst of mental anguish that followed she surged, ruthlessly invading the Olithid's mind on her own rising tide of pain, for Mistra's dictates were not to be defied, yet Dove and Silune drove in with her. When Laryl had sliced off all the tentacles, she flung the dagger away so she couldn't possibly be coerced into stabbing herself, and bored on into the fell and pain-racked mind. Her own agony was surging, but it took mere moments to pierce the creature's outermost current racing thoughts and learn that this talk of a plague trap was all lies, and to confirm all of Cassander's perfidy. This creature called itself Sethul, and it had finally managed to overcome and enthrall Elminster. But that control was now slipping under the goad of its physical pain at the severed tentacles, and under Laryl's faltering assault. She was reeling herself now, at the dazed limits of what she could bear to do, but burned her way deeper into Sathul's mind, showing no mercy. It recoiled, writhing, and relinquished control of Elminster, and then she forced it to reluctantly confess its ruse aloud to the room through its speaking stone. Yet she was beyond agony by then, and drowning in a yellow haze that flooded her mind. She had pushed too far, defied Mistress Dictates too much, and... Sathul broke free of her with a hiss of triumph and reached for her throat. Chapter 30 End game. Skilled players at dice and cards and board, and murmuring courtiers drifting about thrones both smilingly speak of the end game when all is decided and something is won. But inevitably, far more is lost. I am no fan of end games. The wizard Vangerdehast said in open court in the royal palace of Suzale in the spring of the year of the prince. A loud gasp sounded in Laryl's left ear. It was Dove, collapsing into the weave under the same pain still raging in Laryl's head. 
Silene went away a moment later, leaving behind her own sigh in Laryl's right ear. As Sethul, trembling with rage and pain, tightened its long, taloned hands about her throat. Laryl couldn't even struggle, so weak. The last of her control over the black staff faded. It left off trying to ram its way through the illithid into the wall and fell. Right onto Sethul's foot, it bounced off with a thud. The Mind Flayer flinched at the pain but let go of Laryl and snatched for the black staff. Such power. Pouncing on the enchanted thing, the Illithid turned the dark fragment eagerly in its hands, trying through its pain to understand how to master it, to heal itself, to blast all foes, to... Vajra Safar felt the fumbling tugging at the black staff, the latest bid to break her own mastery of it. It seemed as if black tentacles were violating her mind, worming and grasping. She shuddered in revulsion, but the probing went on, dragging her out of the daze she'd been plunged into by her headfirst collision with the mind flare and the so-so-solid wall behind it. She was sick of being casually bested, she was sick of hurting, and she was heartily sick of seemingly everyone in all Waterdeep trying to wrest control of the Blackstaff away from her. She called on the Blackstaff. This, this mind flayer wanted the staff so much, then let it taste what it was trying to gain. Vadra lay on her face where she'd fallen right beside the Illithid. She rolled over and called up the Black Staff's black fire in one snarling surge. And Sethul had no wall of force to use as a shield. The Mind Flayer was clutching the staff with both hands, staring at it close up, mind open and straining. Suddenly erupting black fire sluiced over it like a bucket of hurled water, drenching the creature and sending it staggering backward. A hideous squalling erupted from its speaking stone until the gorget burst with a soaring shriek. Suthul fell, writhing in agony, bathed in the black staff's black flames, hands blackening but unable to let go. Until Vadra, panting her way to her feet, tore it free with her will, trailing ashes and crisped fingers in its wake as it soared up to her own waiting hands. She reclaimed it with a great sigh of relief and stepped back to see who else might need burning. Laryl waited, unable to even get up. The moment Vadra turned and saw her might be the moment before her last. Would Mistra let her sink into the weave? Or would she die here, burned by the staff the love of her life had wrought into what it now was? Ah, the gods so loved irony. Vadra turned and was trampled and bowled over in one pounding racing instant, struck senseless against the floor, the black staff bouncing away like so much thudding timber. Her destroyer had been the lad called Jalister, charging blindly forward with tears streaming down his contorted face, rushing to his lover. The drooling, now witless staggerer who'd been Feral Dunblade. Fair! he cried, taking hold of the taller Dalesman. Fair! He shook Dunblade violently, screaming the man's name, but the shambling thing he was clutching didn't even focus its eyes on him, let alone speak. Jalister looked around wildly, saw Laryl lying on the floor, and rushed to her. Lady! he sobbed. Lady, can you help? Fair is... is... Laryl could barely lift her hand, but she managed to put her fingers on Jalister's nearest boot. She tried to stroke it soothingly, as it was all she could reach. Jalister, she managed to say, I can't help. No one can. Fair is... gone. Jalister threw back his head and howled. No! he screamed, and raced to his fallen sword and snatched it up and pounced on the feebly writhing mind flare and hacked and hewed. Until someone stout came wheezing through the dying flames to take the sword from his hands and guide him to Laryl's chair at the ravaged great table. Easy, lad, Mert rumbled. Easy now. 
Then he stiffened and growled in sudden pain as the bloody thing on the floor behind him lashed out at his mind. Anger kindled in Laryl, and she tried to gather weave energy enough to slap at the mind flayer, but couldn't, reeling under new pain. Suddenly, Elminster was awake at the back of her mind again, and smiling. Steady, he thought at her, and gave her the anchor she needed. It hurt, Mistra bleed, but it hurt, yet Laryl grimly took hold of the weave, clawing energy from it like a child with broken fingers trying to retrieve so many scattered and fallen wet grapes, and gathered that power, Mistra's pain rising with it, but L tugging at it, drawing it into himself so she could go on. And Laryl took that power, set to spinning in front of her, made it catch flame, and sent it around the Lord's Moot, fearful water Davians scrambling out of its way to drink in the last of the flames that Cassander had caused, snuffing them by taking them in. And when the much larger sphere trembled over her with its gathered fire, Laryl shaped it into a lance and plunged it into Sathul's mind. And then watched, feeling only grim satisfaction, as the hacked and bleeding mind flayer demonstrated that its kind could drool their witlessness too. It seemed to watch her a very long time before the boldest of the many apprehensive watch guards in the room dared to step forward and take the illithid into custody. Belvara couldn't see where they took Sathul. Her tears were nigh blinding her as she tried to go on staring into the crystal ball. Sathul, she moaned. If they spare you, I'll... I'll... Furiously, she wiped at her tears, then peered into the crystal again, but it was no use. She could see no sign of Sathul. She shook her head and whispered to the empty air, Sathul, I need you. Then she drew in a deep breath, stared at the ceiling, and fought for calm and an end to her weeping. It came gratifyingly soon, and Belvara stared into her crystal ball again and watched men and women stream out of the Lord's moot to carry out the open Lord's commands. With a sigh, she turned away. Sathul, she vowed fiercely to the empty air, I shall free you somehow and arrange a spell disguise sufficient for you to pass for human, so we can safely remain in Waterdeep, and continue to influence its future, as Asmodeus still wants me to do. And as she spoke those words, the air darkened around her, and the symbol of Asmodeus upon her breast burned like fire, then seared like ice, before a single word slid out of it, in a purring voice more amusedly malevolent than her own most vamping efforts. And that word was, Yes. The Lord's Moot was suddenly full of watchful order mages and more watch guards, and they were firmly clearing the room. Everyone hastened out, or was carried out, Cassander's loyalists among the palace staff surrendering their crossbows as stern-faced watch guards surrounded them. Only a few fled, and they didn't get far. Drink this, lad, Mert said awkwardly, slapping a flask into Jallister's hands. The empty-faced, dejected young man obeyed without thinking, and nearly choked on the fiery contents, but then drank until the flask was empty so he missed Laryl embracing the drooling Dunblade like a lover, wrapping her arms and legs around him and clinging to him. Ye get to keep my body, El told her, so long as ye steady me into this one. You haven't taken very good care of it, she said aloud, disapprovingly, but she anchored him with care, despite the pain still throbbing away within her. And the next thing Jallister knew... His lover was putting comforting arms around him and saying in Dunblade's own voice, Lad, thy Dunblade is dead, but I'll be thy friend in his place. Jallister recoiled. Elminster? Aye, and before ye go all outraged, know that I've done far worse than this. Jallister opened his mouth but said nothing because he didn't know what to say. 
Two strong but gentle and kind minds were sliding into his, trying to soothe and comfort. Lady, I'm ashamed, he thought feebly when he recognized Laryl in his head. She chuckled. Don't be. Then he recognized Elminster, who promptly handed him a memory of Dunblade laughing and telling a dirty joke that left him afloat in fresh grief. Out of which he asked inanely, What was in that flask that Mert gave me? Ye want more? Not a good idea. Elminster, Jallister asked with sudden anger, When do I get to decide what's a good idea for me, hmm? Elminster and Laryl both laughed inside his head, plunging him into more happiness than he'd ever felt before. You're going to be all right, lad, Elminster told him firmly, and I'll walk with ye for as long as ye need me to be there. Jallister drew in a deep breath. That'll be acceptable, he replied, I suppose. Strong arms went around Tasheen and folded her against a chest that didn't smell pristine, that was fat and hairy, and that contained lungs that wheezed. See? My chest is big enough for two lasses to cry down and not quite drown me, Mert rumbled. Tasheen pulled back from him enough to look around and saw that a smudged-faced dockward wench was almost shoulder to shoulder with her against Mert. Whoever this was had been crying, too. Rava, said this imp of the streets. Who are you? Tasheen, Tasheen replied through her tears. The Lady Tasheen Melshimber. And I, Mert announced, am Mert, the oldest living lord of Waterdeep. Aye, that Mert. I, I... Part of Tasheen instinctively wanted to pull herself free and announce that she had an important engagement and couldn't tarry a moment longer. But another part of her decided that she had nowhere she wanted to go, at all. She might as well stay here, in the only comforting arms that were on offer. Hey now, lasses, Mert said gently. The two of you can come home with me and rest by a good fire and shut the world out until you're ready to face it again. I've a fair library and a good wine cellar and not a bad kitchen. You do? Tasheen asked, wiping her eyes. Turning inside Mert's encircling arm, she managed to point across the Lord's moot at Laryl. I thought she took over Mert's mansion. She did, Mert confirmed and held up a key but I've just taken over Braithen Kazander's mansion. Tasheen stared at him in disbelief, and then, despite herself, started to laugh. Come, Mert told her, holding her tight. I'll have the watch deliver your man's body to the Temple of Timora. And then he reached out and corralled a sniffing Rava back into a three-way embrace and added, And we're at too. We'll see them both raised from the dead or properly interred with all reverence as if they were nobility. Both women looked at him and then burst into fresh tears and hugged him hard. Laryl drew herself up. Time to play open lord to the hilt. She surveyed the lord's moot and started issuing crisp commands to every watchful order mage and watchguard and palace courtier she could see. To the courtiers and watchguards, assemble the lords of Waterdeep here as speedily as they can be found and politely brought. Tell them all what happened and that the threat is over. When they arrive, we shall confer. Then to the mages, go and fetch the wizards Glenmar and Kazmalt to attest to their part in Kazander's schemes. They shall be turned over to the black robes for sentencing, rather than any lord of the city doing anything high-handed by attempting to punish them. Then Laryl looked to the guildmasters and nobles she could see watching from the doorways and added, Sayers and ladies, I have a request of all of you, too. I desire this assembly to be attended by all guildmasters and nobles who desire to be there, so everything shall be done in their hearing. This city belongs to all of us. It should be governed before all of us who desire to watch and listen henceforth. 
It seemed as if every noble and guildmaster there murmured approvingly. Everyone who is not going somewhere to carry out these orders of mine, Laryl added, and everyone who does go and completes a task and returns, please go to the feasting hall. I'll have food prepared for you and served to you there. Please go now, for I find that I need some privacy to grieve with my friends. Mert looked at the bed where Rava and Tashin were now snoring lightly, and then at the sideboard with its forest of decanters and lifted one hairy eyebrow. So, lass, what'd you call this room? One of my more private palace chambers, Laryl replied. Old goat. Compliments, compliments, Mert chuckled, and I was just about to thank you, too. Laryl gave him a grin and hugged him. You just did. And being as you let young Jallister empty your flask, have a drink. These are all safe. What I gave to your two new lady lovers came from this compartment down here. Everything in it brings on sleep. So the open lord has a store of drugged wine ready in case of need? Well, well, my estimation of Daggle Neverember has just gone up a notch. Thank you, lady. I thought you might not want two grieving women hanging off your arms when you first set foot in Cassander's house, Laryl said dryly. He's been hiring adventurers. You might need both arms free to wield weapons. Ah, good point. I'll just take some of my friends with me and come back for the sleeping lasses. When we've got the bodies dragged out and the blood mopped up, that sort of thing. That sort of thing, Laryl agreed dryly. As Mert clapped her on the back and then lurched away, she turned to Vajra, who'd been waiting silently and patiently all this time, and embraced her. And so it ends well, for now, Vajra said giving the open lord of Waterdeep an uncertain smile. Despite all my blunders and attacks on you and Elminster, are you, am I, Blackstaff no more? She looked down at the fragment of Blackstaff in her hand and reluctantly turned it and offered it, handled to the fore, to Laryl, who took it and handed it right back to her. I think we can work together. Laryl said softly. Kelvin was my rescuer and my lover and my other half, in the best sense of that term, before he was taken from me. Vajra, I know the burden you bear, and I approve of the way you apply yourself to that duty. Let us be friends. Let there be trust between us. And she spat on her hand and held it out, fingers open to grip Vajra's forearm. The black staff smiled at her. It was a wavering and uncertain smile at first, then brightened. She spat on her own hand, then took Laryl's forearm eagerly. Laryl smiled back at her, silver tresses rising restlessly about her shoulders and silver flames glinting briefly in her eyes. And suddenly there was an unseen smile in the room with them so large it faded beyond the walls and enveloped them both in a silent wave of good feeling. Mistra, too, was pleased. And Vajra almost went to her knees, shot through with the greatest thrill she'd ever felt, and in awe that was like a silver wave, as she saw the full splendor of the weave all around her for the first time, just for an instant, flowing tirelessly, endlessly. Laryl's arms went around her as tenderly as a mother's and held her until her legs were steady again and her sight cleared. Oh, my, Vajra said shakily. So many people use the word wonderful so casually, Laryl murmured. We, though, we know what wonderful truly is. There. L said with slightly weary satisfaction, flexing his fingers in the wake of his spell casting. He peered down at the still forms of Tashin, Jallister, and Rava before turning to Mert to tell him, They'll stay asleep until I awaken them, 
so we can have them safely carried to bedchambers here in the palace to be bathed and put to bed by those palace servants we trust. No need to try to storm Cassander's mansion this night. By morning, news of his demise will be all over the city, and I dare say his hired adventurers will have slipped away and found new employers and thought up fanciful stories about how they never had all that much to do with him in the first place. Mert frowned at El, then relaxed with a sigh, nodded, and clapped him on the back. Aye, that's the best way, I suppose. Then the two of them turned to watch Vajra leave, standing tall and proud again, staff in hand. Laryl came warily to them, still scorched, and with her clothes half burnt off her. She, Mert, and Elminster all exchanged looks, and then with one accord, slumped into some chairs, and sighed. I recall that the palace has a peerless wine cellar, Elminster commented after a moment, and I believe the time is right for us to make a handsome dent in it. Laryl winced. It's wine, not armor. Precision, precision. Indeed, Mert rumbled. Dreadful dent would be a better choice of words. I feel more like doing something dreadful. More appropriate verbiage for you, I'll grant, Laryl agreed. Tell ye what, El offered. If ye just sit there, Myrtle go raid the cellar, and I'll get the palace servants to fill us the big bath with nice warm water. The big bath? In the endmost guest apartment, El informed her. There's a bath with walls sculpted like lounging chairs that's big enough for six to relax in, or four to frolic in. Laryl rolled her eyes. I had no idea this palace ran to such hedonistic appointments, but confess myself unsurprised that you would know of its existence. Know of? Lair, who do you think designed it and had it put in? Laryl chuckled. Of course you did. Silly me. So how'd you get it past Pier Girin? Slyly, El informed her serenely. So the way we manage most of our victories, Laryl agreed. Slyly. From the empty air in their midst came the merry laughter of Dove and Silene.